Okay, so I'll uh, I'll get started then. Uh, call uh, the meeting to order. It's uh, 9.02. I'd uh, like to uh, first uh, welcome everyone to our, our virtual law amendments uh, meeting. Uh, before we get started, just a, a couple of uh, housekeeping items. Uh, first, this is our first uh, virtual session. Uh, some of you may have been on other committees. Uh, and of course, we've all been sitting through uh, the legislative uh, virtual session. So we will, as uh, with the um, legislative uh, order of business, take 15 minute breaks every hour of business. Um, obviously, uh, it's a long day, uh, we expect today. There's a lot of presenters. Uh, so uh, for all Coxes, if you have uh, yourself uh, tagging out uh, between uh, sessions, or I'd encourage you to try to do so during those 15 minute breaks. Obviously, sometimes uh, there may be an emergency that comes up, uh, you can tag out. Uh, we just ask that the person that's going to be subbing in for you uh, logs on to uh, Zoom with their video off. Uh, until you uh, then turn your video off, they turn theirs on to join the session. Uh, as with the other rules, if your video is not on and a member clearly uh, within the frame, it uh, cannot be counted uh, towards uh, the, the quorum. Um, we will have uh, witnesses, but only the witness who's uh, speaking and Ledge TV will manage uh, the video feeds uh, for that. Um, we will be operating, I believe everyone would have the agenda. We're going to uh, do the presentations uh, for all of the um, all of the pieces of legislation we have for here today. Uh, Crown Lands Act first with one presenter, uh, biodiversity uh, with uh, many presenters. Uh, we're anticipating uh, just before six, we'll have a couple of presenters on the adoptions records act uh, and then return to the biodiversity act uh, final presenters uh, and then the police uh, identity management act at this point have has no presenters uh, slated in uh, because of the large number of presenters for biodiversity we're going to go five and five uh, but for the other acts it'll be ten and five um, per uh, normal business so uh, with that, I believe uh, Mr. Hebb, uh, alleged counsel, uh, has some uh, proposed amendments uh, for the Biodiversity Act uh, that uh, we will be distributing uh, now. Although, again, all of the motions, uh, I'd like to defer until after all of the presentations, and we'll go through each of the bills for any potential uh, motions uh, after the presentations. Just because of the virtual world, we want to try to keep our schedule as tight and on time as possible. Uh, so. Uh, with that, uh, perhaps I will start and call for our first uh, presenter on the uh, Bill 9 of the Crown Lands Act. And I believe we have our, our first presenter, Dale Smith. And Mr. Chair, while we're waiting for Mr. Smith, I might just add there will probably be some changes in the agenda as the day proceeds with uh, cancellations and additions. Thank you. Mr. Smith, uh, welcome to our uh, virtual law amendments committee. You have the distinct uh, honor of being the very first uh, public presenter in our virtual law amendments uh, session. Um, just uh, quickly on uh, the rules, uh, you'll have uh, 10 minutes uh, allotted for a presentation, uh, leaving uh, five minutes uh, for Q&A. Uh, that's a total of, of 15 minutes, and uh, I'll give a, a minute warning uh, before the end of each of those uh, periods of time. And you can uh, get started at any time. Okay, well, thank you for the, uh, for the opportunity to comment, comment on Bill 9. I submitted a, uh, a, a submission uh, yesterday by email, so I trust you have that uh, before you or will soon have that. Um, the Crown Lands Act uh, in its current form was drafted in 1989 when industrial forestry was in its heyday. Uh, as a result, the existing wordy, wording of the legislation is heavily uh, skewed towards forestry. Uh, Forestry basically is treated as the default use of crown land. Crown lands, however, are public lands. They are highly valued provincial assets that should serve many purposes and uses, ranging from biodiversity protection and the provision of ecosystem services to outdoor recreation, ecotourism, and commercial resource use, including forestry. 
So the proposed amendment to the purpose section clause 2A, although long overdue, uh, is welcomed. But there are also significant concerns. Firstly, the broadened scope of the statement of purpose is not followed through in the balance of the legislation. To change only the purpose statement is superficial. The net effect will be inconsequential. This is particularly problematical in regards to the government's commitment to implement the Leahy report recommendations. Secondly, forest, the forestry bias subject matter remains in the body of the legislation, unaltered. While the other purposes and uses inclu included in the proposed amendment are not addressed, uh, that is in the body of the legislation. The real need is for a comprehensive review and updating of the Crown Lands Act, along with a parallel review of related government structures and departmental roles and responsibilities. Finally, a new forestry specific clause 2B is added, which effectively retains the forestry emphasis and bias. So looking at the, at the purpose section a little more closely, and I'll do so briefly, uh, there are many ways uh, the broadened statement of purpose could be stated. Uh, and the wording as drafted, although somewhat cumbersome, is, is reasonably good, at least in the sense of broadening the scope of the legislation, as was the primary need. I made one or two suggestions, or one specific suggestion, I guess, in terms of rewording uh, for greater clarity and accuracy in the report that I forwarded. And I won't go through that now, but it's, uh, it's, it's perhaps a quibble, perhaps it's semantics. Um, but, uh, but accuracy is important. It's not a deal breaker, but I put it forward nonetheless. The second clause, 2B, is another matter. It has nothing to do with the broadened statement of purpose. It is out of place. It reasserts the forestry bias, and it should be removed. If the feeling is it must be included in the Crown land legislation, then uh, it should be in, a, in a, a section in the body of the legislation where forestry matters are discussed. Uh, or better still, it should be included in an updated for an updated forestry legislation, uh, perhaps a new ecological forestry act. Uh, the forestry legislation is dated 1989 as well, so it's long overdue. So I'm going to move on now to the to some key points that are not included, uh, and I'll come back to the purpose at, at, the, at the close. Um, the most important missing elements are provisions relating to Crown land use planning. And it's important to distinguish between Crown land use planning and forestry management planning on Crown land. Completely different. And the terms are used interchangeably by the, by the Department of Lands and Forestry, but they should be conceived of as being completely different. Crown land use planning is essential for, to the implementation of the recommendations of the Leahy Report, in particular to the triad model of ecological forestry. And the triad model is, is I'm sure you know, involves protected areas, high production forestry lands, and the so-called matrix lands where conservation, forestry, or other uses uh, are to be integrated. So basically the triad model effectively is a, is a generalized land use planning concept or tool with three zones. Implementation of the triad approach, however, is complicated by the existing structure of government. High production forestry lands and, and the intermediate matrix lands involve crown lands administered by lands and forestry. Protected areas, the third zone of the triad, are provincially owned public lands administered by environment and climate change. Responsibility, therefore, is split between two departments with differing mandates, perspectives, and approaches, and conflicting interests and priorities. The minister's advisory committee uh, uh, that is to the Minister of Lands and Forestry on the implementation of Leahy uh, provides a practical illustration of the, of the challenges that are involved as a result of this split. There is no representation on the committee from environment, uh, which responsibility for one of the three uh, zone types. Consider that the, that the Minister's Advisory Committee is only uh, uh, at the preliminary stages at this point. Uh, it's been appointed at the, the uh, Leahy recommendations were endorsed over two years ago and the advisory committee on its implementation is only at its preliminary stages. Imagine when it comes to dividing crown land amongst three zones. Uh, it'll be a catfight between the two departments 
uh, and between the uh, and, and in the public realm as well. So clearly, as suggested early, the need is for a comprehensive, coordinated, and coherent land use planning approach for Nova Scotia's public lands, its crown lands, and its publicly owned protected areas. This will require more extensive legislative change and corresponding government restructuring. This is needed to inspire and lead the paradigm shift from industrial forestry to ecological stewardship. Short of uh, what is really needed, as described the comprehensive review, uh, the, the submission that I made identifies uh, two basic options. Option one is a minimalist approach, uh, essentially to connect the dots between the three elements of the triad and the two departments. Uh, I won't go through these, They're out, it's outlined in just a paragraph or two in the, in the submission. Option two, and the option that is recommended is to give recognition to the need for an integrated land use planning approach uh, in the purpose section of the legislation to be addressed head on as a, as a specific need that will, be, that will be addressed. The reason that uh, the suggestion is made this way is it is clear that government is not interested in, in an extensive view of the legislation at this time because uh, only an amendment was made to the purpose section. So include in the purpose section a commitment to uh, undertake that review because it's essential for the uh, for the implementation of the uh, of the of the essential recommendations of the Leahy report. So back to the back to the purpose section, uh, I've suggested uh, uh, a two B be added. Uh, it, uh, that uh, it, it's it's not worded well. I'm sure legislative council could do much better, but it, I think it gets at the sense. And it reads, enable fulfillment of the range of purposes set forth in 2A by establishing a land use planning process for crown lands to guide the implementation of the triad model of public land use management through coordination of the respective responsibilities of the Department of Lands and Forestry and of Environment and Climate Change for protected areas, high production forest lands, and the intermediate matrix zone where conservation, forestry, and other uses are to be integrated. So in summary, and to conclude, um, amend the purpose section as follows, accept clause, clause 2A, ideally with minor, minor rewording, remove or relocate the existing clause 2B and add a replacement clause 2B to give recognition to the need to establish capability for crown Crown or public land use planning as a basis for implementing a triad approach to ecological forestry. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Smith. I'll now uh, proceed to discussion. Uh, for the members, uh, please just uh, signify either with the Zoom, raise your hand, or just raise your hand. Uh, Ms. Roberts. Thank you. Um, just a, a quick question. I always find it helpful to understand uh, what experience people are arriving at law amendments committee with. What's what's your professional background and your experience working with uh, in with the forestry sector in Nova Scotia? And thanks so much for your presentation. My experience with law amendment is zero, uh, but with uh, the provincial government, I work with uh, the Department of Environment and with the Department of uh, natural resources at the time. Uh, I retired from environment. I was involved, I was manager of parks and recreation planning uh, and director of protected areas in, in, with environment when I when I resigned. I had many um, uh, involvements with the forestry and mining sector as a uh, person responsible for uh, issues around parks and protected areas. And I started out my career in another province in land use planning. May I ask a follow-up question? Oh, and you're uh, on mute, Mr. Chair. Go ahead, Ms. Roberts. I don't see anyone else uh, with their hands raised. Thank you. Th th thanks so much. That that really helps to kind of locate your expertise. Um, I guess a, a follow-up question, and, and you may have addressed this, but it's just helpful for me to hear it. You know, the matrix approach and the and the whole Leahy review to me sort of suggests land use plan planning because there is this, um, well, because there is the triad approach with the idea that there would be areas that are protected, areas that are um, areas that would be for high production forestry, and then the, the majority of, 
of land, as I have always understood the intent of the report, uh, assigned to the matrix, to that ecological forestry approach. What is it, uh, even with the proposed amendments uh, to the Crown Lands Act that have come from government, um, that, that you see as uh, inhibiting that, that what I have always understood to be a, a land use uh, sort of planning approach overall? Uh, well, I guess the, it's inhibited by the lack of a mechanism. I mean, the, the, the concept is, is laid out there. And as I tried to argue in my presentation, the amendment uh, uh, sort of lays the scope, broadens the scope uh, of uh, what Crown lands are to be used for and, and what their intent is. Um, but the mechanism for a sort of, uh, assigning those uses is not really available. It's been, it's been done really as a uh, um, secondary consideration in, 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 in through forestry management. So the, the third clause of the existing legislation says that forest management planning should give consideration to outdoor recreation and wildlife, something to that effect. And uh, so it's uh, all, all, all of the uses are secondary to forestry. So there needs to be a planning approach that says all of these uses are legitimate and this, they're, they're, uh, the, the need is for a mechanism to uh, work through those, uh, work to achieve those various objectives in a, in a, uh, a coordinated and coherent way. Okay. And if I may, Mr. Chair, one last question. Um, something else that I believe is not currently mentioned in the Act and nor is it uh, in the proposed uh, amendments, the, the acts that we're considering here, uh, th there is no mention of climate change and the role of um, Crown lands uh, in terms of mitigating and yeah, yeah, particularly mitigating uh, climate uh, change. Would you welcome some reference to that in either the purpose or elsewhere in the act? Yes. Thank you so much. Any uh, other questions for Mr. Smith? There's uh, just under two minutes remaining in his uh, time. Any other questions? Seeing none, uh, Mr. Smith, I don't know if you have any concluding remarks, but there's about a, a minute uh, and a half left or. Uh... Um, no, I just, I guess I would just uh, say this is extremely important and uh, um, it really needs to be addressed. So I, I, with that, I would just say uh, thank you for your time and uh, best wishes with regards to your deliberations. Thank you very much, Mr. Smith. Uh, thank you for taking your time to uh, participate uh, in the process. It was a very detailed and informative uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes uh, presentations for Bill 9, the Crown Lands Act. Uh, we will now uh, move forward uh, with presentations for Bill Number Four, the Biodiversity Act, uh, as previously mentioned, uh, later this evening we will manage all uh, presentations. Uh, again, as we move in at this point, it'll be five minutes uh, presentation, five minutes uh, Q and A. Uh, but please, uh, as you go through, I will maintain a speakers list. So if you do want to speak, you can just uh, raise your hand, and I'll, I'll track as I see you um, indicate. Our first presenter is uh, Mr. Uh, Jeff Bishop on the Biodiversity Act. Welcome, uh, Mr. Bishop. Uh, just uh, like to note uh, for the presentation purposes, uh, you'll have uh, five minutes for your presentation, five minutes uh, for Q&A, uh, 10 minutes total, and I'll give you a, a one minute warning uh, if necessary as time winds down. And uh, members, I just ask that you uh, signify and I'll keep a speaker's list uh, for the back end of the uh, presentation. 
So, Mr. Bishop, over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, committee members, thank you for the opportunity to present this morning on Bill 4, as it's been seen uh, by the public to date. I'll also say at the outset that we're encouraged by the changes the Premier and the Minister announced last week um, and are presumably there before you this morning that will reshape and strengthen the bill for all Nova Scotians. Since 2019, when we appeared before this very committee, our organization has been saying clearly that we would support clear, focused legislation that protects biodiversity and respects the rights of landowners of this province. Bill 4 and its predecessor, Bill 116, did neither of those things. We appear here today not to discuss what Nova Scotians want, which is biodiversity protection, but instead to again raise concerns with what we see as legislation that leaves too many uh, questions unanswered for Nova Scotian landowners. Our concerns can be narrowed into a few significant areas. Firstly, uh, the bill gives broad powers to the Minister of Lands and Forestry, for example, in Section 7K3, as well as to the Cabinet under Section 53. We feel, uh, fully understand that legislation must be written to empower a minister or others on their behalf, um, but in this bill is simply is overreaching. When combined with other parts of the bill, namely Section 38 that outlines offenses and penalties, those sections of the bill give significant powers to cabinet left unchecked by the legislature of the day to create any mechanism or regulatory program to control activities on private lands. The intent of the powers may well have been for activities like controlling invasive species, but the sections are so broad and undefined that it could also be used to stop almost any activity anywhere at the sole opinion of those empowered while providing no clarity on the intent or scope to the judicial system who will interpret this legislation as law in the future. And that is why we were concerned. Secondly, the bill regularly uses the language prescribed by the regulations when referring to the how, when, and why a section of a bill would be used. It has been suggested by some that the regulations will answer the concerns of Nova Scotians. We respect the fact that you cannot fully draft regulations in the absence of an act that empowers them, but we're sure you can appreciate how this uncertainty is unsettling to landowners. And we look forward to working with our government partners in the development of the regulations that will provide further clarity to all Nova Scotians. The sections relating to emergency orders, which can be enacted on private lands without the agreement of landowners, were again written so broadly as to give no details for the who, what, when, where, and why an emergency order could be used. No indication of what triggers an emergency order. No indication of how long an emergency order lasts. No steps outlined as to how a landowner could appeal an emergency order, nor steps they could take to play a role in resolving the issue that necessitated an emergency order. To be blunt, as written, they could easily be misused. Thus, we are to rely on interpretation of reasonable and probable grounds, as it says in the Act, uh, of the thresholds that trigger and order uh, and guide a yet-to-be-known complaints-based system. Lastly, we felt the language surrounding the voluntary nature of the establishment of biodiversity management zones, or BMZs, as well as any compensation for the creation on private lands was unclear. The lack of clarity on both points were reason for very much of our concern. The Premier and the Minister have taken efforts in recent days to clarify with Nova Scotians that the process will be entirely voluntary, and we truly appreciate that clarity. For two years now, we have also been discussing the potential effects of Bill 116 and now Bill 4 with our colleagues in other sectors, encouraging the landowner members of their groups to read the bills. From agriculture to mining, land development, as well as land users like the ATV, trails and snowmobile groups, we encourage them to read the bill, listen to our concerns and do what they felt reflected any concerns they may have and if interested, join our voices together. A number of the folks we spoke with agreed. Others agreed, but took their own path to voice their concerns in their own way. 
and we were more than fine with that. What was important was that Nova Scotian landers stood up and spoke out. Contrary to the opinion of some who seem overly concerned that Nova Scotian landowners spoke out on this bill, this is what the democratic process looks like. Elected representatives like yourselves, with legislation before you for consideration, you turn to the people that elected you and hear their opinions and suggestions on that legislation. Sometimes it's a quiet process. Other times, Nova Scotians arrive at the door of the legislature and tell you something's wrong. Again, we're cautiously optimistic of the announced changes the Premier and Minister made for Bill 4 last week. We eagerly await the opportunity to see and analyze the changes, hoping for legislation that provides protections that I mentioned in my opening for both landowner rights and for biodiversity. We will continue to work with all the landowners, organizations, businesses, municipal governments, and sectors that stood up and called for better legislation. As well, we look forward to the point where we will continue to work with our provincial government partners on this file. From there, our sustainable and renewable forest sector will be ready to work with Nova Scotians to further enact the Leahy recommendations and enhance the protection of biodiversity across this province. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Bishop. Uh, this is about uh, three and a half minutes remaining. Uh, call uh, for any questions from the members. Uh, Ms. Ms. McCrossan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would like to ask a question. Did, does the, our presenter believe there was adequate consultation uh, with stakeholders by the government? Um, over the last couple of years, as I say, we have participated in uh, in uh, various sessions um, with the uh, with, with uh, our partners at, at uh, in government on this. So there were opportunities over the years for for our sector um, and various pieces within it, from landowners to um, to uh, more of the industrial parts of the sector uh, as well. But what became clear in some of our discussions um, as we reached out to other sectors, as I say, over the last two years around this, was that some of them had either no idea uh, about the bill itself um, and had no great concept of a, a impact on any uh, landowners that may be within their sector. Um, it, it was admittedly, a, a, it, and it is, a, a bill that is uh, from the Department of Lands and Forestry. So some folks may have you know, assumed it was really around forestry issues, but when you dug into it, um, especially in this version of it, um, there's broad implications to any landowner uh, in, in the province. And so that's why we, again, um, as we saw the bill come forward, had some uh, some broad discussions with folks to, to understand, um, you know, uh, had, they, had they had conversations, uh, had they seen the bill, all of those sort of things to, to determine who was there. And, and um, you, you'd have to, to speak with some folks within those sectors, but um, largely we heard that many of them had not been part of the process and some of them were, um, you know, uh, um, you know, said that they had not even seen uh, the, the legislation. Not seeing any other questions. Oh, Ms. Roberts. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bishop, um, I know that you have expressed concerns about the enforcement mechanisms that, that had been in the bill. Um, and my understanding is that the... The, the act as originally introduced um, contained uh, sanctions and powers that are very similar uh, to those included in the Species at Risk Act and the Endangered, Endangered Species Act. Have those acts, um, you know, been, been implemented in a way that have significantly uh, impacted your members? Um, that would be, a, a, I guess, a member by member uh, discussion you'd have to have of, of what the impact, um, you know, with, I, our association, for example, has over 600 members. I, I may have a few that would stand up and say, absolutely, um, that they, their, their business on the day to day ha has been impacted by um, the, the legislation that, that you refer to. 
Others may say no. Um, so it would be it would be quite a broad range of, of uh, answers on that. Thank you, uh, Mr. Bishop. Uh, time uh, for presentation and questions has just expired. I uh, appreciate you taking the time to uh, participate uh, in this process. Thank you all. Next up is uh, Mr. Lancaster. Good morning, Mr. Lancaster. Uh, welcome to Law Amendments Committee. Uh, just uh, quickly, uh, you'll have uh, 10 minutes uh, total. Uh, we usually break that uh, five minutes for presentation, five minutes for Q&A, but it is uh, 10 minutes total. I'll give a, a one minute warning uh, if you're still in presentation. So uh, with that, you may begin. Great, thank you very much. So I'm representing today the Healthy Forest Coalition and uh, we're a coalition of forest ecologists, sustainable foresters, biologists, and land planners that have come together to advocate for sustainable forestry uh, in Nova Scotia. And we've been in existence for a little over five years now. And, uh, and I'm the, the coordinator, it's a volunteer basis and something that uh, I do very willingly to try and, and bring us kind of to the future of a lot of those initiatives. So I'll start with my uh, statement moving forward from now. So on behalf of the fourth, Healthy Forest Coalition, we are grateful for the opportunity to appear before the Law Amendments Committee this morning. We are pleased to see that the government has introduced the original Biodiversity Act Bill for an act that aims to protect and enshrine the protection of all Nova Scotian biodiversity into legislation. Biodiversity health is not a function of some exterior portion of our world. It is our world, and thus it is also the health of our economies as well as our own. This means that biodiversity health must not simply be a goal to work towards, but a mandate that is woven into the very fiber of all of our legislation and all of our societies. We were tremendously disappointed to learn of the intended removal of its application of the bill to private land and the removal of offenses and emergency orders. The fact that this effort came largely as a result of pressures from a publicly funded industrial lobby, lobby group coupled with the inability for us to read the changes and then kind of uh, as an aside to what's in my submission, I, I did receive them I think about 20 minutes ago, but it, it wasn't kind of enough, enough time. It's a 20 page document, so it wasn't really enough time to kind of fully review it and, and integrate those changes into our response. So what I have here does not incorporate the changes as they were written, just as we heard about them in, in the media, more or less. So um, coupled with uh, our inability to read these changes prior to this presentation, this has created a rather anti-democratic process. This should be a concern to all Nova Scotians. Through our combined countless decades of experience uh, on research of topics, including sustainable forestry, for forest ecology, biology, landscape planning, we make the following recommendations. One, and I think this one's kind of one of the most important in, in my eyes, um, the initial state of biodiversity report should be completed as, as soon as possible. Right now, there's a timeline of, of three years. It, it was to be five years, so it's good that there was uh, a reduction on that. but. As, as you all know, this how quickly we're adding species at risk to the, the protected status and, and how much we're in decline, that's not really in question. It's something that's an accepted fact. So the sooner that we get that initial stage, the more informed we'll be moving forward. If we have it from a degraded baseline within a period of a few, even a few years, then we'll have that much less of a comparison to move forward upon. So we believe that a two-year period for this uh, initiative is, is more reasonable. and that the five years is, is, is not adequate to address those concerns, as I said. The act requires a strong baseline of comparison and therefore must be established as soon as possible. After the establishment of the initial state of biodiversity report, we believe that five years for subsequent report, reports is also a little bit inappropriate and, and should be reduced. Uh, for example, oops, so that's a different section there. 
Um, so yeah, so the the sooner that that, that is uh, incorporated, the state of initial biodiversity report, and then subsequently, probably every three years would probably be better than every five years. Uh, we recommend the changing of, of section seven to the minister may to the minister shall, um, something that just kind of makes it a little less ambiguous. Uh, section 13.2, the quote is, the minister shall begin reporting on the public state of biodiversity within three years of the act coming into force and shall give regular updates no later than five years thereafter. So I touched on that one. Uh, as they are a crucial component to ecosystem function and biodiversity health, the act should also cover aquatic ecosystems and not just terrestrial as it currently is listed. So many of our, especially because a lot of this legislation is aiming to reduce the threat of invasive species and their impact on our biodiversity, it's important that that get incorporated into it. I'm sure many of you know the plight of, of what's happened in Kedji with chain pickerel, for example, and, and kind of lakes across the province, especially, and with other species like, like bass. Um, it's, it's something that if the legislation doesn't address aquatic eco ecosystems, then we're, we're not going to be covering biodiversity on the whole. These things don't operate in silos that kind of terrestrial ecology, we have that covered. Freshwater ecology, we can kind of consider that a separate. They're, they're very much interwoven. And if we don't have holistic legislation that addresses both, then we're not going to be addressing either, essentially. So it's, it's something that's, that's very crucial. There's a lot of crossover with that, with chain pickerel kind of being a great example, because species like amphibians that are the go-between terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems, uh, they're the ones that are largely most under threat um, from a terrestrial standpoint by chain pickerel, because they, they eat pretty much all the amphibians that are, are in the water bodies that they've, uh, they've reached. So that's it for specific recommendations that I have um, kind of going beyond the I didn't reiterate it again, but just we, we strongly recommend that the inclusions of the offenses, the emergency orders on, on private land, that those be retained in, as they were in the original reading of the bill. And then in conclusion, uh, our biodiversity is in decline. This is not a question. This is a settled matter um, with the initial consultations that occurred throughout this, uh, this original act. Back in 2019, that was something that the Department of Lands and Forestry also conceded that um, it's, it's a problem that needs to be addressed. It's, it's not something that's in question. It's similar to climate change, biodiversity collapse and decline is something that we deal with on a daily basis. It's not a projection into the future. So because we're adding more species at risk than we are removing, that's kind of a, another sign of that. And it, for practitioners that work in the species at risk and, and kind of species of conservation concern, realm, you know that there's dozens, if not hundreds of species that probably should be on the list, but are not currently just because it, it takes a while to kind of uh, get that legislation to go through. So species like long-eared owls, and uh, I've talked to a lichenologist that said there should be upwards of 70 more species that, uh, that currently of lichens alone that are not on the uh, species at risk list. So this legislation would help to ensure that less species get added to that list. Uh, so it, there are a lot of steps forward that we're, we're very glad to see and that the implementation of it on, on public land or crown land will at least, at least help to bolster some of those and, and hopefully reduced, uh, reduce the amount that we're adding to that every year. But um, it's, it's, it's also similar to the terrestrial and, and aquatic ecosystems functions. It's, it's not something that obviously operates in silos. We can't just say because we're uh, conducting these efforts on, on uh, crown land that we're essentially producing or producing uh, an effort that will help to bolster 30% of the equation. It, it will be kind of more diminished than that capacity because all of this interconnectedness, it's, it's not going to be that we're kind of supporting 30% the way that uh, we often integrate it into how we advocate is thinking about biodiversity as, as a piece of ice. And then if you have a giant brick of ice, that's going to melt more slowly than if you have crushed ice. So because crown land is fragmented in these little pieces, it doesn't have these large contiguous patches that are going to be more uh, robust and able to deal with adversity. So the smaller that those pat patches are, the more fragmented they are, the less biodiversity will, will be able to respond to damages and challenges. And especially climate change is a huge one to that, that we need to have a robust ecology that is able to deal with the, the pressures that we place on it for our economies. And then also just to deal with the natural occurrences that, that are happening. So it's, it's, it's very disappointing to see that change, and we, we hope that that can be reversed. Um, it's kind of late in the process, I know, but all this has been pretty rushed, and as I said, that we didn't get a chance to read the, um, 
the re-up that was put out today. So all Nova Scotians benefit from a healthy biodiversity, both directly and indirectly. So whether or not it's something that they actively uh, receive employment from in terms of forestry or, or other purposes that kind of extract the value, all Nova Scotians benefit from clean water, clean air, and a healthy, robust biodiversity. So it's even just from a quality of life perspective and a prosperity perspective, if you don't directly depend on these things, you, you depend on them in, in, in an indirect way. So it's, it's not legislation that is for kind of core groups or core interests. It it's, speaks to every single One minute. Person. Thank you. And um, so, sorry, sorry is, is that the, the five minute, one minute mark? No, it's one, one minute a total, nine, nine minutes per second. Oh, wow. Okay, yep, that time goes quicker than you think. Um, so uh, in closing, I guess I'll just skip a little bit. Well, what legacy do we want to leave? Do we want to be bold in acting changes that secure a prosperous future for successive generations? Or do we want to continue the status quo? Because that's kind of the trajectory that we're on. This legislation will help to improve that. But uh, in our opinion, it won't go quite far enough now that it's been removed from private land. With that, I yield the rest of my time for questions. Thank you. About uh, 20 seconds. Ms. Roberts, I think I saw your hand. Yes, uh, really quickly. Um, Mike, can you speak quickly to uh, your professional background uh, that that you bring to this work? And also, can you can you speak to uh, whether there would be private uh, woodlot owners that uh, are members of the Healthy Forest Coalition, or or is your organization made up primarily of um, activists? I started my, yeah, I'll answer that as quickly as I can. I started my career in forestry. Um, I now work in forest ecology and land stewardship and conservation. Uh, I'm a landowner and I continue to harvest wood for my own property. And many of our owners within the Healthy Forest Coalition are small scale woodlot owners as well. Great. Thank you, uh, Mr. Lancaster. That's uh, time. Um, next uh, presenter is Ms. Debbie Reeves. Hello, uh, Ms. Reeves. Welcome to Law Amendments. Uh, we'll just uh, jump right in. You'll have uh, 10 minutes uh, total, uh, generally five for presentation, five for q and I'll give a uh, one-minute warning uh, within the 10 minutes uh, to let you know if needed. And so with that, I'll turn it over to you, Ms. Reeves. You're uh, muted. You'll have to unmute, uh, Ms. Reeves. Excuse me. Thank you for allowing me to appear before you today representing large private non-industrial landowners. I'm addressing the Biodiversity Act Bill 4 and the scope of proposed changes announced by Minister Porter and Premier Rankin, as well as our concerns we provided as private landowners. With the broadness and vagueness of this act, it is difficult to understand and evaluate. With this new act, we appreciate it. The changes to the biodiversity management zone is detailed in clause 16 that reflected additions we had requested. However, it was still unclear as to whether a landowner, such as myself, could refuse an agreement if it was initiated by lands and forestry. We appreciate that Minister Porter announced these zones would be totally voluntary and expect you will support an amendment to the section on the biodiversity management zones to include this. I briefly ran through what he had presented this morning, and uh, it seems like there is uh, adequate changes, but until we get a chance to read it better, we, we, we can't make any further comments. All wording in this act needs to be reviewed, so it reads clearly the private land falls under no part of the act, except as relates to the biodiversity management zones, and then only when a landowner signs an agreement. Biodiversity emergency orders and offenses and fines were still too heavy handed and a fish conservation officers had too much power under Bill 4. It suggests that a person is guilty of an offense immediately and subject to a $500,000 fine. This again is extreme and allow officers to act without discussion or investigation. We asked for more clarity of what a biodiversity emergency order would be used for and how it would be managed with private landowners that there needed to be methods for restoring land and compensation for our forest crops that might be damaged as a result of an order 
to get rid of unwanted pests, pathogens, or invasive species. We wanted more clarity on offenses and fines. We, need, we didn't want to go to jail or be given a ticket for a fine, the result of unintended consequences, an act by someone who has access to our land or from people who feel they have the right to go wherever they want, whenever they want, and do whatever they want. Please understand, we have no feasible way to protect ourselves from third party damage or entry to our property. For example, it would take five kilometers of fence to go around a hundred acre lot. We continue to put the message out that many of us are without owners who practice sustainable forest management and many of us have been family landowners for generations. We want the government, including yourself and the public, to understand what it means to be a wood owner. And as such, our private landowner rights are of utmost importance to us, and we need them to be respected. Therefore, we support the removal of sections of the biodiversity management emergency orders and offenses and fines, and removal of any related wording in the Act. Focus in this Act on Crown land only is the right and just thing to do and will avoid landowners from having to consider further actions to maintain control of our land. Who landowners are has changed over the last few decades. For many of us, our fathers worked with lands and forests, but with changes to the department, they were told the advice of educated staff had to be taken over themselves, even with all the years of experience they had. So we were sent to college, and as a result, we are educated, experienced, and knowledgeable. There's one thing many of us have that most of the scientists and experts the government retains don't have, which is a long-term knowledge of and relationship with our woodlots. We feel there is need to build a better relationship between lands and forest, lands and forestry and landowners. And we have been working to do that. And we are willing to continue to grow mutual respect and collaborate in developing and growing programs. We asked for and included, were included in clause 54-2 for making amendment regulations to the act. We would like to suggest that regulations including, includes a committee of lands and forestry staff and landowners only to develop the guidelines and agreements for biodiversity management zones. I personally do think there will be landowners who will enter into these agreements if they are written in the spirit of cooperation and respect they need to be. We know the members of this committee are all people of integrity, knowledge, and understanding. And we are willing to place our trust in you, Minister Porter, Premier Rankin, and his cabinet to make all the necessary changes to this act. This includes the sections of the act as mentioned in general terms by Minister Porter and supported by the Premier. It also means reviewing the entire act to be sure the wording and the intent is clear and consistent throughout the act. This is another learning experience for us, and we look to your leadership. As always, we want to offer any assistance from ourselves that may be appropriate as you work through amendments to Bill 4. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Ms. Reeves. Uh, just uh, under five minutes. Ms. Roberts, first question. Thank you, and nice to see you remotely, Ms. Reeves. Um, I've I've visited uh, some of your woodlots uh, with you, and I wonder if you could speak to what role you, you are aware of your woodlots playing in terms of supporting biodiversity now. Well, I, I think many of us think that we, you know, because we practice, you know, sustainable forest management, have been long-term landowners, we have an affinity with our land, and maybe we don't understand completely everything that, you know, uh, relates to biodiversity under specifics, but we do understand the relationship between uh, all the players in nature, including ourselves. And, you know, we take great pride in trying to take care of our land. And, you know, basically we were entrusted with the land to take care of it like our forefathers did for many of us. So we try to live up to those obligations. And, and if I can ask a, a follow-up, you know, uh, given... Just, just, just one second, Ms. Ms. Roberts, uh, Ms. smith McCresson oh, uh, had a, a question first. I'll come back to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Rees, I'm wondering how you feel about receiving the proposed changes to this act um, just this morning before you not being given an, a, a chance to actually see the changes before you were presenting to Law Amendments Committee. 
it makes it difficult to, you know, having already prepared a presentation to come mm -hmm. with the understanding that we're going to be changes. And then we heard that we're going to be changes presented this morning, but obviously I had like two minutes to read a, a little bit of it. Um, so certainly we'd like to have more time to, to go through the act as it appears to have been amended. Uh, I guess our biggest concern is that when you go back and forth between the clauses, which we did with the original bill four, there were, were a number of places where language needed to be changed, we felt, to make it congruous throughout the whole act. And that's why I mentioned that, you know, the whole act needs to be reviewed for uh, specific language adjustments as the, with the amendments that have been made. And we'd be pleased to be able to be part of submitting some thoughts if, if the committee would entertain that. Thank you, uh, Ms. Roberts. Um, so, sorry, my follow-up was just, you know, would you, do you think you would be uh, supportive of an act with more enforcement mechanisms that I understand are not that different from the Endangered Species Act and the Species at Risk Act now? Um, and in fact, uh, you know, recently there was a $6,000 fine levied. Um, so, so despite the the, the high potential fines, the actual fines are, are much less, I understand. But do you think you would be more willing to support the act with enforcement mechanisms if you had a clear idea of what the government is considering for regulations? I don't think so, simply because the act is, is the chief uh, you know, legislative uh, tool in my understanding. So, you know, if I get taken to court, I guess, you know, my understanding is it would be the act that would level it at me, not necessarily regulations. Those are the guides to implement. And I may be wrong. I, I can, you know, I can be stand corrected. But given that, uh, I think that, um, you know, the, the appropriate thing to do, I think, is for landowners is for the, the government to work with us and to develop programs for education. You mentioned the Endangered Species Act, and I don't mind saying I went to one of the sessions that was put on for the review of some of the Endangered Species Act and the, and the different recovery teams. And I can safely say I was the only person in the room who identified themselves as a woodlot owner, and there were about 150 people there. So that's a clear indication that we're not getting imparted and included in the information and education that we should have to be able to make educated, you know, decisions. Okay, about 20 seconds remaining. Maybe, Ms. Roberts. Maybe just because I've asked this of other folks, uh, Ms. Reeves, would you, you know, mind speaking a little bit more because I, uh, about your uh, professional and it, your various roles that you play, because I believe you, you have been on a number of advisory committees and maybe also on the Board of Forest Nova Scotia, but maybe you could just speak to your various roles. Um, in what respect do you mean, Ms. Roberts? You're on mute, Ms. Roberts. Sorry, if you could identify the different committees that you serve on. Uh, yes, I'm, as I've said, I'm chair of the Large Private Non-Industrial Landowners, which we formed after Bulwark closed in 2012. I'm currently on the uh, Minister's Forestry Advisory Committee. I'm currently on the Forestry Transition Team. And I'm also first vice of Forest Nova Scotia, as well as I'm a Christmas tree grower and uh, a member of that and a number of other organizations. Thank you, Ms. Reeves. Uh, time has uh, elapsed. Uh, thank you for your presentation and engagement on this piece of legislation. Have thank a good you, day. Sir. Next up is Ms. Karen McKendry. And actually, while waiting, uh, Mr. Hebb, uh, as we bring Ms. McKendry in, we're going to run slightly over the one hour mark of the sitting. How, how do we proceed uh, with that? Do we pause that presentation? Um, I think that's a better question asked of uh, LTV. Um, I'm, I'm not sure whether they, the, um, the hour, whether it, it, it's the six. You know, if it's 65 minutes, whether that makes a big difference. But 
um, it would be easier uh, not to interrupt. It's Agreed. Presentation. So I'll, I'll propose, and maybe if Ledge TV can, can let us know, because we'll only be a, a, a couple of minutes over. We want to move with this presentation if possible. Um, Ms. Uh, McKendry, welcome to Law Amendments. Uh, good morning. I'll be speaking uh, for uh, a 10-minute block of total time. Uh, we generally uh, try to keep five minutes for presentation, five minutes for Q&A, but uh, I will give a, a one-minute uh, reminder if you're still presenting uh, past the five-minute mark. It'll be uh, at the nine-minute mark. I'll give you a, a notification. So with that, uh, please proceed. Sure. Can you hear me okay? Just want to check that. Volume's good. Right on, thanks. Uh, so thank you for hearing, for hearing from me today. Um, my name is Karen McKendry. I'm the Wilderness Outreach Coordinator at Ecology Action Center. I'm sharing my remarks today from my home in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded land of the Mi'kmaq people. My responsibilities as a treaty person inform my work and my life. My journey with the Biodiversity Act has been a long one. There are likely no two people outside of government who've worked on the potential of this act more than myself and Lisa Mitchell from East Coast Environmental Law, whom you'll hear from later today. I've worked in conservation biology my whole career in different ways, but working to inform the Biodiversity Act has been a singular opportunity to contribute to a missing piece in the mosaic of work of, on biodiversity conservation in Nova Scotia. The idea of a piece of legislation to coordinate provincially-led work on biodiversity was first publicly proposed in 2010 as part of the Natural Resources Strategy consultations. Then in 2018, it seemed like there was political and staff level intention to advance it, but it also seemed like there would be little or no outside input into the act. And that's just not right. Engaging with the public, stakeholders, with the Mi'kmaq rights holders of Nova Scotia through consultations makes for better legislation and a better society. When it became apparent that Department of Lands and Forestry would not, at least initially, lead consultations on a biodiversity act, EAC partnered with East Coast Environmental Law to inform government work the best way that we could by providing independent advice. We did a deep dive into biodiversity legislation from other jurisdictions and led our own consultations. We looked at international reports and we talked to people with on the ground experience. All of this informed a joint recommendations report on the essential elements of a good biodiversity act for Nova Scotia. We sent this report to government in 2018 without being asked and have reshared it with them since and have sent you a copy yesterday. In 2019, the biodiversity act came to the legislature for the first time. It did not reflect almost any of our recommendations. It had some positive aspects, but would have been much improved by public and co stakeholder consultations. And that's what we expressed at law amendments that year. Others expressed the same concern about poor engagement process. And as you know, that version of the act was pulled from the legislative process and, and Department of Lands and Forestry was then directed to do public consultations on the act. Those consultations happened in 2019. They were not amazing as far as consultations go, but a variety of views were articulated at five public consultation meetings across the province. Recently, we were, we were able to get a meeting with government as a stakeholder, and we once again shared the recommendations from our report. All of this to say engagement has been poor on this act, but all along we have asked for our rational, well-researched recommendations to be incorporated. The version of the act to come to the legislature this spring wasn't our dream act, but government proposed many elements that showed promise to address the threats to biodiversity in Nova Scotia. We felt it was not time to go back to the drawing board it was a workable act. That's why it has been so gut-wrenching to see a campaign that's tried to stop the entire act from being passed. A campaign that was based on lies about what the act means, the motivations for it, and the people who support it. As someone who has worked very hard for years from the outside to try to get a biodiversity act for Nova Scotia, let me be clear. The act never said anything about taking private land. It never permitted private citizens to go on someone else's land. It isn't about Halifax-based people trying to control rural landowners. That just isn't what the act says, and it wasn't the motivation for it. And these myths are not believed by all private landowners. In my work, I've traveled all over Nova Scotia and met with hundreds of landowners who do share some characteristics. 
Many are seeing biodiversity decline in their own lifetimes on their own land, and they're deeply troubled by it. I've met with wonderful landowners who are doing what they can to help biodiversity themselves and would welcome more provincial government stepping up and taking a stronger role. Many people have written into me in the past couple of weeks to say they support the act for these reasons and more. People in Nova Scotia, landowner or not, rural and urban, are looking to government to take a stronger leadership role in addressing the biodiversity crisis. All of this to say, generally, we are in support of the act, even in its weakened state that was proposed. It continues to have value. All along, it has been frustrating and ultimately disastrous for Department of Lands and Forestry staff that didn't do a better job of outreach and education about the Act before it was introduced again. We're disappointed that the useful elements from the Act or some useful elements from the Act were removed and we don't like the reasons for why they were removed or when they were removed. Like species in an ecosystem, each person and group working on biodiversity has a special niche, a unique set of characteristics that they bring to the challenge. Sadly, removing much of the enforcement capabilities in the Act does take away one of the few things that only governments have the power to do, to create enforceable rules to be used in the rare circumstances that merit that approach. And that's in line with many other federal and provincial laws that have existed for decades. There remains much that is still constructive and worthwhile in the Act, a commitment to a state of biodiversity report, the potential for the province to commence new programs focused on biodiversity research and monitoring, Coordination among provincial departments on biodiversity efforts is still in there, and the bill ensures public consultations on regulations flowing from the Act. Many of these commitments align with the recommendations that EAC and East Coast Environmental Law have been making for more than two years. Putting provincial effort into biodiversity education is initiated by the Act, and thanks goodness for that. The UN Convention on Biodiversity, of which Canada is a signatory, has had global goals and targets in place for the last 10 years to try to stem the rapid loss of biodiversity. The very first target, and I quote, target one, by 2020 at the latest, people are aware of the values of biodiversity and the steps they can take to conserve and use it sustainably. So the number one action for every person and nation on earth to save biodiversity is to improve our understanding of biodiversity and our connections to it. At a bare minimum, we should commit to put more effort into education about biodiversity, how it sustains us, and how we can do better in order to address the biodiversity loss that endangers us all. So I'm encouraged by the Premier's commitment, including through ministerial mandate letters, to expand biodiversity education in the school curriculum. And there are partners outside of the government who are ready, willing, and able to partner on that. But what I also saw through the statements made against the act is that we also need to do better in sharing knowledge amongst ourselves as adults who are connected to biodiversity. The conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity is well underway in Nova Scotia, thanks to the initiative and leadership of individuals, groups, various levels of government, and the Mi'kmaq of Nova Scotia. Much of this great work is the result of partnerships and cooperation. So it's fitting that the act embodies this approach. The Act supports the province in taking a greater leadership role on biodiversity in the spirit of collaboration and moving forward through better public engagement. We hope that the Biodiversity Act will be passed and that efforts that stem from it will be based on working together in a good way, a respectful way, a way that often comes naturally to Nova Scotians. So I thank you for your attention and consideration and I welcome any questions that you might have. Thank you, uh, Ms. McKendry. There's about two minutes left. Ms. Roberts. Thank you. Uh, Ms. McKendry, what is the timeline globally and locally to get serious about stemming biodiversity loss? The timeline is we need to ramp it up now. So much like there's the International Panel on Climate Change that releases reports regularly, there's an international panel around biodiversity. So they put out a landmark report in 2019 that said, for example, a million species are at risk of extinction in our lifetime. And it also highlighted the top threats to biodiversity in order. So it doesn't put a timeline like the IPCC report, but we need some of the things they called for our transformative systems change is uh, it's not going to be done by tweaks now. So it is appropriate that the government introduce uh, biodiversity legislation at this time when there is a call for uh, new drastic changes at all levels. Ms. Roberts? 
one and minute remaining. Thank you. Um, and, you know, you, you spoke about the campaign against uh, the act, which, you know, uh, I think what is concerning, particularly because it speaks to a lack of, of trust, and, and also it has maybe resulted in even less trust uh, amongst various stakeholders. Um, how do you see a bill like this could be used to actually build trust amongst private landowners, communities, and the government? I think with this particular act, I am really encouraged that something that we advocated for from the beginning before it was brought forward was that public engagement is going to improve this act. It's going to improve trust. It's going to improve the knowledge that we share about the act. So I am encouraged that in there, it does say there'll be public engagement around the regulations. Not every act has that. I mean, I think when you get people with diverse views in the same room, as was done through the natural resource strategy consultation more than 10 years ago, that really helps. And we did get people in the same room with a variety of views for the consultations around this act. But I think maybe there's even more education needed to build trust because then you find common grounds around biodiversity and the benefits that we stem from it. So education and engagement on the regulations. Thank you, Ms. McKendry. Uh, that's uh, time for the presentation and questions. Uh, and uh, to my colleagues, uh, it is now uh, time for our uh, mandated 15 minute uh, recess. So we will uh, be back in 15.
I'm just waiting for Ledge TV. Terry, you have to call order. Oh, sorry. Uh, order. Uh, we've uh, concluded uh, our recess. Um, thank you. Uh, so we're going to continue right into uh, our next presenter, uh, Mr. Barry McGregor, on Bill Number Four, Biodiversity Act. Good morning. Oh, is that Mr. McGregor? Yes, it is. Okay, so you're on with just audio, not video? That's correct. Okay, sorry, I didn't do We were just waiting for the video feed to pop up. Uh, welcome to uh, Law oh. Amendments. Uh, you'll have uh, 10 minutes total, uh, generally broken down to five minutes presentation, five minutes for Q&A from members of the committee. Uh, I will provide a one-minute warning uh, out of the total of 10, so you can begin now. Good morning. My name is Barry McGregor. Thank you for allowing me to make a presentation, and I'm speaking in support of Bill Number 4, the Biodiversity Act, as presented by Minister Porter on March 11, 2021. I'm 75 years old and have lived in Canaan, Yarmouth County, since 1978. I am an active environmentalist. My wife and I live totally off the grid in a small house we built 20 years ago from locally sourced and milled lumber. Our woodlot holding was at a maximum of 200 acres at one time, and we operated it part-time under the guidelines of a management plan supported by Nova Scotia lands and forests. This involved selective cutting in a mostly hardwood forest. Since the mid-1980s, my involvement in that lot has been harvesting firewood for our own use and cutting enough logs to satisfy a small need for lumber. We now own a remaining 50 acres in Canaan on the Tuscat River where we live. I am also the current president and founding member from 1986 of TREPA, the Tuscat River Environmental Protection Association. I'm also an active member of the Healthy Forest Coalition and a board member of Nature Nova Scotia. I am not a Halifax elitist. I gather from the media that changes have been made to the bill I have a copy of. I'm not sure what has changed, when it was changed, who changed it, on what authority, or who was consulted. So I'm speaking in favor of the bill as presented by the minister on March 11th, 2021. For some time, I have communicated with the provincial government in regard to forestry practices and the promotion of biodiversity and the care of endangered species. This communication was one way, me to the government. It also appeared that harvesting was going on at a rapid pace on Crown land to get as much done before the Leahy report was implemented. When efforts on the part of many failed to get a meeting with government or a moratorium on harvesting until the report was implemented, civil action became the only answer. A few people from Extinction Rebellion sat in the minister's office asking for a meeting and were arrested. A logging road blockade in Digby County held a movement of logging trucks from October 21st to December 15th when nine of the forest protectors were arrested. My wife, Sandra Finney, was one of the nine served by the RCMP. 
Premier McNeil announced his retirement, and Ian Rankin was chosen to be party leader and therefore Premier. His platform is a matter of record and including the, included the passing of the Biodiversity Act and implementation of the Leahy Report. My assumption, along with that of many others, was that these two measures would be taken early in Mr. Rankin's mandate. But no. A rapidly created organization called Concerned Private Landowners Coalition, CPLC, begins its initiative with a full-page ad in the Chronicle Herald misrepresenting the contents of the Biodiversity Act and successfully getting a lot of private landowners unnecessarily upset. What has occurred over the past two weeks in our little province is truly alarming. Arguing points and perceptions is one thing, but it is quite another to outright lie and mislead, so to whip the people into a frenzied weapon that destroys initiatives that are beneficial for the common good. The CPLC misrepresentation includes fines for violations that are said to be too high. Historically, when fines were low, for environmental violations, offenders would say they complied with all the rules as they had paid the fine and kept on off offending. A fine that hurts is required if a judge needs that as a way of dealing with persistent or gross offenders. It's totally up to the judge to set the amount of a fine. Entering private land without permission. The act specifies that this can only happen with permission of the landowner and an agreement with the owner. They also say that there has been no consultation. There was advertised consultation opportunities at least four different parts of the Nova Scotia. There was also consultation recently to adjust the bill. It appears from the media that some elements have changed in the Biodiversity Act, removing some of its teeth. The CPLC smells victory in its two-week effort and is celebrating with a large ad in the current Chronicle Herald, also ads on local radio stations. <clears throat> My final point is that there are really not two sides to this discussion if we look at the long term. And forestry and biodiversity, <clears throat> pardon me, what other choice have you? The question is, what do we want to pass on to our grandchildren and great-grandchildren? What is your vision? I firmly believe it is the responsibility of the Nova Scotia government to clarify the long-term plan of where we were headed as a province for our forest land. If we do not have a clear common destination, we'll never agree on how to get there. One last point is I believe consideration should be given to putting this act under the Department of Environment. We had that happen years ago when the act to regulate the mink industry was uh, set up and was initially under the Department of Agriculture and then was moved to uh, Department of Environment for the regulation. Thank you for your time. That's uh, the end of my statement. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McGregor. Uh, so we're open to questions, and Ms. Roberts uh, will ask first. There's about uh, three and a half minutes remaining. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you very much for uh, your remarks. I wonder if you could just speak from your, you know, location in in Southwest Nova Scotia um, about the concerns that have been. Uh, um, have been spoken about around the act, you know, some of them, like you say, uh, exaggerated. What, from, from any conversations that you've actually had in your community, what is the impact of the, the misrepresentations of the powers of the act? Well, the, the misrepresentations have been, uh, have been very well uh, done. I have great admiration for whoever was behind uh, doing this. I've had uh, the talking points from uh, that organization have uh, been expressed to me by a man cutting a road down at my neighbors. He had all the, all the stuff. 
It's been repeated to me by members of the legislature. Um, so they've done, done a very good job. The C, or whatever it was, the CPLC has a website, and you can go on there and comment. But if your comment is not along with their way of thinking, your comment isn't included. And that's happened to me and to several other people I know that have tried to comment. So they, they've done a very good job of misrepresenting the facts, and uh, it appears that, that a lot of people have uh, absorbed that. I think it's the government's duty to pass this act and in due course uh, implement, uh, create and implement the regulations. All right, Ms. Roberts. And, you know, as a, a woodlot owner, though you say that you, you have, you know, less land under, under management now than, than you did previously, but do you, can you envision how you might actually take part in a, a biodiversity management zone with like any specific project or, or how, how you might kind of use the mechanisms of this act on your land? Um, to be honest, I haven't given that a moment's thought. I just know that such a thing would be available if I if I wanted to. Um, the organization that I represent, TREPA, we're trying to buy a piece of land that we can use as a model site for how woodlot should be handled. There are lots of examples in our area where we have those people that own forest land that manage it very well. They selectively cut. They, uh, they uh, promote local habitat and what have you. All right, uh, Ms. Roberts, 30 seconds remaining. And do you have any thoughts about what the government could have done in the, in the last two years to help people see this legislation less as control and more as an additional resource or tool that would be available for land management? Well, it, it, it seemed to me that well, it could have been out there more. Uh, the, I, I think that, that biodiversity, my sense is, is not a priority with the Department of Lands and Forests. So it, it needs somebody else, some other agency within government to promote it. Uh, and it could be out there more and doing more informal discussions, public meetings. Certainly that's happened with all kinds of other, other things within the government's purview. All right. Thank you, uh, Mr. McGregor. Uh, time has elapsed. I thank you for taking the time today to share your uh, thoughts and answer some questions. Next up is Ms. Nina Newington. Ms. Newington, are you on the line? Just for your information, uh, it seems just connecting to the audio stream. Ms. Newington, welcome to Law Amendments. Uh, we have uh, 10 minutes to present and uh, go through questions and answers. It'll be five minutes uh, roughly for each. I'll give a warning at the one minute of the total 10 remaining. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to you, Ms. Newington, uh, to begin your uh, presentation. <laughs> Thank you. I think I'm working on Zoom. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. Audio and um, video is good. Thank you. So um, first I want to express my support for the Biodiversity Act. I'm a rural landowner. My wife and I own 145 acres on the North Mountain. I'm a member of the Nova Scotia Woodlot Owners and Operators Association. Um, 
I believe that the core of the Biodiversity Act is an understanding that as human beings, nature does not belong to us, we belong to nature. That's present in the introduction to the bill that we are a part of the ecosystem. Um, and it's really essential that in law we begin to acknowledge that fact and make it central. So I'm proud that Nova Scotia is introducing a Biodiversity Act, the first in North America. Um, and I'm extremely dismayed that the government appears to have crumbled in the face of really spurious organizing by vested interests um, to oppose this act. Um, as probably many have heard, the international, well, I'll just use the acronym, the IPBES um, study on biodiversity makes it really clear that we are in a catastrophic decline of biodiversity. I won't go into the details of that. I'm sure you've heard them from lots of people. Um, that's just as true in Nova Scotia as it is in any other part of the planet. And we have an obligation to protect the natural world and the natural systems. And that means we have to change how we extract resources, both on public and on private land. Um, on public land, Crown land represents only 30% of the landmass of Nova Scotia. Um, it's very important as part of protecting biodiversity that there is an international commitment, which Canada has signed to protect 30% of our lands and seas by 2030. It's not apparent to me how Nova Scotia is going to accomplish that. We're barely making it to 14%. Um, if there is to be no movement for protection on private lands, then we need to protect all 30% of Crown land in order to meet that obligation. Um, that would be obviously quite disruptive to the forestry industry. Um, on the other hand, climate change and biodiversity loss is going to be extremely disruptive to all of us and is already being disruptive to all of us. Um, we're already seeing the effects. So, um, I want to talk a moment about the biodiversity management zones. I think these are a really excellent idea. Um, on Crown land, they may make it easier to do what the government should already have done in terms of protecting core habitat of species like the mainland moose. Um, many areas, for example, the area in Digby County that was protected by the blockades briefly um, should never have been available for industrial forestry if there were any kind of level of protection for biodiversity. The government has failed drastically in that. Um, so we need those biodiversity management zones as a tool on Crown land, but I also believe they should be available to private landowners. They were never going to be imposed on private landowners. That was a fuss made by um, the industry, and it was really scurrilous that they whipped up reactions with so little truth to them. Um, as a landowner, I would love to be able to participate in those kind of plans. Um, and the Biodiversity Act needs to have teeth. The matter of um, invasive species is quite important. I've spent time on Crown land looking at the kinds of logging roads that are put in as large areas of those forests are clear cut. And by the way, 30% is a clear cut. If you only leave 30% of the trees, it is a clear cut and it leaves an ecological desert. I have witnessed what those logging road systems are. And if we were even to begin to think about managing crown lands for biodiversity, those roads would have to be minimal and also would be restored to a natural state immediately after their use, which is supposed to be what happens but doesn't. So we desperately need the Biodiversity Act. We need it to have teeth, and that means enforcement abilities. It's absurd that people freaked out about those fines. They're the same as the endangered species fines, and they have barely been enforced. Um, but really, we need the government to actually step up, keep its promises on reforms it's already um, pledged to do, for example, the Leahy Act, but also start really working with private landowners across the province. A lot of us care a lot and would love to have um, a government that was trustworthy, and that means not at the behest of industrial forestry. I understand that we have to balance jobs and economy and ecosystem, but 
as Leahy put it, the the ecosystem health has to trump all of those things. Otherwise, we're all dead meat. Um, so I guess I'll take questions. All right, about uh, four and a half minutes left, Ms. Roberts. Thank you, Ms. Newington. Um, I wonder if you uh, can speak um, to how you envision participating in the Biodiversity Act as a private landowner, you know, in, in the ideal circumstances, how uh, how might you uh, engage in a biodiversity management zone, for example? Um, I would love to see neighboring groups of landowners who have similar concern and interest begin to connect with each other and do these things together in collaboration with the government so that we might have... Um, from the government help in identifying the particular ecosystem values of land that we collectively own, rather than working at individual landowner by landowner, actually come up with sort of pods of landowners who are concerned for and would love to be a part of restoring and protecting biodiversity. Um, none of that is, you know, being enforced by the government, but it would be agreements people would make. It's possible that as carbon sequestration is valued, there may be um, options to, for example, agree not to cut your forest down in return for some compensation for um, protecting that forest for, I don't know, pledging to not have it cut for the next 100 years, I think is one of the figures that are around. So bringing in the carbon storage element as well as biodiversity um, will be a possibility. Does that kind of answer your question? Thank you. Yes, it does. Mr. Chair, may I ask a follow-up? If there's no other members, so please do. About two and a half minutes remaining. Thank you. Um, and and I'm wondering from your conversations, you're in the Annapolis Valley, I believe. Um, would you say... Uh, you know how how polarized are the private landowners in in your uh, part of the province? It, it has has this um, you know last couple of weeks resulted in more polarization or or distrust? And and if so, how do you see that being repaired? Um, I really have not heard a whole lot of people thinking that you know, the government was going to come in and stop them doing what they wanted to do. Now, admittedly, I live, you know, to some extent, in greater connection with people who share similar views, but I also talk with my neighbours. And I, last night I talked to a friend of mine who's you know, a seventh-generation um, family here in the North Mountain and asked her if she'd had pushback, and she said, no, not really. Um, people have very low expectations of government. <laughs> And they don't really expect them to do anything up here. So <laughs> that's not a great version, but it's perhaps better than viewing the government as a complete enemy. Um, so that's just what I can report back from, from where I am. Thanks. All right. I'm not seeing any other questions. So, Ms. Newington, I thank you for your time and your uh, presentation to uh, law amendments on this bill, number four, Biodiversity Act. Thank you very much for hearing me out. Bye bye. Next up is Mr. Adam Malcolm. Mr. Malcolm, uh, welcome to Law Amendments uh, Committee uh, for Bill Number Four, the Biodiversity Act. You'll have uh, ten minutes total, uh, generally broken up to five-minute uh, presentation, leaving five minutes for Q and A. I'll uh, give you a one-minute warning if necessary when we get to the nine-minute mark. And with that, you can begin. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for giving me this opportunity to speak. Um, 
I'll just tell you a little bit about myself uh, uh, to let you know right off the bat. I, I support um, the Biodiversity Act, and I I, su I don't support um, removing um, what's been removed um, just recently. Um, sorry, I'm just looking at my notes here. Uh, the emergency orders. I. I I wish they could stay. The enforcement section, I, I wish it could stay. Um, just to tell you a little bit about myself, I grew up on river inhabitants here in Richmond County. Um, I spent my the majority of my life here. I grew up fishing and hunting with the older people around the area. Um, and I've, I'm 40 and I've seen an awful lot of changes just in my life. And the story I have to tell about the decline of species in this area is, it sounds like the story of someone a lot older than myself. I can remember being up river and, and being able to look down into pools with hundreds of salmon in it in the fall. <clears throat> I can remember all the shad that used to be in the river, American eels that used to be tangled up in the shade in the daytime, just kind of snoozing, half buried in gravel. We used to go to a particular brook um, to fish Gasparo uh, here on the river. And I, it's been so long since I've seen a Gasparo on the river, I can, I can hardly remember what one looks like. The first or second moon of January, my father and I, and sometimes one of his cousins would go uh, spearing tomcod, or we call them frostfish, in a couple of brooks closer to the ocean on the river. Um, I still go now and then, but they're, they're just not there anymore. Uh, wood turtles, I've noticed there's far fewer than there used to be up river. Um, uh, bank swallows as well, there's fewer nesting up there. And now I just want to, I know I'm a couple minutes in already. I just want to tell you what I see as the local issues around here. Uh, and on the lower stretch of river, it's land development that's happening without any proper surveys of, you know, potential species at risk that are present in areas where roads are being built and like the whole lower 15 kilometer stretch as the river flows has gone from just mostly wilderness on both sides in my life to mostly lots all sectioned off. Uh, I know small little wooded wetlands have been backfilled. I know of areas where it's entirely possible that New Jersey rush existed, but the habitat is gone now. Uh, there's a stand of black ash up there that I'm really concerned about because it's adjacent to one of these developments. Um, and right now there's, there's really nothing that can be done. Um, there's no legislation that I know of that, uh, would compel a landowner to protect species at risk. I think the wildlife divisions, um, um, the most they can do as far as I know is try to educate a landowner on, you know, what, what might be present on your land and, and what measures you can take to try to protect uh, things. I know a lot of the decline that I've seen isn't, isn't only because of uh, local issues, but I'm certain that uh, what's happening locally is contributing to the problem. So on the lower stretch of river, again, it's land developers. Um, there's three of them and it's all I don't have any issues with, you know, people moving in and regardless of where they're from, I've, I've lived all over the world and I'm very open minded in that way. But um, there is concern around the particular people who are moving in. You may have seen some some of the news stories last summer about like potential German colonies of Nazi sympathizing people. And I've met I've met people who are moving in and I, I can't say that it's impossible that it's true of everyone that's moving in those stories, but um, there are a reason. I do have firsthand reasons for concern as well. Anyway, I'm on a tangent. Um, Downriver land development is the issue. There's not much that I, I consider myself kind of a local protector of the river. I don't see any legal avenues that I have to try to protect species at risk on this lower stretch of river. Upriver, the issue is, um, there's a poultry and cattle farm 
a beef cattle farm that keeps its dead stock pile about 50 meters from the river. And this is in an area um, where every bend on the river has a, a sandbar and uh, our threatened wood turtles and our vulnerable snapping turtles uh, nest there every summer. And I've seen serious declines in their numbers. And I think probably a big reason for that is the year round supply of food that the coyote, very healthy, very large coyote population has in that area. So they're able to just come down and and find the nests any any time through the summer. And it's not just coyotes either. Now in Nova Scotia, as far as I know, there is no, um, there are best practices that are suggested for, for farms of that nature on how to um, properly cover, pro properly uh, um, um, take care of their compost pile, but this this farm doesn't. And I don't think they, legally have to, as far as I can tell. Um, so a biodiversity act that did have, was able to leverage emergency orders, did have, you know, an actual enforceable, you know, uh, legal grounding in it, um, might be able to begin to address problems like these that I see in my area, but, um, as it stands now, the version that was sent to me this morning just looks, I don't, it doesn't look like something I really support. It doesn't look like something that goes far enough. And just to mention, I am a landowner. I'm, I'm, uh, I have a, a small wood lot here and I don't agree with a lot of the messaging that I've been seeing in the media around the, the dangers of the proposed act. And I'll see the rest of my time. I know I'm over five minutes there. Okay, so just under three minutes left. Any questions from members? Ms. LeBlanc and then Ms. Roberts. Well, I don't have a question really, but I just wanted to thank you, Mr. Malcolm, for um, uh, explaining to us the actual um, the, the results of, you know, of the lack of a biodiversity act and, and your, your um, personal experience with the, with the land and the animals and the species uh, is super compelling and very sad. And um, for me, paints the picture of why this act is so important. So I'll, I'll, I'll let my colleague ask the question. I just wanted to thank you so much for, for your presentation. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Um, I echo my, my colleague's comment, um, but I thought I would also ask, I mean, I understand that the, uh, that the Biodiversity Act, you know, was first um, thought of to respond to gaps in legislation, particularly, particularly around uh, aquatic species. Uh, and, and I wonder if, if, you know, if you could comment at all, uh, you know, apart from the land development, on on other ways that you see this um, legislation possibly, uh, you know, with enforcement mechanisms uh, serving to protect uh, aquatic species or or um, you know somehow counteract invasive aquatic species. Sure. So. Uh, one of the issues that I'm seeing around here, I, when I was a boy, I used to be able, the, the land that I bought here um, is bordered by two brooks. And a lot of the brooks along here, because the development isn't happening right necessarily always right on the river, though the lower 15 kilometers, both banks are pretty much fully developed now. Um, but there's also lots that run up perpendicular up into the woods and these are crossing brooks and it's my hope that maybe a biodiversity act that uh, has a little more legal teeth might be able to help with things like the brook on the side of our property that, and, and many brooks along the river where the developments are happening are just running muddy for the, the brook here has been running muddy for two years because of the road that was built up above across the brook and probably, you know, following the guidelines that exist today, but 
those guidelines haven't stopped the muddying of a brook where I used to be able to catch salmon, par, smolt all summer long as a kid. And now, no, you don't see any fish in the brook at all because it's just not suitable habitat when it runs money like that for, for so, so consistently. Thank you, uh, Mr. Malcolm. Uh, that's uh, time has wrapped. Thank you for taking the time to uh, bring your, your information to the committee today. Thanks again. Uh, next up is Ms. Lorette, I believe, Geldenheis. Ms. Geldenheis? Hello. Oh, okay. On with audio, not the, uh, oh, there we go. Uh, with video, perfect. Uh, so welcome to Law Amendments Committee. Uh, you know, we have uh, 10 minutes total, five minutes presentation, five minutes for question and answer. I'll give a one minute warning if your presentation uh, moves to the nine minute mark. And uh, with that, I'll let you begin. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Lorette Geldenhuis. I'm a physician, a pathologist, um, a mother of three daughters and grandmother of two grandsons aged seven and three. I'm here to express my strong support for Nova Scotia's Biodiversity Act Bill Number 4. Like many Nova Scotians, my family and I were extremely disappointed to see the province remove important sections of the act following the misinformation campaign by forestry industry lobby groups. However, there are still many valuable and much needed aspects of the act that remain. I therefore urge you to support the passage of bill number four and bring in the Biodiversity Act now and restore the omitted sections. As a physician, I would like to share with you five summary points from the World Health Organization fact sheet on biodiversity and health. Number one, biodiversity provides many goods and services essential to life on Earth. The management of natural resources can determine the baseline health status of a community. Environmental stewardship can contribute to secure livelihoods and improve the resilience of communities. The loss of these resources can create the conditions responsible for morbidity and mortality. Point number two, biodiversity supports human and societal needs, including food and nutritional security, energy, development of medicines and pharmaceuticals and fresh water, which together underpin good health. It also supports economic opportunities and leisure activities that contribute to overall well being. Point number three land use change, pollution, poor water quality, chemical and waste contamination, climate change, and other causes of ecosystem degradation all contribute to biodiversity loss and can pose considerable threats to human health. Human health and well being are influenced by the health of local plant and animal communities and the integrity of the local ecosystems that they form. Point number five infectious diseases cause over 1 billion human infections per year, with millions of deaths each year globally. Approximately two thirds of known human infectious diseases are shared with animals. And the majority of recently emerging diseases are associated with wildlife. As one example, I will elaborate on point number five, infectious diseases. This fact sheet was written in 2015. Here we are in 2021, in the middle of a pandemic that has claimed almost 
million lives and resulted in unfathomable suffering and economic loss. A paper from the medical literature published in January this year states that the loss of biodiversity in the ecosystems has created the general conditions that have favored and in fact made possible the insurgence of the COVID-19 pandemic. The paper further elaborates that deforestation, changes in forest habitats, poorly regulated agricultural surfaces and mismanaged urban growth have altered the composition of wildlife communities and increased the contacts of humans with wildlife. Bats have adapted to human environments such as houses, barns, cultivated fields and orchards. Bats are major hosts for several coronaviruses, but are resistant to the viruses while the viruses are able to attack other species, including humans. Over time, these viruses have undergone modifications, such as the ability to use the ACE2 as a receptor in host cells, increasing their infectivity and leading to serious human outbreaks in the last two decades and the present COVID-19 pandemic. In conclusion, as a Nova Scotian mother of three daughters and grandmother of two grandsons aged seven and three, I urge you to preserve our beautiful province for their futures and leave a legacy of which your and my grandchildren will be proud. Again, I urge you to support the passage of bill number four and bring in the Biodiversity Act now. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation, Dr. Glenn, Glendon Highs, correct? Uh, Geldenheim. Uh, uh, so I will open it up to uh, committee members for questions. Ms. Roberts. Thank you, and thank you for bringing an entirely uh, different uh, perspective on this conversation. Um, I, I wonder if uh, just two things quickly, if you might uh, tell us from where you are appearing, um, where in, in the province. And uh, and I'd love to hear any comment you have on whether there are enough resources behind the province's work uh, to preserve biodiversity. Uh, so I am, um, I live in Halifax. Um, and then um, regarding uh, resources, um, I, uh, I am not exactly sure what your question is, but um, from what I can see, um, a Biodiversity Act, um, such as what is proposed here, uh, will significantly enhance the ability of the province to uh, protect biodiversity and therefore protect um, the, uh, um, the natural environment uh, for all the benefits that I've outlined for human health, economic prosperity, and so on. Thank you very much. Not seeing any other questions from the committee. So doctor, I thank you for taking the time to present your uh, information to the committee on bill number four, biodiversity. Have a great day. Thank you very much. Have a great day also. Next up is Ms. Eleanor Cure. I'm sure maybe uh, Ledger Council can check. I'm not sure if uh, 
there's technical issues or if uh, they're available. So it doesn't seem that they are connecting. I'm not sure if that's a technical difficulty or if the person's not uh, been uh, connected with. They're not. They're having. Uh, they're not seeing her um, there. Um, but I passed on the phone number to see, and they're not seeing the phone number either. So the person appeared to be in the waiting room. Okay. So. Uh, with the person not being in the waiting room, um, we're actually move on uh, perhaps to the next uh, presenter at 11.05, and I believe Ledge Council has uh, notified me a few moments ago that uh, the individual uh, slated for 11.05 has actually proactively canceled. Um, so uh, I would uh, propose perhaps uh, getting us back on schedule. Uh, we uh, recess now uh, until uh, e it'll end up being a little bit longer, a 20 minute recess. will bring us back on at 1130 for the next uh, presenter. So if we uh, recess for 20 minutes and we'll come back with our next presenter at 1130. Thank you.
Our uh, first uh, presenter is Barry Burnett. Do we have Mr. Barnett on via phone? Yes. Okay, uh, Mr. Barnett, uh, welcome to uh, Law Amendments Committee. Uh, you'll have uh, 10 minutes to speak to Bill 4, the Biodiversity Act. Uh, uh, five minutes usually for presentation, five for questions. And I'll give a, a one minute uh, warning at the nine minute mark if you are still uh, presenting and we're not in Q&A yet. So you can uh, begin. Okay, thank you very much. I wanna thank the committee for the opportunity to address you today. First of all, let me apologize. I tried to join by Zoom, uh, but Zoom had other ideas and they locked me out. My name is Barry Barnett. I'm the Executive Director for the All Train Vehicle Association of Nova Scotia, or ATBANS as we are known. We represent 42 clubs across Nova Scotia with over 5,300 members on our membership list as of this morning. We are the third largest OTV, ATV organization in Canada behind Quebec and New Brunswick. We represent the organized, responsible ATV riders. Our clubs promote organized events, build and maintain trails, and we distribute literature and information to members and others about the importance of safe, responsible riding. We also organize a volunteer trail patrol program and a safety training program for members and others across Nova Scotia. When Bill 4 was introduced, we were not aware of the implications that this bill would have on our members and partners. ATBANS and our member clubs have a vast trail network with over 1,400 kilometers of trail directly managed and 11,000 kilometers of established trail and map trail across Nova Scotia. We rely on the goodwill and the generosity of private landowners who allow our members to build, maintain, and map trail, our trail network. Shortly after this bill was tabled, we began to receive calls and emails about the impact this bill would have on private landowners and how some would need to withdraw land use permission. We have worked hard to develop an interconnected trail network across Nova Scotia, and it is completely reliant on important connections across private land. We have several thousand land use agreements, including agreements that cover as large as 450,000 acres of land and some as small as 50 feet across the private backyard. We want to stress that we support government's objective to protect biodiversity. However, we believe this can be achieved using other legislative tools. I've read the act twice and still don't fully understand the need or intent of this bill. Again, we do support the desire to protect biodiversity and strongly encourage government to utilize their existing legislative powers to achieve this endeavor. We provided information to our members about this bill and receive significant feedback. All but one opposed the bill as was originally tabled. We reached out to the minister and the premier and all MLAs about the concerns we heard. I want to thank those MLAs who responded to our letters with either a phone call or a reply email. I also want to thank the minister who personally called to respond to our concerns and indicated government's intention to address our concerns by amending the bill. We hope and expect the changes proposed by the minister will achieve the concerns of private landowners and we will not have any further negative impacts or plan our plans to have a fully interconnected trail network across Nova Scotia. We also want to thank government and all MLAs who support our members and their objective and to encourage the organized responsible ATV community. We believe that we have come a long way in recent years. However, we know our goal is not shared by everyone. Just like enforcement of existing laws will help protect biodiversity, so will enforcement of existing OHV laws help support our organized responsible OHV use. We believe the sport of ATVN can and will be an important sector as we rebuild our economy, especially in rural Nova Scotia. I want to thank you for listening to us 
and thank you for the opportunity to address you on this important issues. And I'm more than pleased to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Barnett. Uh, so I'll uh, open to the floor of colleagues. Ms. Uh, Smith McCresson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, uh, Barry, for the presentation today. Just wondering if you've had an opportunity to see the uh, recommended amendments that were released uh, just minutes prior to law amendments starting today. And I have not, no. Okay. Was uh, your organization consulted prior to the Biodiversity Act, Bill number four being tabled? I don't think we were specifically uh, consulted, uh, although I do recall uh, the original uh, bill for there were some consultations, but we weren't part of the consultation process, no. Okay, thank you. Well, maybe I'll ask another question if I could. Sure. Sorry, on mute. Uh, Ms. McCrossan, go ahead. Okay. Thank you, um, Mr. Barnett. Can you share with us in Law Amendments Committee the importance of your organization, uh, both for the mental health of your members as well as the economy here in Nova Scotia? Well, let me start with the economy. Uh, we uh, have partnered with uh, local services like uh, gas stations, restaurants, and accommodations. In recent years, I haven't seen a partnership uh, like we have now. We have businesses reaching out to us to be included in our partnership program. Uh, now with the uh, advent of the pilot project, uh, we've been able to support businesses like uh, the Walton Pub as an example. It's a restaurant in Walton, Hans County. Uh, I'm told that that uh, was a seasonal operation and now, uh, because of the partnership that we've had and the Share the Road program, uh, they've become a year-round service. Uh, we have specific locations where there are, you know, Clarestone Inn and Richmond County. Uh, they actually promote uh, ATV rides as part of a package deal where uh, our members and others, and I'm sorry, our members, they promote it to our members only, where our members can come up, stay for a weekend and go on a, on a guided tour around Alma Dam. And uh, this is happening more and more as, uh, as we further develop our interconnection. The other thing that we did specifically with the economy, we undertook a, uh, a local company to do an, uh, an economic analysis on the impact of our sport. And uh, quite honestly, we were stunned at the uh, total spend of ATVers and OHVers across Nova Scotia. Um, I forget the exact number, but it was staggering and in the billions. Uh, the, the strange thing that we've experienced this year is that the pandemic has actually had uh, an incredible um, uh, benefit to our organization, our sport. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing um, ATV sales companies and dealerships uh, selling out of product and wait lists now. Our membership numbers are at an all-time high, and uh, the interest of getting out there on the trails is incredible. On the mental health thing, uh, quite honestly, I think we all know that uh, outdoors, fresh air, and enjoying nature is a positive thing for anybody's mental health. And, uh, you know, our members, um, it, it's not only a way of life, but a way of living. So I hope that answers your question. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, Ms. Smith McCrossan with another follow up. Thank you, and thank you, uh, Mr. Barnett. What do you think will happen with the trails in Nova Scotia if Bill number four is passed? Do you believe it will have a positive or a negative impact on trails that are currently on private land? Well, if it were passed in its current format, and when I say current format, I meant the format that was uh, tabled uh, two weeks ago. Um, you know, we believed at that, you know, in that format, it would have had a negative impact. And we heard from landowners who told us that they would be withdrawing their land use permission. Uh, I haven't seen the, um, the changes. Uh, I can only uh, speak to the minister's commitment to address the concerns of the private landowners those concerns are addressed and the private landowners don't withdraw our land use permission. 
uh, we'll be fine and we'll be able to move forward if the land use permission is withdrawn from private landowners. And, you know, I can speak to a couple. We have a large one, 450,000 acres, over 2,000 pieces of property. It would dissect our trail network by four or 500 uh, dissections where we wouldn't be able to go across. And uh, we would then have to start looking for other ways around, over, or under, or past. And uh, quite honestly, we struggle these days just to make this uh, goal of a completely interconnected trail network. Thank, Thank you, you. Uh, Mr. Bernet. Uh, Ms. LeBlanc with 28 seconds left. Uh, thanks, Mr. Burnett. Just a quick question. Uh, did the did the uh, private uh, woodlot owners uh, or um, landowners say why they would have to withdraw their their uh, land use permission? They were, uh, well, I can't speak for all of them, but the ones that we did hear from uh, were concerned about the liability and the aspect of, uh, of being responsible for the actions of others. And, uh, you know, from my perspective, I understand what they were saying. We do provide... Uh, third-party liability protection, uh, but the fines were huge and the impact was massive. Thank you, uh, Mr. Burnett. The time uh, for your presentation has elapsed. I thank you for taking the time to engage us and share your insight on behalf of your members. Thank you. Next up is Ms. Lil McPherson. Ms. McPherson. Excellent. Uh, welcome to Law Amendments uh, Committee. Uh, we'll have uh, 10 minutes total to present and have questions uh, posed by members. Uh, I'll give a warning at the nine minute mark. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to you to present on bill number four, the Biodiversity Act. Okay, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Audio okay. and video are good. I didn't quite hear you, what you said that we've been having troubles. Okay, I'll start right away. Hello, my name is Lil McPherson, and thank you for all giving me this time. I'm not an expert on much, but here goes my thoughts. I come wearing many hats today, and I am first a mother and a grandmother, and I'm really speaking from that heart. I'm the founder and co-owner of the Wooden Monkey Restaurants, and my business was built on a vision to help build back food security for Nova Scotia. As we have only three days of food left, if we were to get cut off from the rest of the food chain, which we kind of experienced this year. An industry also in need of biodiversity, but that's for another day. I also own and run my own farm on a 100 acre woodlot and educating myself on how to manage it, signed up for the Woodland webinar put on by Nova Scotia Woodlot Owners and Operators Association, which is excellent, by the way. Our fifth webinar series is on biodiversity and um, endangered species at risk. Perfect timing. I also believe in the local food economy. I also believe in the local wood economy, building for building supplies, not biomass. I can proudly say I did a full house reno on my farm sourced from a local mill. In any of my building projects, I order my wood from a local mill, which I might add excellent product, service, and the best prices in Nova Scotia. Food production and forest production, both are ecological systems uh, that are woven together. Ecosystems around the world are collapsing due to human mismanagement and industrial abuse. Do we really want to join this race to the bottom? No. Saying yes to this historic biodiversity act <clears throat> will put us in motion, set the foundation to be on the road to perhaps become one of the cleanest and healthiest, most prosperous places in this country and truly be on the world stage as a leader on climate change solutions. Here we go. Is this paper? <laughs> Sorry, stuck together. This act is right there on the crossroads. I am very excited to see our new premier come out with so much ambition. This is a good sign and any good leader recognizes a good idea. So I am sure, I sure hope that Gary and Tim will stand alongside the Premier to work together and help make this historic reality act a reality. Protecting our biodiversity will fit perfect with our climate change targets as healthy forests and soils capture a lot of carbon. 
we have less than 10 years. And let me repeat that, less than 10 years to make bold changes for the future for all of us here in Nova Scotia. Never in our lifetime does a politician carry so much responsibility. And there has never been a time on earth when we need to reflect on what we are doing and not doing. So let's roll up our sleeves and get started. Nova Scotia having the first Biodiversity Act in North America? Wow. This will turn heads all over the world to look at what we are doing. It will send a clear signal out to green businesses and technologies all over the world that will say Nova Scotia is open for green businesses. They, they are clearly on a new path. And I have seen this world green stage in action with my own eyes. I have been to three United Nations climate change conferences and they are life changing. And I know Ian Rankin has been to one too, he told me. And I'm sure like myself, it changed him. I should add that I was one of the first 200 uh, Canadians trained by Al Gore to present for the Climate Reality Canada and our beautiful David Suzuki is always there to help. This Biodiversity Act is critical piece of the solution. At these conferences, the world shows up. 195 countries are there. It's the biggest party in the world. You can see the millions, and I mean millions of dollars being negotiated, making green new deals. It's so damn exciting. I was there in Paris when our own federal minister of environment and climate change said, there is now a trillion dollars worth of green businesses that will be born. I saw that future and I want that for Nova Scotia. We have the opportunity to be an oasis here, like Costa Rica, as opposed to an ecological disaster like Brazil. This Biodiversity Act is not just about saving some species at risk. It's about recognizing the huge value its services brings to us all, for free, I might add. What makes one ecosystem strong and another weak? The answer, to a large extent, is biodiversity. It's built out of three intertwining features, ecosystem, species, and genetic diversity. And the more intertwining there is between these features, the denser and more resilient the fabric becomes. In simpler terms, the stronger the biodiversity, in, the stronger we are in Nova Scotia. It's our beautiful, unique Nova Scotia tapestry. Every link provides stability to the next. Strengthening this biodiversity fabric is good for business. And the biggest risk to this fabric now is clear cutting, open pit gold mining, open pen farm salmon. And we know clear cutting, as we know, is the biggest elephant in this room. And I'm gonna bring it up. <laughs> we need to be courting green businesses and industries, not gold mining, clear cutting, tire burning, coal mining, biomass burning, and filling our oceans with unhealthy farm salmon. When you start to have too many holes in this fabric of ours, for example, clear cutting, you are not just taking out a massive wood stands, but millions of organisms, plants, animals are also taken out. And now that fabric is weakened and the knot starts to unravel. We can't afford any more holes in Nova Scotia or we will sink. Keeping the beautiful fabric of Nova Scotia intact and healthy for generations to come will be great for business. We are facing the most uncertain times in our lifetime and business as usual will not build our economy. It will hold Nova Scotia back, helping prepare us for these uncertain times we need. I stake my life on this statement being at conferences. Now and in the near future, people will be looking for green, clean and sustainable places to live, build their businesses, raise their families, vacation, go to school here. Why? Because Nova Scotia can be known as one of the cleanest places on this earth. We can do this, we're the perfect size. And I will tell you this, once you start to heal one thing, many other systems start to heal and regenerate. So this Biodiversity Act will have a strong positive effect guaranteed. And for the first Biodiversity Act in North America, we should be celebrating, not fighting. This is such a great opportunity. 
And I have heard from woodlot owners and that, that field, this is a very important opportunity as well. We just really need to spell it out clearly how this will affect them. And me too, because I'm a woodlot owner. The group that is being loudest, that's being the loudest opposition to this bill are fear-based themselves. They are also scared for their future. They want to maintain this unsustainable, outdated forest practices. But you can't let them be the loudest voice. We did not vote them in. I have a saying, just before someone drowns, they splash very hard. This group is splashing very hard and that's okay. Let them splash, it's fine. Just don't let them distract you <clears throat> from making the right decisions for us all. This new act will be the tool to begin <clears throat> and must needed rest and repair of forests, our rivers and our oceans. I wanna end with this study <clears throat> One study from Pinozo <clears throat> and O'Brien, 2001, Volume 2, A Way Forward, Case Studies in Sustainable Forestry, GPI Atlantic Canada Genuine Progress Index. From Nova Scotia, that over a 150 year period from 1840 to 1990, single tree one minute warning. Fleck harvesting guaranteed an estimated 74% greater yield and growth and clear cutting from a 60 hectare woodlot on Windhouse Farm in Southwest Nova Scotia. These guys are wood producers. The property owned Jim Dresser estimated that more than 8 million board feet have been harvested from the property from over 150 years and 2 million board feet of merchantable volume remained. Pinozo and O'Brien estimate that clear cutting the same property every 50 years would generate 5.7 million broad feet with no standing timber remaining after the final cut. So two and a quarter million extra board feet from sustainable forestry. There's proof, we have it, and there's lots more proof out of the province. Thank you so much for this time. Thank, thank you very much, Ms. McPherson. Uh, and you've taken the, the 10 minutes uh, up in your presentation, uh, but Great. I do appreciate a lot of good information there. Um, next what? up is Ms. Beasley. Oh, sorry, no, my mistake. Uh, Mr. Uh, Brandon Ellis. Uh, sorry, Mr. Brandon Ellis is the next presenter. Okay, I believe Mr. Ellis has joined. Uh, Mr. Ellis, uh, welcome to Law Amendments Committee. Uh, you'll have 10 minutes uh, to present and Q&A combined. Uh, I'll give a warning at the nine minute mark. And with that, uh, you can begin your presentation. All right, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair and honorable committee members uh, for having us here today. My name is Brandon Ellis, and I, I thank you for allowing time for today for all these important presentations that are before you. Today, I'm here on behalf of the Atlantic Chamber of Commerce. The ACC is the largest accredited business organization of influence in Atlantic Canada, representing more than 16,000 businesses through its network of 94 chambers of commerce and boards of trade and 27 corporate partners in four Atlantic provinces. We are pleased to see that government has taken time to reconsider Bill 4 and make changes to some of the language that was causing concern in the original bill for many landowners. We are raising some concerns today, not only with the merits of the bill, or not with the merits of the bill, I should say, but with the process of consultation. It has been widely reported through the media, by stakeholders, and by members of the Legislative Assembly that some consultations were done by invitation only, and some of the invited stakeholders were compelled to sign non-disclosure or confidentiality agreements. Consultations that are not open to the public uh, and are not transparent can be exclusionary to many stakeholders that would like to participate and can give the per uh, perception that government is, not, is being selective over the feedback that it hears, thus diminishing public trust in government. The Atlantic Chamber has requested a meeting with the minister responsible for the bill, and we are still waiting to hear us back some level of response or consultation in order to relay concerns to our of our membership. 
we would like to see further details about the consultation process, guidelines, expectations, and implementation of feedback that will be used, or at a minimum, a link to government's consultation, uh, formal consultation uh, process policy. It's quite all too often, uh, Mr. Chair, that consultation is only used as a simply a box to tick, but lacks the true open exchange and communication of expectations and outcomes for participants, thus resulting in broken trust of the process itself. We are encouraging MLAs of all political stripes to reach out to us on the matter of Bill 4 and implore the committee to ensure that meaningful consultation is done on matters such as this before rushing them to be signed into law. The hallmark of a free and open society is transparency and, de and democratic decision-making willed by the electric. And in this case, unless government can demonstrate otherwise, stakeholders were not adequately consulted to the best of our analysis. Mr. Chair, that is uh, all for my uh, commentary. If there's any questions on the merits of the bill, we recognize that there have been recent amendments made, but we've had a little bit of time to review it. But uh, uh, once again, we will need more time to do a uh, proper analysis on this, but happy to take any questions about our opinions on the, the, the consultation process or on uh, the bill itself as we see it. All right, uh, just over six and a half minutes remaining. I believe I saw Ms. smith McCrossan's hand go up. Thank you very much for your presentation. I'm just curious, you know, your your feelings, your your thoughts on the lack of consultation uh, regarding Bill Four, and and <clears throat> again, even the fact that you're scheduled to present this morning and only receive the uh, proposed amendments as the committee was starting. Um, do you think that leads to more effective uh, legislation or not? Uh, the answer would be uh, not. Thank you very much for the question. Um, like many other presenters today, I've had other meetings this morning, uh, could not necessarily have the adequate time to review every piece of this very important legislation that has been presented uh, and providing inadequate time to review the legislation and the amendments uh, undermines the uh, the very democratic process that we're, we're hoping to engage upon. Consultation is very important and, and, and that's why we're here today where we're hoping uh, to, to highlight that and that there needs to be better consultation. Thank you very much. All right. Not seeing any other. Oh, sorry, Ms. Chender. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Ellis, I just wonder if you've heard from folks about um, the Species at Risk Act. You know, both that act and the Endangered Species Act are sort of mirrors of this legislation, but we haven't heard much about them. And I'm wondering if those are acts that you've contemplated or heard from your stakeholders about. Thank you very much for the question. There are, there are not acts that we have uh, heard any direct uh, information on. And Mr. Chair, a follow-up if I may? If there's no other presenters, go ahead. Um, and do you feel like this lack of engagement that you spoke of, is that especially something you're hearing from your rural members? Would you say that that's more an issue in rural Nova Scotia, um, a sense of that lack of engagement of government? Absolutely, Ms. Chender. That is uh, primarily where the concerns are coming from, from the rural communities. Uh, they're, they're largely feeling uh, disenfranchised from the, uh, the consultation process at this time. Thank you very much. Ms. Uh, smith McCrossa. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm curious in your role with the Atlantic Chamber, you, you get to uh, witness um, four different uh, approaches to government. And I'm, I'm wondering if you could share with committee what you have seen in other the other three Atlantic provinces with regards to how they approach uh, amendments to bills and tabling legislation and what recommendations would you make to the Nova Scotia government based on what you, your experiences with other provincial governments? Sure. 
Thank you for the question. I will start with the, uh, the, the, the essence of uh, inv invitation only meetings and uh, confidentiality forms. Uh, they're, they're not adequate ways to do consultation. I, I spoke with a few of my colleagues from, uh, from across the country and uh, they were quite floored to hear that uh, confidentiality forms were being signed in these uh, public stakeholder consultations. Uh, so getting away from that, I think that that would be a good practice to start. Um, the other provinces are, are fairly good with, with consultation. Um, Newfoundland and Labrador has their Engage NL website, which gives uh, adequate time in a very, very public way to provide consultation. Uh, New Brunswick elected officials will quite often reach out and uh, will want to speak with their members uh, be before any type of legislation is tabled. Same with Prince Edward Island. Uh, they're, they're all very good in consultation and they will uh, quite often lay out their timelines well in advance. Uh, but in terms of uh, the, the, the secrecy surrounding uh, the consultation process here uh, is quite something that uh, I have not come across in my time uh, with local chambers or with the Atlantic Chamber. Ms. smith McCrossan with about a uh, minute 45 left. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you very much for sharing your experiences with other governments in comparison to the government here in Nova Scotia. Uh, I want to just ask for clarification that you're representing the Atlantic Chamber of Commerce. Uh, there's been allegations, I guess, from some people that support this bill that it's completely led by the forestry sector. Can you just share with us, do you represent uh, any particular uh, sector such as forestry? and uh, yes or no, and who do you represent? Um, directly, I, we do not represent uh, any particular sector. We represent all sectors. So tourism, hospitality, uh, your everyday small businesses, retail, uh, a wide variety, but our membership is made up of the local chambers of commerce and boards of trade, as well as uh, some corporate partners from across the, uh, across the region as well. All right, uh, seeing no further questions, I'd like to uh, thank you, Mr. Ellis, uh, for your presentation and uh, remarks on Bill Number 4, the Biodiversity Act. Next up is Ms. Karen Beasley. Ms. Beasley, are you on the line? I think, uh, Ms. Beasley, I see you're uh, in the meeting uh, without a video, but audio is muted if you're speaking. There you go. There My we apologies. go. Apologies. <laughs> no, that's okay. I just uh, wanted to let you know. Uh, so you're in law amendments. Welcome. Uh, presenting on uh, the Biodiversity Act, Bill Number Four. Uh, you'll have ten minutes of total time for presentation and questions. I'll give a one-minute warning in uh, if you are still presenting. Uh, so I'll be at the nine-minute mark. And with that, you can begin. Thank you very much. I want to say thank you for the opportunity to comment on Bill 4, and uh, I'm speaking on behalf of myself, but also on behalf of Dalhousie University School for Resource and Environmental Studies. Biodiversity is a short form for the diversity of life, the plants and animals, and the lands and waters on which they depend. In totality, it makes up the ecological system that supports life on Earth, the air, the water, the soil, the plants, animals, the pollinators, the bacteria that decompose things after they die. Life on Earth, including human life, is not possible without it. Without a healthy, biologically diverse system, there will be no economy, no education system, no health system, no mining, no forestry, no resources. A strong economy is dependent on sustainable ecosystems. Globally, 
an interdisciplinary panel of experts has determined the precipitous declines in biodiversity are threatening the biosphere, biospheric integrity of the planet. Experts have determined that we are currently at risk of collapse, that we are at or beyond the planetary boundaries, the limits of the Earth's life supporting system. Life on Earth is currently threatened. Immediate and transformative actions are needed to stem the declines. Biodiversity collapse and climate change are twin crises representing emergencies for humanity. Nova Scotia is not immune to this crisis and must be part of the solution. For example, as of 2017, 71 species were listed as endangered in Nova Scotia. Five of these are now globally extinct and three no longer exist in the province. Populations of many other species are in decline, yet not officially listed. Mature and old forests have been reduced to tiny fractions of what they used to be. Wetlands and coastal ecosystems are similarly threatened. The primary cause is human developments and activities. And now uh, the decline is accelerated by climate change and invasive species. A Biodiversity Act, Bill 4, is a crucial first step in addressing serious declines of biological diversity in Nova Scotia. It is needed to maintain and restore our ecological life support system. It is needed to conserve species and ecosystems before they reach the point of being critically endangered and thus expensive and nearly impossible to restore or recover. The Biodiversity Act was first introduced and died on the order table pending further refinement through public consultation. It has now been introduced for the second time incorporating input from landowner consultations. It had important new changes, primarily that the government would implement a collaborative approach with landowners, require consent of private landowners before including their property in a biodiversity management zone and provide compensation in exchange for landowners efforts. All of these sound eminently fair. As of March 23rd, it is our understanding that the Premier seeks to institute changes to the bill that rectify and clarify its intent. We support any necessary changes for clarification. We also consider it is important to first retain the biodiversity emergency orders, which would grant the province the right to intervene on private land in emergency situations where the act is being contravened. We think it's also important to retain the offenses and fines and to apply the act to all lands, not solely to crown lands. Changes to these components of the act would present significant weakening of it. Crown land comprises less than 30% of the province. Biodiversity cannot be retained or recovered by provisions that apply only to 30% of the land. These three elements represent provisions that are crucial to achieving the objectives of the act and thus changes should not be made to remove or restrict them to crown lands. Safeguarding biodiversity is crucial for all of humanity, for every citizen in Nova Scotia. It is for the broader public good. It is above and beyond private and corporate interests and private property rights. As with other public benefits, Sometimes the public good needs to take precedence over personal and private interests. We recognize this in provisions in many other acts where expropriations, exemptions, and limitations are imposed to protect and provide for the public good. We do this in expropriating lands for building roads. We make decisions in environmental assessments. We make decisions in allowing mining and associated explorations on private properties. We argue that there is no higher public aim than maintaining our life support system and that some limitations on private rights and interests are warranted in doing so. Accordingly, we acknowledge the importance of the Biodiversity Act and support the bill in principle. We urge, however, that changes not extend beyond clarification clarifications. Specifically, we urge that the three aforementioned crucial elements be retained and not removed. And love to thank you for the opportunities to share our thoughts. 
Thank you, Dr. Beasley. I'll now uh, open it up to questions with four minutes remaining. Ms. Roberts. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Beasley, there's been so much talk about uh, what uh, um, biodiversity emergency orders could mean, um, some of which, you know, some people have questioned as, you know, whether they're grounded in, in reality. But could, could you help us by giving us a, an actual instance when, where you um, would see a biodiversity emergency order as being a, a useful and necessary tool for the government to have available? Yeah, so lots of examples come to mind. Um, for me, a lot of them at top of my mind are related to endangered species. Um, just because there's been a lot of focus on them lately. But even if it's not an endangered species, well, the idea would be that we should be protecting things before they become endangered. But for example, if there's a particular area of land that needs to be, um, that is critically important to an endangered species, uh, whether it be its core habitat or to enable one species one individual of a species to connect with other individuals of a species or to connect between its summer habitat and its winter habitat. Um, if there's a particular piece of land that's crucial to that, it could be possible that um, some restrictions on some kinds of land uses would be um, necessary. So for example, maybe certain sizes of trees need to be retained, maybe certain um, water course needs to be maintained uh, and not blocked, those kinds of measures. So if someone was proposing to make that kind of a change on land where, um, uh, you know, where they would not be willing to be compensated for it and are going ahead and doing it anyway, then I would think that there would be a need for an emergency measure there. I think that it needn't get to the emergency measures in most cases because it's meant to be applied in a collaborative way and compensations are proposed. So it would only be in those highly extenuating circumstances where people don't want to collaborate, don't want to be compensated and want to go ahead and do what they want to do regardless of those other provisions. Ms. Smith-McCrossan with about a minute and a half remaining. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Ms. Beasley, for your presentation today and you. for your care of our, our Mother Earth. Uh, I'm just curious your opinion on, do you think that our provincial government has done a good job as stewards of the land that they have been up to this point, of the Crown land? Do you think that they have done... Um, a, a good stellar job up to this point? Um, no, I do not. Um, I think that they have done what they believe to be right in many cases, but oftentimes it's been more motivated by money and um, without sufficient balance for consideration of the ecological parameters. Ms. Smith-McCrossan uh, with follow-up in 30 seconds. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and Ms. Beasley, thank you for, for clarifying that. And having said, you know, listening to what you just shared, um, I'm just curious about your support for the bill for the government to have even more control over private land, given the fact that um, you don't think that they have necessarily done a good job as being stewards of the Crown land. Can you comment to that? I think that a lot of the reason they can't do a good job is because they don't have a necessary legislation to back it up. So this is one of the reasons we need this act so that we have it to counterbalance some of the other acts that are out there, like the Mining Act, for example. All right, thank you, Dr. Beasley, uh, for your presentation you. and response to questions. Time has elapsed. Uh, time for our next uh, presenter, uh, Elizabeth Glenn Copeland. Ms. Copeland, are you on with us? Yes, hello. Perfect. Um, thank you. Uh, welcome to the Law Amendments Committee. Um, I'm going to speak to Bill Number 4, Biodiversity Act. 
you'll have a total of 10 minutes uh, for presentation and questions. I'll give you a one minute warning at the nine minute mark if you are still presenting. All right, and great. You can I wanted to introduce you to my husband, um, Beverly Glenn Copeland, who's here with me today as well. And uh, he has to go now, he has another meeting, but um, I am speaking on both of our behalves. All right, so. I'm an author, a theater artist, and an arts educator whose career over the past many decades has evolved at the intersection of arts and activism. And I have always taken very seriously the responsibility to exercise my democratic rights. So thank you all for, for hearing me out. In late 2020, we chose to relocate to Nova Scotia. I had spent the better part of a year here as a residence at the Joggins Fossil Institute to research and write my book. We fell in love with the land and the people which led us to moving here late last year. Knowing as many of us do that the climate crisis is not something abstract, but an immediate danger advancing at an alarming pace I was comforted when I learned about the first pass of the biodiversity bill. Its goal to provide the stewardship, conservation, sustainable use and governance of biodiversity in the province is such a noble vision. It is also a deeply necessary vision. And then came the changes much due to the fear-mongering tactics from the forestry industry, along with a group of private landowners. I have been following the threads of conversation from private landowners that go something like this. I don't want some act to tell me I can't cut a road into my property because of some species at risk. Though I would like to take the time to argue the basic truth espoused by our First Nations brothers and sisters, that we do not own the land, I will instead focus on this. Laws are rules that bind people living in communities. They are meant to protect our safety and ensure our rights as citizens. In the case, therefore, of the private landowners who oppose this bill, one might say their objections to this act have merit where the exercise of democratic rights are concerned but they do not. Consider this, when a person shows up with a full-blown COVID-19 infection, his rights do not extend as far as to allow him to continue to engage out in society willy-nilly as he pleases. To do so would infect tens to hundreds to thousands of other people. Thus, his small right to have his way is eclipsed by the rights of the many. Similarly, in these times of discontinuous change, having passed multiple climate tipping points over the past many decades due to society's denial of what is really going on, policymakers such as yourselves must be willing to exercise your substantial power for the public good. 30 years ago, we had the time to, as the new amendments to this act state, work with private landowners in a voluntary fashion with a view to building trust in the new act. We no longer have this time. I understand that upwards of 70% of Nova Scotia lands is privately owned. Therefore, it follows that for our government to weaken this act, such as is the case with the new amendments, it means the act will have no teeth. So let's look at other provinces who have set precedents in this area. Quebec, for instance, has very specific rules for what private landowners can and cannot do around waterways. In our last visit to La Belle Province, we were stunned to find lush, living, mixed forests. Are there a handful of private landowners in Quebec who wish they could scalp the land on their waterfront properties? I'm sure there are. But the laws of the land prevail for the health and well being of all Quebecers, including the living ecosystems. 
PEI has specific rules relating to dunes. I know the story of a family who moved to the province and deciding the dune blocked their ocean view, took down this sensitive ecosystem. They were promptly fined and had to pay for the cost to have the dune rebuilt and repaired. Lastly, consider the clear connection between the sharp loss of biodiversity and the pandemic. Another scientific prediction made decades ago that was tacitly ignored. Do we really want to take action that will invite further zoonotic pandemics? Such will be the case if the Biodiversity Act passes with these weakened amendments. When humanity exterminates biodiverse habitats, we are essentially, as Professor Paul Ehrlich of Stanford University says, sawing off the limb on which we are sitting, destroying our own life support system. My husband and I implore you to do your job as policymakers and exercise the power given to you as public servants with pride, knowing you are acting in the best interests, not only of all Nova Scotians, but of the living world. This act is the first of its kind in Canada. Let's make Nova Scotia a leader in a time when such leadership is critical. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Copeland. Um, now open to questions with three and a half minutes. I'm not seeing any, oh, Ms. Roberts. Welcome to Nova Scotia. Uh, Thank you. You mentioned that you're uh, you're recently relocated here. I'm wondering if you can uh, share if you uh, have bought land, if you're where you're living, uh, and and what your relationship would be with where you're living. Yes, um, we bought uh, property in Spencer's Island, Nova Scotia, and um, have been made very welcome by this community and. Um, looking forward to being, to being part of it. And this is one of my first steps. Yes. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right. I'm not seeing any other questions. Ms. Copeland, uh, thank you for your presentation, uh, taking the time to uh, share your information and perspective on Bill 4, the Biodiversity Act. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Next up is Ms. Lindsay Lee. Ms. Lee, are you with us? Hello. Hi, welcome to Law Amendments. Uh, just uh, you. quickly, you'll have 10 minutes uh, to present uh, and uh, have questions asked and answered. Uh, I will give a one minute warning at the nine minute mark if you are still presenting in case you want to let uh, some questions come forward. And with that, you can begin. Thank you. Good afternoon and thank you for this opportunity to provide feedback on the biodiversity bill. I'm speaking as an individual, but I'm also a board member of the Eastern Shore Forest Watch Association. That is a volunteer position. And I'm a fifth generation woodlot owner. So my perspective is influenced by all of those different roles. I'm turning 30 next month. And even within my lifetime, I've noticed a distressing decline in birds, other wildlife, um, insect and plant species. To an extent, I think we've become desensitized to this law, so I'd like to share some examples that stand out in my life. Um, I remember how magical it was to watch fireflies for the first time. Um, sadly, I haven't seen any in, in years. I also used to love falling asleep to the chorus of frogs and crickets outside my window, but nowadays I fall asleep to a recording of frogs through an app on my smartphone. I remember what a pain it was on family road trips to have to stop and keep cleaning the windshield with all the dead bugs. But that's a chore I would gladly do today if it meant that our ecosystems were starting to recover. 
the truth is biodiversity is in peril. Nature is declining at rates unprecedented in human history, and that makes it very hard for us to comprehend. But we're already experiencing serious repercussions of our broken relationship with nature. The COVID-19 pandemic is a startling example of, of that um, broken relationship. Not only is the sixth mass extinction ongoing, but the rate of species extinction is actually accelerating, which tells us that our current efforts are not adequate to the challenge. The current rate of species extinction is estimated at 100 to 1,000 times higher than natural background rates. We've lost 60% of wildlife in less than 50 years, and around 1 million animal and plant species are now threatened with extinction, many within decades, within my lifetime, more than ever before in human history. It's okay if you don't remember all of these statistics, but I hope that you will remember this. Biodiversity loss is a global crisis that is enacted locally. We are enabling this crisis. Experts say it's not too late to make a difference, but only if we start now at every level from local to global. We are living through a mass extinction event, but our province is largely acting as if it's business as usual. Passing the Biodiversity Act would show strong environmental leadership. Our current conservation efforts are failing to adequately protect threatened species and their habitats. Biodiversity loss isn't restricted to species that are legally defined as endangered either, even once common species have suffered staggering declines. So we need to start treating the biodiversity crisis like the crisis it is. We need to start by passing a strong biodiversity act in order to preserve biodiversity on public and private land to conserve both terrestrial and aquatic habitats. I'm very disappointed that the government has significantly weakened its own legislation. The revised act, which was distributed a few hours ago, eliminated 10 pages straight out of a 20-page document. We need a biodiversity act with clear enforcement mechanisms. It's imperative that the biodiversity emergency orders are reintroduced in order to deal with acute threats, such as invasive species, when they occur on private land. After all, crown land only makes up approximately 30% of our province, and that 30% is fragmented across the province. Scientific projections, including a study by Dr. Karen Beasley, who spoke earlier today, show that we need to manage approximately 60 to 65% of the province's land mass for biodiversity conservation objectives. That is significantly more than the 30% that would now be included in the bill. From the air we breathe to the water we drink, biodiversity is critical to human survival. The more biodiverse a province and our planet are, the more resilient they will be to weather disturbances, disease, and climate change. We have a responsibility to do better for this generation and the generations that follow. I know that personally, I want my niece and my nephew to have the opportunity to be enchanted by fireflies, lulled to street sleep by real frogs croaking and annoyed by bugs on the windshield. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Ms. Lee. And I believe Ms. Roberts uh, has a question. Ms. Roberts. Thank you. And thank you so much for, uh, for speaking to this issue and joining us today. I wonder if you could speak a, a little bit more to that local action um, that you mm -hmm. see as required? And, and what would it look like to have Bill 4 as introduced in the legislature available and developed with regulations? Uh, how might that be a tool that is necessary to, uh, to have an impact in your local area? Um, yeah, thank you. Well, I think it's important that we stop looking at biodiversity as a singular issue. Biodiversity is the basis of everything, and we really need to use a broader approach than we have been. So we need to consider things like the forestry industry, which has been mentioned, but we also need to consider things like invasive plant species. We need to encourage Nova Scotians to plant 
local varieties of trees and plants. We need to make sure that Sorry, everybody. The Sorry. Uh, obviously a little look there. I apologize for that. There's just some technical difficulties. Uh, the whole system froze. Ms. Lee, uh, you're back on and uh, still have uh, just over just about three minutes. Okay. I apologize if I repeat anything that I've just said. Um, I was explaining that I grew up near the Ingram River wilderness area, which is a proposed wilderness area, but it's not yet protected by law. And it's a, a real biodiversity hotspot. There are 12 species at risk, including the mainland moose that have been recorded there. There are 22 additional species of conservation concern that have been documented within the boundaries. This would lead you to think that we should be enthusiastically protecting a property such as this. But instead, parts of it are on the chopping block. There are currently a half dozen proposed forest harvests within the boundaries of the proposed wilderness area. Um, in the area immediately surrounding those proposed cuts, 14 species of conservation concern and five provincially listed species at risk have been documented. That should have been enough to save this area from industrial forestry. But our current laws are not adequately protecting habitats such as this. Um, they are not adequately allowing communities to advocate for the protection of local areas that are high in biodiversity. Um, and that is something I'd like to see the government and communities collaborate on to make sure that areas such as this are protected. Ms. Roberts with one minute remaining. Um. You know, we do have an Endangered Species Act uh, that is yeah. that is available, um, though there's, you know, from the Auditor General to the Supreme Court of Nova Scotia, there have been concerns that that act hasn't been used robustly. Um, we've heard concerns that the Biodiversity Act has in the, the proposed enforcement mechanisms were, were onerous. Um, I guess, how can you would you comment on that given the enforcement mechanisms that exist in the Endangered Species Act and, and how we've actually seen those used? Well, personally, I disagree with the narrative that the Biodiversity Act would allow government overreach. I disagree with the narrative that the fines are inconsistent with other legislation. That's not true, and it's quite easy to verify that if you look at acts like the Endangered Species Act, the Federal Species at Risk Act, or our uh, Provincial and Federal Fisheries Acts, and more. In fact, the Biodiversity Act, as it was proposed, was more limited in its scope than some of the legislation we already have, like the Mining Act, which actually allows expropriation of private land. The Biodiversity Act, on the other hand, is more of a collaborative approach that has a fail-safe mechanism for very acute threats. Um, for instance, if there is an issue of um, endangered species or invasive species on private land and the government mean, needs to step in, I think that is a necessary uh, precaution to include. All right. Thank you, Ms. Lee. Uh, time has expired. Thank Appreciate you. you joining us today. Uh, for my colleagues uh, on the committee, uh, it has uh, reached the one hour mark. Uh, so we're entering a 15 minute recess. When we return, uh, just for your information, MLA uh, Gordon Wilson, uh, vice chair of the committee, will be taking over the chair's seat after uh, this break. Uh, so 15 minutes brings us back at 1240. Uh, till 50 p.m.
Mr. Burrell, we haven't had you on yet, so. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. I'll be chairing this next session with you, Gordon Wilson, the MLA for Claire Digby. So we're uh, taking presentations on Bill 4, the Biodiversity Act, and uh, I believe we have uh, Lisa Mitchell uh, is our next presenter. So if Ledge TV can bring Ms. Mitchell on. I see Ms. Mitchell is uh, in the room, but no audio or video yet. There we go. Welcome, Ms. Thank Mitchell. You. Thank you. So we'll, we'll be having uh, presentations on the Biodiversity Act here. So we have 10 minutes for your presentation. Usually it's nice if we could do five and five, but I will give you a, uh, a warning at the nine minute mark that there will be one minute left in your 10 minutes. So the floor is yours. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, yes, I'm Lisa Mitchell and I'm the Executive Director and Senior Lawyer at East Coast Environmental Law. East Coast Environmental Law is a public interest environmental law charity that advocates for the fair application of innovative and effective environmental laws in Atlantic Canada through education, collaboration, and legal action. Although our office is located in the Schulich School of Law, our three lawyers work in locations across the province. One is based in Halifax, one in Marguerite, Cape Breton, and I'm in Grand Prix. I'm a practicing member of the Nova Scotia Barrister Society. I have a Master's of Environmental Studies from Dalhousie School for Resource and Environmental Studies. And I've been practicing exclusively environmental law for more than 25 years, including drafting legislation for federal and provincial governments. Relevant to our topic today, I chaired the Nova Scotia Roundtable on Environment and Economy in 1994 and I was a member of the three-person public consultation panel for the creation of the Nova Scotia Environment Act, which became law in 1995. I also chaired the Legislative Review Advisory Committee that was charged with the mandatory public review of the Environment Act in 2000. Regarding the proposed Biodiversity Act, I, along with my colleague, Karen McKendry from the Ecology Action Center, have invested significant time and expertise over the past four years to provide government and the public with research and recommendations to assist in creating a law that could provide a meaningful contribution to address the biodiversity crisis. Karen provided an excellent history of our work in this area during her earlier presentation, and she highlighted our concerns around 
the public engagement process. Our recommendations, which were drawn from biodiversity law and policy initiatives in other jurisdictions, focused primarily on ensuring that the law had a clear purpose and principles, that there were opportunities and requirements for the minister to gather information about the state of biodiversity in the province, to share that information with the public, and through a public process, set goals and targets that would help to set Nova Scotia on a path towards stopping biodiversity decline. I would like to acknowledge that the version of the bill that I reviewed quickly this morning includes a purpose section, a requirement that all new and substantially amended regulations be subject to public consultation, a requirement that the Biodiversity Act undergo a mandatory public review in five years, and that a state of biodiversity report be made available to the public in not more than three years. Uh, we would prefer to see that the setting of goals and targets be a requirement rather than at the discretion of the minister, but acknowledge that the bill will require public consultation on the goals and targets before they are set. And we support all of these important public aspects of the bill and we ask that they not be amended or removed. Nova Scotia may be the first Canadian province to create a biodiversity law, but the development of biodiversity law and policy is far from new. In fact, Canadian Prime Minister Brian Mulroney was the first leader of any country to sign and ratify the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity almost 30 years ago. Just six years after Prime Minister Mulroney signed the convention, Nova Scotia passed the Endangered Species Act. I provided a table to you in your materials that compares the proposed Biodiversity Act as it was introduced to the Endangered Species Act, the Environment Act, and the Wilderness Areas Protection Act. Despite the fact that the most current version of the bill removes even the potential for any offenses under the act and all fines, I would like to take a moment to simply point out that the Endangered Species, Endangered Species Act which has been law for more than 25 years, includes prohibitions to protect species and habitat similar in structure to the prohibitions that were contemplated by the Biodiversity Act. And despite the fact that the Endangered Species Act was written more than 20 years ago, the fines for individuals and corporations are exactly the same as the fines that were included in the Biodiversity Act when it was introduced. The Endangered Species Act applies to protect all species that are listed in the regulations, regardless of where they are located, whether it be crown land or private land. In addition, that act gives the minister the authority to designate core habitat, defined basically as habitat that is necessary for the survival of the species. And this habitat can be on private land without the consent of the landowner. These provisions have been in place since 1998. So it is simply not true to say that the proposed Biodiversity Act, as it was introduced, provided unprecedented, unprecedented powers of overreach to government. Rather than being concerned that government will overexercise their authority, the 25-year history of the Endangered Species Act has demonstrated government's failure to implement even the most basic elements of the law to protect species. And this was confirmed by Justice Brothers in the Supreme Court of Nova Scotia decision she released earlier in 2020. The Endangered Species Act, the Environment Act, and the proposed, proposed Biodiversity Act are public welfare laws. These laws play a very valuable role in our society because they address issues that are broad public concern. Over the past year, we've become very familiar with another public welfare law, the Nova Scotia Health Protection Act. This is the law that has provided our Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Robert Strang, the authority to issue orders to protect public health as we collectively navigate the pandemic. Last week, the Supreme Court of Canada released their decision on the Federal Greenhouse Gas Pollution Pricing Act. In the decision, the court found that the law was of national concern because it is critical to our response to a, and I quote, 
existential threat to human life in Canada and around the world, end quote. The COVID-19 pandemic, climate change and biodiversity decline are crises that can only be effectively addressed if we allow our government to exercise appropriate authority in the public interest and we trust in the rule of law. The way forward is principled approach based on science, public engagement, transparency, accountability, and integrity. A deliberate fear-based campaign of exaggeration and misleading information that is intended to divide people and pit one group against another is not the way forward. I would echo Karen McKendry's comments from earlier today around the urgent need for biodiversity education. And I think that the events that have taken place around the proposed Biodiversity Act demonstrate that clearly. I took a look at the 1998 Hansard for the debate during the introduction and passage of the Endangered Species Act. This bill was passed unanimously during the liberal minority government of Premier Russell McClellan. Interestingly, on the same day, the Wilderness Areas Protection Act was also passed. And I'd like to close with a quote from a progressive conservative MLA, James DeWolf, representing Picto East and speaking to the Endangered Species Bill. Quote, Mr. Speaker, I am delighted to stand in support of this piece of important legislation. It certainly was democracy at its best. The cooperation of the three parties that helped to get this thing through. And I certainly want to thank all involved for their hard work and diligence and for making our world a better place to live. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Mitchell. We have one minute left for some quick questions. If anybody has one, Ms. Chender. Sorry, Ms. McCrossin. Thank you so much for that presentation and for that important historical context. In the face of the changes brought in this morning, you know, I was interested to see that you were sort of made that distinction that it's more a failure to enforce what we already have than a failure to bring in. Are, do you feel um, concerned about this, the government's commitment to its its environmental agenda to dealing with the climate crisis, to biodiversity, to the international, um, you know, statutes to which we are signatories and a part. Uh, I've, immediately, I feel very concerned about the process that happened here around this bill. I don't have a significant amount of concern about the fact that the prohibitions are not going to be in the bill. I think they're valuable. But I think speaking to your point, I would like to see the government using the tools that they have already at their disposal effectively, and then grow with the Biodiversity Act and try to move forward. Thank you, Ms. Mitchell. Well spoken. Sorry, Ms. smith McCross, and I'll jump to you quicker next time. So thank you for your presentation. We'll go on to our next presenter is Eleanor Curie. Welcome, Ms. Curie. I, see, I hope I'm pronouncing that last name properly. Uh, yeah, so we'll have 10 minutes for uh, your total. It's usually we'd like to get five and five, so questions can be asked, but I will give you a warning at the nine minute mark, uh, if that's okay. So the floor is yours. Thanks very much. Uh, hi there, my name is Eleanor and I'm speaking on behalf of uh, Extinction Rebellion Nova Scotia today. Uh, thank you for having me. The UN Con uh, Convention on Biodiversity recognized the global decline of biodiversity as one of the most serious environmental issues facing humanity. Most nations use it as the template for setting law and policy. Canada ratified it in 1993. Canada developed a biodiversity strategy in 1995 with three broad goals. The conservation of biodiversity, the sustainable use of biological resources, 
the fair and equitable sharing of the benefits resulting from the use of genetic resources. They defined sustainable development as development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. In the 25 years since their initial report, we have made progress. However, as with our initiatives to address the climate crisis and goals and targets around GHG emissions, we are failing to act quickly enough to avert both serious and irreversible damage. The economic costs for inaction will be huge. As one example, the decline in bee populations threatens 15 to $30 billion in annual agricultural prod productivity. We have in our own region seen the effect of unsustainable fishing practices and are only just recovering from some of the damage. We are facing not only a climate crisis, but a biodiversity crisis and the two are linked. Forest clear cutting leads to biodiversity loss, which is compounded when we replace those diverse forests with softwood monoculture. The soil deterioration caused by our unsustainable forestry releases huge amounts of carbon and affects the future ability of forests to sequester carbon. This makes it difficult for us to meet our internationally agreed upon carbon reduction targets. Poll data indicates that over 70% of Canadians support taking action on the climate crisis. Over 50% agree that protected areas on land and sea are necessary. Species extinction rates are 100 to 10,000 times the evolutionary background rate causing scientists to refer to it as biological annihilation. I often find that it's important to say that word again, biological annihilation is what we're going through right now. In 2019, the federal government recognized the public mood and increasing awareness about these issues and declared a climate emergency. Over 500 Canadian municipal councils have done the same, including seven in Nova Scotia, representing over half of our provincial population. The public has awoken to the seriousness of these issues and is increasingly supporting, supportive and demanding action. This government's Biodiversity Act is an important piece of legislation, but, continue, but, it, but constitutes meaningless words without action. We cannot repeat the delays we have witnessed in implementation of the key rep recommendations of the Leahy Report. The public grows impatient watching those they elect compromise or fail to implement legislation required to address a crisis. Do we not know what the word crisis or emergency means and what it calls on us to do? The government has made amendments to a bill in response to a misleading ad campaign backed by the forestry industry that purports to represent over 40,000 landowners with more than five acres of land. In a seating, they placed property rights over the well beings of citizens, nature, and the planet. I should not need to remind elected members that they serve the people and that private property rights must be subordinate to the needs of a nation in a time of crisis. Previous generations understood this and acted accord accordingly during the crisis of World War. Humanity is a great at dealing with immediate and imminent threats such as war. Future threats that unfold slowly across time are difficult for us to take seriously, even when we have, when they have the potential for destruction at a scale we have never before experienced. This important bill requires members to assume leadership because they recognize the threat that failure to protect biodiversity poses, because they care about our people and our planet, and because they care about their, gen their children and future generations. If you recognize this threat, then there is not much room for compromise or appeasing important factions or the electorate. For a number of decades, corporations have succeeded in obtaining amazing power in increased property rights to the point that they now have unparalleled ability to influence government policy, an ability only dreamed of by citizens and citizens groups. This week, industrial forestry interests managed to create a buffer of private landowners between themselves and government ability to protect biodiversity and any designs those forest companies have on resource extraction from private lands. We all worry about government intrusion into our lives, yet we also recognize that to be a part of civil society, we accept some government say and constraint. This is balanced by certain protections and rights. 
And in society, we in turn have obligations and responsibilities to each other. And government has obligations and responsibilities to act in the best interests of the majority of its citizens. Government and our elected, re elected representatives fail in that task when they amend a bill so as to limit its ability to protect biodiversity, to favor the few over the many, and to favor those with economic resources and property over those without. When they make decisions along party lines and decisions that favor our needs over that of future generations. This bill requires inter-party cooperation similar to what you demonstrated during COVID. There, you place the health of citizens above party politics and above economic interests, unlike so many other Canadian jurisdictions. As a result, Nova Scotia achieved North America's lowest COVID rates, protected citizens, and gained our gratitude. The recent Supreme Court ruling in favor of the federal government against the challenge by three provinces over the carbon tax is instructive. That tax, or that fine, asserts the right of government to act in the national interest and supersedes provincial jurisdiction. It is also saying that government can address the damage corporations pose to the environment through government intervention. The court ruled that this matter is critical to our response to an existential threat. It's important to remember that the loss of biodiversity is an existential threat. Governments need to treat it as such and act decisively in the interest of all citizens, future generations, and the planet. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Curie. Uh, questions? Ms. Chender. Thank you for your presentation, Ms. Curie. Uh, I wonder, as you look at this bill, uh, does it cause you concern for the rest of the environmental agenda that we've heard about, such as implementation of the Leahy Report, protected areas, other commitments? What are your th thoughts about, about those other elements that we've heard are, are coming? Thank you for asking. Uh, my biggest concern really would be the fact that this government has proven time after time to spend a lot of time and energy creating reports, writing acts and bills, and then not making them happen fast enough. Uh, I attended the law amendments hearing for the Sustainable Development Goals Act. I think that was almost two years ago now, or at least a year and a half ago. And there were so many people there that said, this is not strong enough, we need it stronger. And they didn't listen to us at all. And they passed it anyway. And then they said, don't worry, there'll be lots of time to, to fix it. And nothing's been done about that. And I think it's been a year and a half now. So we, and same with the Leahy report, was uh, there was, I know a lot of the people that were asked to speak up in order to help create that report, you know, people that Dr. Leahy uh, spoke to in order to create the report, and that people were excited and waiting for it, and oh my goodness, good, something good is finally going to happen. And then in August 2018, it was accepted by government, but yet it's still not being implemented. So unfortunately, we don't trust it anymore. So that's the fear. Ms. smith McCrossin. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you uh, to our presenter. I just have a very simple question, and that is, especially listening to your last comment, do you trust government? And do you think that it would be beneficial to Nova Scotians to give government even more control over land in this province? I, I trust that they are humans with a soul. <laughs> I trust that they have children. I trust that they have families and people that they care about. So yeah, I have to trust them to a degree. Uh, they have managed to do a good thing during COVID. Um, uh, we have public schools that children get to go to and learn, you know, this is a wonderful place to live. We're safe. We have rights. Uh, I don't feel we are having our rights trampled on a regular basis. Uh, the issue is, is that when it comes to the environment and acting quickly enough in the face of biodiversity and climate crisis, there is where our government is not um, acting fast enough. And unfortunately, I believe the reason for that is I feel like their hands are tied by corporations. Thank you, Ms. Curie. 
Uh, appreciate your comments. So we'll go to our next presenter, which will be Tim Morash with the Nova Scotia Federation of Agriculture. I will apologize to my colleagues if I have to sometimes be short, but obviously, as you can see with our scheduling, it's a challenge to keep our um, our schedule in, in all respect and fairness to the presenters uh, with the little gaps that we have in getting people on as we are having right now. Uh, do we know if uh, Mr. Morash is in the waiting room? Gordon, no, he's not. You might want to go to um, Marcus Wicker. The next one is here, though. If he is ready, yes, that would be perfect. Thank you, Ms. Kinley. There, I see Mr. Zwicker has joined us. Welcome. Uh, we have 10 minutes for total for presentation. We try to do five and five to allow time for questions, but I will give a warning at the nine minute mark and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank. You're allowed, your, your video is good, your audio. Oh, just one sec, guys. Sorry, I had to turn off the YouTube channel. I was tuned in and they're watching, so I was getting some feedback. I apologize. Right, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much, everybody. I think I uh, saw my introduction there from uh, Mr. Gordon. Um, um, my name is Marcus Swicker. I'm a third generation private woodlot owner in the province of Nova Scotia. Our, my family woodlot's been in our family for over 75 years. Um, I'm a fourth generation forest worker. Um, basically the forest provides for everything that we have in our family, whether it's our Christmas tree lot, the forest products or the, or the work in the woods that, uh, that we have, whether it's fishing, recreation, and so on. Um, that, that me, our wood lot to me and my family is everything. Um, the, my biggest concern with the, the bill is that it's being painted as a forest management issue. And I think it's far from that here in Nova Scotia. Um, we do lots of things in our land on private land in Nova Scotia um, that both people who own it and people who don't own it fully enjoy. And I hate to see this bill put through that would come across as direct that threat to that. Um, personally, I believe the landowners in this province contribute positively to biodiversity and we don't need an act or a premier or a government or a council to uh, with broad powers to tell us such. Um, I have referenced earlier, there was a, a person who spoke earlier about a public welfare laws and um, about how broad consultation, if truly, if this is an act that's uh, directly built to um, promote public welfare, why are so many find people finding out about it here at the last minute? Why do we have to have a lineup of 80 people or however many today, I'm um, speaking to everybody on the call or on the video conference to express their concern with the act. Why weren't they included in building it from the ground up? Um, the act raises many questions, many of which I have to answer to people I work with every day, people, fellow landowners and people in my community. They say, where does our current legislation fall short? Is are most of these concerns already addressed in the Invasive Species Act or the Species at Risk Act? Why do we need this act to deal with invasive species or climate change? Why is it punitive, not collaborative? Why do we need to hammer landowners and man land managers with huge fines and laws to preserve biodiversity? What are we missing today that we're not doing? No one's told us that. What are the regulations and their intent? I've been part of uh, closed door consultations, ones where I've had to sign confidentiality agreements, ones that uh, were held in this part of the province for by invite only, and two years of asking, can they give us examples of what the intent is? What are we trying to protect? Um, what do regulations look like? Two years, no answers. Um, with a bill this broad, why was there such limited consultations? Closed door meetings, again, it also paints the pictures that us as private landowners were directly responsible for the for bio, assumed biodiversity loss in this province. Where's the science? Do we really need to regulate and fine us in order to get us to, com to comply with broad objectives? In summary, um, 
I speak as a private landowner here. I see the act as overreaching, heavy handed and direct threat to, threat to the people like myself who make their living and have for generations to work and live in rural Nova Scotia. I want and need a healthy ecosystem for my family. We need to protect biodiversity. So do thousands of other Nova Scotians need this the same result. If we truly have threats to sensitive ecosystems and biodiversity, let's be open, let's be specific and work collaboratively, collaboratively towards addressing them. As legislators, um, what do we need from you in a biodiversity act? We need to be completely voluntary on private land. We need to see a bill that applies to Crown land only. And if the Crown is true to its intent, um, Allow the government to be openly openly demonstrate how they intend the bill to be applied on public land. Let's build some trust here. Show us what some what what we intend to do. Show us how it's going to impact us. Show us how what you're going to do on your own land, um, and then we can follow. We need like reg regulation that's built from the ground up that includes private landowners and include land managers that are self to self selected, not handpicked by governments or bureaucrats. A regulatory process that is open and transparent and is built, again, by private landowners and land managers and not just consulted on after the work has already been done by two or three years by a select, a select legal firm or select organization. We, need, we don't want to just check a box to say they were consulted at the end of it here. And but beyond all, we need an act that's based on science and not broad overreaching statements that can't be specific, specific in Nova Scotia. I firmly believe we can get this right for Nova Scotians, but it does it have to be that adversarial? Does it really? If you want to be good legislators, let's pass a good act, not just be the first ones to do so. I highly recommend that the act should expressly state that the regulatory authority granted to the governor and council to pass regulation applies only to Crown land and not to private landowners or land, land managers. And let's get to work collaboratively improving an act and improving doing things in the forest and on the land and in our farms that improve biodiversity across Nova Scotia. We don't need an act to do that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Swicker. We have about four and a half minutes for questions. Uh, Ms. Chender. Thanks, Mr. Zwicker. And I, I hear your concern uh, about the lack of clarity and the lack of consultation. And that's certainly been a theme today. Um, I guess what I wanted to, the other theme though that we've been hearing is that all of the powers that, uh, that at least the kind of public campaign was objecting to and that I hear you expressing concern about exist in legislation that's been on the books for decades. So it, it, exi it exists in the Species at Risk Act, it exists in the Endangered Species Act. And I'm just wondering, have you been impacted by those acts? Have you been fined? Um, and also, the last time I saw you appear before a committee, you were representing West 4. So if you're still representing West 4 or connected to them, if you could let me know. And so either in that capacity or in your private capacity, if you could just speak to whether those pieces of legislation have impacted you. Uh, so today, um, I, I will be employed by, I am employed by West 4. I'm not speaking on behalf of that today. I speak as a, as a private landowner. Um, West 4 is an organization that operates on Crown land. And I think I've made my statement clear that I'm sure the organization um, would look forward to uh, um, look forward to working with government to uh, um, see biodiversity strengthened and demonstrating how, um, as an organization, um, they can demonstrate for private woodlot owners um, how this act will go forward. But here today, I am a private land. I do represent a private landowner as a private landowner, being my brothers and my family. Um, and no, not directly today. Um, we have not been impacted by the, the uh, Species at Risk Act. To answer your question bluntly, Claudia. Ms. smith McCrossan. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Zwicker, for your presentation today. Can you share with us here in Law Amendments Committee, what are some of the actions that you, as a steward of the land, would already be taking to protect biodiversity? Uh, well, for one, um, we practice sustainable forest practices. Um, our, our woodlot has been harvested using different means, a whole host of different treatments um, over the past uh, 75 plus years. Um, that would be one. Two, uh, as you know, part of it uh, is it would be agriculture, Christmas tree lots, and there's all kinds of uh, current rules and regulations that we uh, implement on our, both our Christmas tree lot and our woodlot that uh, protect biodiversity. Um, I don't know if we lost your feet or if he finished the question. Mr. Burrell. 
Uh, did you did Mr. Stricker have an opportunity to finish his answer? Yes, I did. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to uh, uh, ask about the point you were making about uh, the inadequacy, uh, the the thinness, as you explained it, uh, about the consultation uh, that has gone on over this long period while this act has been. Uh, in front of us uh, in the province. Uh, can you say a little more about that, where you feel that the consultation has fallen short? Uh, yes, I can, Mr. Rural. Um, predominantly, number one, if we want to have an act or want to have action or landowners take action, um, as Nova Scotians, I think we have to be involved from the ground up in developing the legislation, uh, not a process where we show up at a town hall meeting and say, here it is, what are your thoughts? And then we see it again at the floor of the legislature. That's the that's the that's the process this has been through. If you want buy-in, in my opinion, if you want buy-in and you want a positive outcome, um, you have to involve the people that are doing the work or doing the land management or whatever that change might be, leading that change. They have to be involved be involved in it from the ground up. So they have trust in the process and trust in the outcome, they're gonna see benefits from it. Thank you. Thank you. We have 28 seconds. Seeing no others, thank you very much for your presentation. And Great we'll day, guys. Now, yes. Thank you. We'll now go on to Scott Kamal. Mr. Chair? Yes. I don't see Scott Kamal in the waiting room, but uh, Maxine McLean is um, uh, for the Nova Scotia Federation of Agriculture that we skipped over. It was a, a name change for them. Uh, if that's suitable with the rest of the committee, yes. Seeing no objections, go ahead. And then we'll probably go into a break. No, I'm sorry, we'll have time for the next one. I see Ms. McLean there, but uh, she isn't popping up yet. Oh, here she is. There. there. Thank All you. Right. Your audio and video is good. Awesome. Uh, welcome. We'll have uh, 10 minutes for your presentation. We try to do five and five for questions, but I'll give you a, nine, a, a warning at the nine minute mark if there's one minute left. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to speak to Bill Ford and the Biodiversity Act today. I'm Maxine McLean. I'm the policy analyst with the Nova Scotia Federation of Agriculture, or NSFA. And um, I'll share a bit with you today about what we've heard from our members regarding this bill um, and, and um, some of the concerns with that. So just to note, before we get started, um, biodiversity is important to farms in Nova Scotia. Um, just to provide a bit of background and context, since 2015, um, the NSFA has worked with funding from the Species at Risk Partnership on Agricultural Lands, or SARPAL. Um, so this uh, program is funded through Environment and Climate Change Canada. So with this funding, uh, we developed uh, resources to educate farmers and owners of agricultural land of species at risk that may be present. So based on their landforms or, or sightings in, in that area. Um, we also provided financial incentives for qualifying firms to adjust farm management practices to protect wood turtles. So that's a bit of the work that we've done so far. Um, we also deliver uh, the on-farm component of the environmental farm plan program here in Nova Scotia. So where risks are assessed and recommendations are made to farms to manage those risks. Uh, species at risk and biodiversity are growing parts of that program. And uh, we're actually working on a tool that will help farmers identify conserva conservation management opportunities. Um, so that's a bit of background on, on our work with regards to the environment and, and biodiversity. Uh, so when the Biodiversity Act was released in this session, 
Um, we heard from lots of members expressing concern with what this meant for them and their firm. So really the questions were like, why are they doing this? Um, I, I often heard that on the other end of the line. Um, and what really stood out was firms, farmers were really concerned you know, they're stewards of the land and they know that if they don't look after the land and the environment, their crops won't grow well, right? So that's that's an important part to consider in all of this. Um, and another, another piece of legislation, particularly one that was as vague as the act, um, would add another layer of control to private land by government. And that really just didn't sit well with farmers from what we were hearing. So uh, as follow up to that, we were satisfied to receive the announcement uh, last week indicating the changes to the private landowner sections of the Biodiversity Act. So those uh, those changes were, were really welcomed. Um, and we really anticipate government will follow through on their commitment to those changes. Um, so efforts to improve biodiversity will continue and hopefully increase as we move forward. And when I say that, I'm, I'm talking about on private lands and with the Environmental Farm Plan Program. Um, in saying that though, there is still a role for government, um, notably the Department of Lands and Forestry uh, to play. So they can expand on the agriculture biodiversity conservation plans that they, it's a program that they already offer, um, educate landowners on some of the best practices that they can apply, and also provide incentives for targeted biodiversity actions on private lands. Um, the, those are all ways that we can move forward. Anyways, uh, just once again, I want to thank you for the opportunity to present today. And um, yeah, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Thank you, Ms. McLean. Ms. smith McCrossin. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Ms. McLean, for your presentation. Uh, I love your ideas around incentives and education. I think that that is great advice, and I hope um, that the government will, will um, take heed. Um, I, I just want you to answer a, a question. Um, who do you think is better qualified to protect the biodiversity in Nova Scotia, based on your experience, the government, politicians, or farmers? Honestly, I think programs and incentives need to be tried first. Uh, make sure that those those are, you know, try the carrot method would definitely be the first step. Um, and yeah, that'd be my opinion. Yeah. Thank you. Um, seeing no other questions, um, oh, Ms. Chender. Hi. Um, so you said that you heard from your members. And so I just wonder, you know, there are other acts that function very similarly to this one. And I know that a lot of people have been mobilized around this act because of newspaper ads and, you know, lots of media and things like that. But my experience talking to folks is that not that many people have necessarily read the act or have like a legislative background to understand. And if you, and if you just dip into it and you don't have that background, you, it, it might feel terrifying and, and, and vague, as you said, but I wonder whether, you know, there, like I say, there are a couple of other acts on the books, like the endangered species act that function in really quite the same way um, and have been around for decades. And as, as an MLA, I mean, I'm an urban MLA, but I have heard from agricultural folks and folks who are in that agricultural food chain asking questions about this act. Have you heard from your members about any of those other acts that function like this? <sighs> No, we haven't. So we actually had a discussion with this and to provide context as well. So the Federation's been in the loop on this since before this act was released in the last session. So, so we're fairly well familiar and we're involved yeah. in different consultations. Um, so with regards to the other acts, I would say, no, we haven't heard a whole lot of like, you know, real hammers come down. But that doesn't mean that a change in government or a change in in mandate um, wouldn't mean that something stronger would happen with any of those acts. So we're aware that that the other acts have, I'm assuming you mean like species at risk and such, um, have, have similar penalties and fines and stuff at play. It's just a matter of, you know, 
those penalties and fines could be increased in, in that piece of legislation as well and, and really put the hammer down too. So we're always concerned and aware that that those those exist in the other acts um, and a new government could change their mandate and how those are enforced. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your time and your presentation. Appreciate you jumping in for Mr. Morash. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so our next presenter, Scott Kamal. Um, do we know if he is in the waiting room? No. So would Martha Brown be in the waiting room? Okay, if you could let Martha Brown in, please. That puts us perfectly back on schedule again, which is amazing. Uh, welcome, Ms. Brown. So Thank you. Uh, we're taking presentations on Bill 4. Uh, we have 10 minutes for your total. Uh, usually we try to have it five and five to leave some time for questions, but I will let you go to the nine minute mark before I give you a warning. So sure. the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the Honorable Committee for hearing my submission. My name is Martha Brown and I'm a private landowner, a large woodlot owner, farmer, forest harvester, environmentalist and steward of the land. I'm here to represent my family and our business, a family owned business that sustainably manages 10,000 acres of woodland, primarily in the Muscadabit Valley in the central part of Nova Scotia. We are entering the fifth generation of Browns managing these lands. Our grandchildren, Jack, Blake, Harris and Hattie are now playing in the woods and waters that we care for. I'm not only representing our family and our business, I'm also representing the 40,000 private landowners in Nova Scotia who may have expressed concerns about the bill. A poorly written bill with inadequate public consultation that was being rushed through legislature, only receiving the text of the modified bill four hours ago, giving those of us presenting today only a few moments or hours to review the text. This is outrageous and it's inadequate. And it makes us question the good faith in which the bill is being moved forward. The private landowner community supports biodiversity, period, end stop. These protections for forests, fields and waters presently exist for all lands in Nova Scotia through the various acts and statutes that are currently in effect. All of these acts include language and regulations governing behaviors by private landowners, while at the same time allowing private landowners to enjoy autonomy on their lands within the regulations. The beliefs and rights of private landowners cannot be discredited in this process. The new bill still omits language that would protect private lands from government overreach now and in the future. The lack of accompanying regulations in the original bill and the new one leaves that open to interpretation. Amendments must include clear language that entirely exempts private lands from involuntary action, including involuntary biodiversity management zones and emergency orders. The bill needs clear, plain language around this and a specific commitment not to introduce amendments to the bill that would attempt to capture private lands in the future. Nova Scotia landowners have the right to be part of a consultation process that is equitable, open, free of confidentiality, one that we can choose to be part of, not one that hears from government chosen entities and individuals only. I read a piece stating that some of the concerns over the bill were quote, silly, and most of the concerns about the proposed Biodiversity Act are overblown. Honorable committee, the concerns are neither silly nor overblown. Our family personally provides unobstructed access 
to thousands of acres of land to the public of Nova Scotia over countless kilometers of roads that we have built. People hunt, fish, hike, camp, use all terrain vehicles for their pleasure on our land. We've also experienced the other side of allowing the public to access our land. Illegal dumping, careless use of off-road vehicles, theft, damage to forestry equipment, illegal hunting, and we personally have borne the legal and financial consequences of the behavior of other, of other individuals, excuse me, because we cannot police 10,000 acres of land and we have no recourse. The scenarios are endless where we and other private landowners just like us are considered culpable under legislation, even if we are not the violators. This is the current state of private ownership in Nova Scotia. I'd like the honorable committee members to take some time to look at a link on the Who We Are page of the Nova Scotia Woodlot Owners and Operators Association. You'll find there a link to a presentation given by Murray Prest to the Royal Commission on Forestry in 1983. In the pages of his presentation, you'll find an overarching theme throughout that if you refine it to simple terms, Murray identified that management of crown lands needed to be improved and private lands were best managed by woodlot owners who were tuned into their woodlots and understood biodiversity before it was a buzzword. Who was Murray Prest? He was our uncle. Murray was the brother of Sidney Prest, a former member of the Nova Scotia, Nova Scotia Legislative Assembly, both of whom were respected for their passion to protect our natural resources. Crown land should be the focus of legislation before the assembly. Fix the decades old way of thinking about forest management on crown lands. Research and examine how current management policies by the province have brought us here to a place where the rights of the private landowner are being pitted against the rights of the publicly owned crown lands. This shouldn't be an us versus them or a rural versus urban issue, but Bill 4 made it so. In conclusion, the province needs thriving primary industries, a healthy environment that supports us, a system of laws that are fair and balanced, achieved through conservation in a transparent manner. Bill 4, as presented on March 12th, does not support all of those ideas. Private landowners are educated, passionate, and committed to seeing our lands thrive. Enough is enough of government telling landowners we are incapable of managing what we have through poorly written, self-serving legislation. I'd like to invite the Honourable Committee and any member of the, uh, of the legislature to come visit us in the Muscadabit Valley. We can show you old growth trees, recent harvests, forest with multi-aged and multi-species growth, how we harvest to maximize fiber, how we care for sensitive areas and protect wildlife. Bring a lunch and an open mind, and I think you'll find that private lands are in pretty good hands. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Uh, Mr. Burrell. <clears throat> You're on mute, Mr. Burrell. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and, and thank you, Martha, for that explanation. I, uh, I, want, I want to ask you, uh, from the point of view of, uh, of your, your family and, and the company, uh, would you be able to say anything about uh, what would be the kind of more meaningful uh, consultation for legislation in this general field that... Uh, that, that you would that you would welcome. You've criticized the absence of that kind of consultation. What would a more meaningful consultation look like? Sure. Thank you for the question, Gary. It's nice to see you. Yeah, nice to see you <laughs> um, I think that Marcus Wicker also answered some of that. Rather than you know a, a town hall meeting where uh, you know there are some questions asked and a few notes taken, and everyone goes home and. And of course, you know, you would feel like you, like you were heard, but um, it's not enough. It's not enough. Um, we need people to come and see what we're doing, to 
ex extend an offer for written submissions, uh, opportunities like this during the times of COVID, of course. More consultation with the people who are on the ground, not managers in departments who are far removed from what is happening every day in the woods, on the beaches, uh, on the lakes, and so on and so forth. Uh, more uh, a, a more openness, not just lip service to openness, but open, true openness. Thank you. We have one minute left. Any other questions? No, uh, appreciate your, your presentation. Thank you very uh, much. Thank you. So we're now at the one hour mark. So we will take a, uh, a COVID break for 15 minutes and return back at two o'clock. Thank you very much, everybody.
Meeting to order, and we have Ledge Council here. Thank you, Ms. Kinley. Um, I believe our next presenter is Patricia Egley. And do we know if we have her in the, we do, good. Uh, welcome, Ms. Egley. We have you on video, but your audio is muted right now. And part of your head is cut off. If you did want to drop your, um, there you go. Perfect. Welcome. So we'll be having presentations on Bill for the Biodiversity, a uh, total of 10 minutes. We try to have them five and five if possible to leave time for questions, but I will give you a, a, nine, a warning at the nine minute mark that there's only one minute left in total. So the floor is yours. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. <clears throat> uh, first, I would like to say that I am a landowner in rural Nova Scotia, but I do not feel threatened by Bill for in his original form at all. And I'm in no way represented by the Concerned Private Landowner Coalition. So I am privileged to have a small brook running on my property and into a saltwater bay. When we started to live here in 1984, we discovered that there was a run of smelts in that brook. Every spring for a week to 10 days, they gathered at the mouth of the stream uh, by the thousands and circle waiting for the high tide to cl climb the small waterfall. Sometimes they were joined by Gasparo. We did not have to go check if they had arrived because we were told by the cries of the blue herons and gulls that gathered to feed on the fish caught between the rocks when the tide went down. The run was an amazing phenomenon to watch. And because very few smells, if any, made it up the fall, my children and I would scoop some with buckets and quickly release them above the fall. We probably did not make much difference, as I learned later that smells can successfully reproduce by spawning on the shore at the mouth of the freshwater brook. But my children learned to respect life and um, to be amazed at uh, the working of nature. Then one spring, a man in a small boat came and put a net across most of the inlet. He came again next spring, and there has not been a single smelt trying to go up that little brook since, nor Gasparo. We do not see herons strutting on the shore for most of the summer anymore, and the man did not come back either. But that is not surprising. He killed the goose that laid the golden eggs. This is biodiversity loss. It is difficult to express in words the deep sense of loss, of sadness and frustration, and sometimes anger that this smelt run is no more. I will not be able to share the awe with my grandchildren. When I tell this story to them, it will be a story in the past, like so many stories grandma tells, but it will not be a story of their present and future. This is why we need the Biodiversity Act with emphasis on awareness, education, and enforcement. You may think that this is only a small fish run in a small brook of a small population of smelts, but I am only one of the many Nova Scotians from all over the province who can tell similar stories about many different species of flora and fauna. Sometimes the cause is evident, as in the case of a forest clear cut, sometimes not so evident because habitat fragmentation and loss is such an insidious phenomenon. But biodiversity loss happens every day in Nova Scotia and more and more species become endangered. Practically no landowner has enough land to preserve biodiversity on his or her own. We must collaborate and work as a team. And this is why we need the Biodiversity Act. It should transcend property boundaries and work at the landscape scale. It is very disappointing that Bill 4 has been modified already, even before today's public consultation. It is even more concerning that the changes were made to appease people that reacted to, the, to a completely false and alarmist representation of Bill 4, mounted by a special interest group, Forest Nova Scotia, and hiding by, behind an assumed name 
and not representing all private landowners. In Shipping Bill 4, I urge you not to forget the very many Nova Scotians that need and want the biodiversity bill, such as the families that do not walk their favorite trail because it now crosses a clear cut, the fishermen that do not go fishing because there are no salmon and too few trout swimming in our streams, the wild berry and mushroom pickers who do not pick anymore because of herbicide spraying, and the farmer that is concerned for his crop because pollinators' insects become fewer every year. Please do not water down the biodiversity bill, most importantly for our children and grandchildren. They are so worried for the natural environment of their future that they feel compelled to have demonstration even before they're out of school and to do a hunger strike to save the moose. I thank you for your time and I welcome your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Roberts. Thank you so much for your presentation, which honestly uh, made me tear up a little uh, for your grandchildren and for my children. Um, I wonder if you could tell me a little bit more about uh, the land that you own, how, how much it is, and, uh, and whether you harvest from it at all, uh, and, and where you are in the province. Um. We live uh, in in Halifax County on on Jador Harbor, um, but I have another property. This one is eight acres. I have another uh, three acre property nearby. I have a thirty three acre property further down the eastern shore and a woodlot in Hans County. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. I had to drop my screen for a second there. My apologies if I missed any other hands that might have been up. Ms. Egley, thank you. And I'm sorry if I mispronounced your last name, but thank you very much for your presentation. Appreciate it. And uh, we'll now go on to our next presenter. Uh, Hegley Gun Gutterly, the St. Mary Grits Bay Stewardship Association. I do see uh, Helga Gutterly attempting to connect okay there. I believe we have a connection. I should unmute. Uh, welcome. There you go. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Love technology, no problem. Listen, yeah. you're the first one that we've had that's been, that we're actually ahead of schedule. So it's very much oh, appreciated excellent. being ready. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. So we have uh, Bill 4, the Biodiversity Act. So we'll have 10 minutes for your presentation. If you can do it in five, that leaves five minutes for questions. And I will at the very least give you a warning at the nine minute mark that there's a minute left. All right. The floor Sounds is yours. Good. All right. Um, I'll put myself so I can see. Well, that's the way it's working. Okay, so I'm here both for myself and for the St. Margaret's Bay Stewardship Association. And I'm really honored to present before the committee on, on behalf of the Stewardship Association. Uh, and we wanted to express our support for the biodiversity bill as it was originally presented to the legislature. It's unfortunate that I couldn't examine the amended bill while I had these preparations to make. I only received it this morning and I've made, I spent most of my day yesterday trying to put together my statement. So that was really unfortunate. Now you'd like to know about the St. Argus Bay Stewardship Association. It's a not-for-profit charitable organization whose purpose is to protect and, and enhance St. Margaret's Bay natural environment, heritage, and communities. Our values are to be responsible, collaborative, and to follow the traditional Mi'kmaq concepts that celebrate the connection and balance between natural and human worlds. The St. Margaret's Bay Stewardship Association recognizes that conservation of biodiversity is really essential for our future 
as it is clearly stated in the bill and the preamble to the bill and in the amended bill as well, particularly in two passages, one which is, and whereas the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity is a complex cross-cutting imperative that necess necessitates cooperation and collaboration among all sectors and is therefore a shared responsibility of all levels of government, non-government organizations, the private sector land trusts and owners of private land, the Mi'kmaq of Nova Scotia and other Nova Scotians. And then the next one, which is whereas biodiversity must be managed for the benefit of present and future generations. I won't read the rest, you've all read that. So it's clear that biodiversity is amazing diversity of life forms. And just full disclaimer, I'm a, uh, I'm a biologist. I taught for 30 years at Laval University. I'm a professor of did my, I have 180 publications in, in physiology. So I am a biologist. So that's, that's clear that you should, should know that. But you can probably tell as well by the way I'm saying things. So biodiversity is what keeps our planet alive. And we're probably the least favorable element, we humans, in the ecosystem network that we have. So ecosystems are communities of living organisms, microbes, plants, animals, and the habitats that they depend upon. And the more diverse a system is, the more balanced and the more stable it's going to be, and the more efficiently it's going to work. So of course, you know this, we know this, we've been told this a lot, but I thought of an analogy that might bring home some of these ideas more clearly. Imagine that the earth is an airplane and that species are the rivets that hold the airplane together. When a couple rivets go, say the great auk, say the passenger pigeon, things keep going along pretty well. Then some more central rivets like the codfish, Atlantic salmon go. Oops, things start getting a little more difficult. We've gone through that in our direct lifetimes at least in my direct lifetime. I'm a little older perhaps than most of you. And then all of a sudden things get worse when the rivets like clean air and clean water go away. Life starts getting very scary. So it's clear that we need to protect all these things. If you're in that plane and the rivets are going, you want them to stay. Otherwise the whole thing is gonna fall apart. And now with these amendments, we're being told that we're only going to protect 30% of Nova Scotia crown land, that biodiversity protection isn't going to extend to everything. I just don't know how they could come to those decisions. But having said that, I do have specific suggestions for the bill as it was first written. Reading through the bill, I became aware that almost everything was addressed to terrestrial systems, land-based systems. I think biodiversity protection is as necessary, if not more necessary, in freshwater and marine systems. I understand that this can have jurisdictional questions, but one of the first sections of the preambles to this bill mentioned very clearly the importance of working together with different levels of government. So. I know of so many examples of invasive species that have spread lakes that used to have frogs of all sorts now are just toad lakes because of smallmouth bass and chain pickerel. Uh, all sorts of marine species, the green crab that's perhaps gonna compete with lobsters. So there's so many examples where aquatic systems, both fresh and salt water, need protection. So I think that really needs to be added to the bill. Also, climate change is completely absent from this bill. Climate change is, is here. I mean, even the Supreme Court has said it. The conservatives didn't really want to admit it nationally, but climate change is here. And so we have to add it and it should be in this bill. There should be indications of biodiversity. Quantification has to take in, into account climate change. Now there's some interesting clauses in the bill, clauses 9G, one and two, I think that's how you'd say it, a little small i, one and two. They stipulate that the minister investigate and establish methods to, the first one, incorporate the value of biodiversity and ecosystem goods and services into decision-making. And the second one, manage the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. So if 
the minister who has many, many powers follows this bill, those aspects will need to be factored into landscape level planning for the use of crown lands. In other words, landscape level planning of unfortunately, primarily industrial forestry. Now the fourth aspect in the original bill was the biodiversity emergency zones. It was written in a very general fashion and I could see how it could make people nervous. It raised hackles from landovers across the province and it was partly or largely because there was such wide scope given to the minister, to the powers of the minister and very little definition about it. But the response to it was completely out of proportion. I'm very saddened by the fear mongering tactics led by this fake coalition of concerned landowners supported by an industry lobby that has led to this concern and has, has really upset the democratic process. I should not be commenting on a bill that has been amended. I got it this morning, it's all, half of it is red. I should not be doing that, that's anti-democratic. So I feel like leave, modifying the bill before it comes to this committee is, is undemocratic and it's leaving due process hanging in an abyss. I think that section could be modified to respond to an so that the minister could respond to an emergency. And there are such emergency introduction of, of pests for agricultural species, in, in, introduction of a competitive um, fish for, for, for fishing tournaments, things that might happen just like that and have happened and have led to lots of consequences. Those emergencies should be there should be a mechanism whereby the minister intervenes to work on those. So as a final thing, I would like, in the name of the St. Margaret's Bay Stewardship Association, to ask our new premier what legacy he wishes to leave. The changes to the biodiversity bill and the means in which those changes were made contradict many aspects of the platform upon which he was just elected. We know that he wants to leave the province in a better condition than he found it, and that you care what people think about you. So what legacy does this government want to leave? And I think by amending this bill to restore its applicability to all of Nova Scotia, that would be a great step. Thank you. That was your perfect one minute warning, Mark. Uh, yeah. Questions? Uh, Ms. Roberts, sorry, Ms. McCrossin, you're just one second late. Yeah, um, I'm. I'm just wondering how the St. Margaret's uh, Bay Stewardship Association, I guess, pursues its objectives. Given that I assume you are working uh, and considering both crown land and private land in in your area, we have a, a number of really interesting stewardship programs. Uh, that are based on several uh, portions of land that are, uh, one is in conjunction with the Nova Scotia Nature Trust, another one is in conjunction with the Department of Lands and Forestry, another one is in conjunction with the, uh, the Bluff Wilderness Area. So all of those stewardship programs are run in conjunction with established organizations either or with government. And we're, we're working to, um, we're lobbying for, in, in a sense, protection of a large area of land that is currently crown land. So I think what, the best way to put it would be that we're trying to find ways to help protect the environment where we are with the people. So it's a collaborative community-based approach that we set up where we we recruit stewards as that are volunteers in our area to help look after the land that we all love. So one of the best examples is McCoo's Island and the Bluff, the Bluff Trail Stewardship uh, Program that we have, which is has worked really, really well on the Eyes on Islands. And so we've... Um, we, Mike Lancaster has put together uh, a document for Nova Scotia environment showing how our stewardship plans have been run. And I think you'd find it quite enjoyable to, to look through, yeah. 
Thank you very much, Gutterly, Miss Gutterly, for your, and I hope I'm pronouncing that right for You're you. You're not, it's Gutterly. Gutterly, my there apologies. There you go, it's German, so nobody knows how to say it. Thank yeah. you. All right. So we'll go on now to our 220 presentation, Gerald Fulton. Uh, I believe he must be in the lobby. He'll be by phone, Gordon. Okay, I see him there now. <clears throat> as soon as he unmutes and comes in. Hello. Welcome, um, Mr. Fulton. Uh, I believe you can hear me well. So yes, we'll, have, we'll have 10 minutes for your presentation. Uh, we try to have it five and five, five minutes for presentation and five for questions. But if you do go over, um, certainly at the nine minute mark, I'll be giving you the one minute warning uh, that your time is getting near. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, committee members and other listeners. I am a landowner in the province in the Berwick area, and my remarks are going to be brief. You don't have to worry about me going over. I'm asking probably more questions than I am and comments, but I'm, I'm, my comments, if the government position is what they say it is and that they want to be able to better manage the Crown lands, why do we need this legislation? They already control the Crown lands through their ownership, and it seems to me that we're spending a lot of taxpayers' dollars to have public hearings and everything to do something that they can already do. What I would like to know is why they are pushing this agenda so hard and fast. I believe that the private lands are being well managed by the many farmers, foresters, and other landowners who place high values in, on their land and also in most cases are prepared to share it with the hikers, snowmobile owners, all train vehicles, and others. I also strongly question how we as stakeholders can be expected to receive the final draft of this legislation this morning and be expected to comment intelligently on it this afternoon. What is so urgent that this is happening? Makes no sense to me unless there is a final agenda. My position on it is that I support the government's efforts to promote and implement the biodiversity on the land they own, but not on the private lands and stuff it down our throats in this problem. That's about as brief as I can keep it. I thank you very much, Mr. Fulton. Uh, Ms. Roberts has a question for you. Hello, I, I wonder if you might just introduce yourself a little bit more. Tell us, uh, you know, what land you own, what your relationship is to it, uh, and maybe any changes you've seen in your time as, uh, as owner of that land. Well, certainly. I, it was the first time I've done something like this, and I didn't realize... Didn't understand the format at all, but I'm, uh, I am I used to dairy farm in the Berwick area, and now a cash crop farm, and I'm semi-retired, and, and I've sold a lot of my land, but they still own about 400 acres in the Berwick area, some in forest, mostly in farmland, and uh, we are constantly improving the drainage on the land and, and uh, improving the land in the time I've had it. I've been farming for about 45 years now, and I consider myself a good steward of the land. Do we have, Ms. Roberts has another question for you. Sure. And, and I'm just wondering, you know, I guess the reaction to this legislation um, has uh, revealed um, some lack of trust in the government. Do you think that something could have been done differently to, I guess, reduce anxiety about what might come in the regulations uh, to this act? I'm glad you asked that question. It's an excellent question. I think that there should have been some interaction with the stakeholders to let us as stakeholders know what they are planning and what's going ahead. And, uh, you know, some public meetings or Zoom meetings as it is now and, and stuff and something to bring us up to speed 
on what they really do want to do. You know, it, it really makes me suspicious when they say that what they want to do is uh, improve the biodiversity on the crown lands. Well, why do they need legislation? It's a lot of talk to taxpayers to do something that they can already do. Thank you, Mr. Fulton. Um, I see no other hands for questions. Listen, I appreciate you calling in for this and, and participating. And uh, we'll move on to our next presenter. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for hearing me. Thank you. Uh, Laura Crompton is our 2.30. We are five minutes early on that. The only person in the waiting room right now is Darcy Merriweather, who's the 250 presenter. Well, with the uh, favor of the committee, we'll, uh, we'll bring that one in and then that'll make time for the others a little later, if that's okay. Okay, go ahead with that, Ms. Kinley, thank you. Hello. Uh, yes, uh, there we go. We have audio and video. Thank you there very much for being. Uh, firstly, thank you for being prompt and astute. Uh, we we have a, a couple that aren't present, so we bumped you up a little bit. So we have uh, 10 minutes for you for presentations on Bill 4. We will um, uh, usually try to have it at 5 and 5 if possible, uh, leave some time for questions. But if, if you go a little longer into your presentation, I'll give you a warning at the 9-minute mark at the very least. So the floor is yours. Sounds great. Good, af good afternoon. and Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this afternoon. I just want to make sure that everyone can hear and see me like everyone else. I'm still learning and adapting to the new ways of operating in the uh, COVID-19 pandemic world. I'd like to start by telling you a little bit about myself and our small family business based out of Brookfield, Nova Scotia. I'm a registered professional forester. I moved to Nova Scotia in 1999, but I have roots in Nova Scotia dating back much farther as my mother was born and raised on her family farm in Middle Muscadabin. Together with my wife, Margot, who is a professional accountant, we manage our family business. Our business got its start in the early 1900s. Brookfield Lumber has been through many transformations and, adapt and, and adaptions over many years. We recently had a reminder of our past while cleaning out the basement of our mill office. We discovered a set of horse reins, which were used in our horse logging operations. Unfortunately, our sawmill was destroyed by a fire in February of 2003. Economic and regu regulatory realities did not allow a small operation like ours to rebuild. Today, similar to Leahy's report, our family business stands on three legs, which we use to navigate through these difficult times. The first leg is our hardware and lumber yard retail business, which has been in operation since the mid uh, 1998 or mid 80s. The second leg is agriculture. We are a Nova Scotia blueberry grower. Our involvement in blueberries dates back to the late 60s. At that time, we produced wooden blueberry boxes and started developing blueberry fields. The third leg is forestry. We have been sustainably managing and investing in our forest since the mid um, 1950s. Lately, particularly in the media, forestry is portrayed as something that is bad for the environment. We see it as just the opposite. And we are proud of our contributions to clean air, wildlife, biodiversity, and the economy. I invite all members of this committee to visit our forest firsthand and see why we are so proud of what we do. Climate change is one of the biggest threats to our forest and future forests. We feel we are well positioned to contribute to the battle against climate change, with biodiversity being a key factor in that fight. We are supportive of biodiversity initiatives, 
We have always adapted our management activities to address biodiversity concerns and will continue to do so. I'm here today to speak to you about the Biodiversity Act. I am unable to speak to this morning's recommended changes as I have not had adequate time to review them. Instead, I'd like to speak to you about the concerns I have leading up to this morning's recommended changes. My first concern with the Biodiversity Act is the path it has taken to be in its development. The, in the initiative of creating the first Biodiversity Act in Canada is a huge undertaking with many stakeholders. I believe initiatives like the creation of the first Biodiversity Act can only be accomplished through understanding, cooperation, transparency, and honesty among these stakeholders. No one can argue that the path taken to develop Nova Scotia's Biodiversity Act has failed many in many of these aspects. Most importantly, honesty. The last time the Biodiversity Bill was introduced, the communication to me and the members of the Law Amendments Committee was that the Biodiversity Act will not affect private land. That simply wasn't true. The second concern I'd like to speak to you about today is that the overall purpose of the act is still unclear. The broadness and vagueness of the Biodiversity Act makes it difficult for me to understand what the true objective might be. I would like to remind you of the definition of biodiversity. Biodiversity means living organisms from all sources, the ecological complexes of which living organisms are a part, are a part including terrestrial, marine, and other aquatic ecosystems. The variability and independence among the living organisms and the ecological complexes. It's kind of a mouthful. The definition seems to include everything on our lands, living, non-living, and how we might interact with them and manage them. Moving forward, I would suggest we narrow the scope of the act to to address the specific aspects of biodiversity which require action. Many of my other concerns regarding the Biodiversity Act appear to be addressed through the recommended changes by the minister this morning. I would like to thank the minister for recommending these changes and look forward to examining them closer and working together with the bio, working together to develop the biodiversity regulations that will only apply on Crown land. As a landowner who is negatively affected by off-highway vehicles, I understand how an act can have one intent, but through regulations and enforcement can have a completely different intent. Without proper time to review the recommended changes to the Biodiversity Act and the regulations having not been released at this time, I am unable to term that, determine that both the act and the regulations will only apply on Crown land. I think this is an important question for the committee to consider and one that needs to be answered. I ask, can we please slow down so we can get it right? Moving forward, forest landowners along with other landowners need to have meaningful input in the process. Our our collective success depends on getting this Biodiversity Act done right, along with many other environmental initiatives to battle climate change. Simply put, Nova Scotia needs forest landowner engagement. This can only be accomplished through understanding, cooperation, transparency, and honesty. As stated in Honorable Ian Rankin's letter to both Honorable Chuck Porter, Minister of Lands and Forestry, and Minister of Energy and Mines, and Honorable Keith Caldwell, Minister of Agriculture and Minister of Fish Fisheries and Agriculture. Nova Scotia only truly succeeds when we all succeed. At this time, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this afternoon and encourage you to accept my offer to visit our forest. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Merriweather. Uh, Ms. Roberts has her hands up. You're on mute. Ms. Sorry. Roberts, here we go. 
it t- t- took me a second to find the button. No, we no. all do that. Uh, yeah, no, that's for sure. Um, Mr. Merriweather, I, I've met you uh, yeah. a number of occasions. I know you're a part of the large non-industrial woodlot owners. I think I'm getting that right. I'm not sure, sure if you're still on the board of, of Forest Nova Scotia as well. I, I'm wondering, you know, do you, are, are you, can you provide some insight into uh, some of the some of the concerns that uh, are are talked about on the the coalition of oh, concerned private landowner coalition? It, it, I'm just going to quote from the site for a second. It says every current user of private lands is threatened by Bill Four because private landowners will be forced to close their lands to the public to protect themselves from losing control over their property. I look at the bill, and I I don't I don't understand how how we end up getting there. Um, and just can you provide any insight into into that? Sure, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I'm not really able to answer for any other landowner other than myself, so I'll I'll, I'll explain how how we look at it, and how we understand it. Um, our concern is that there's very unregulated use of our land, and the problem with that is we're not sure who's on our land, and do they have good intentions or do they not have good intentions. Of one minute, with the with the vagueness of this this act, we're not even sure what the problem could be. So therefore, we don't know what to look for, and is somebody going to pull a fast one on us? Thank you. I saw some other arms waving, but I couldn't tell if there were hands up or just arms waving. No, no, there were just uh, arms waving. Okay, thank you. Um, Thank you, Mr. Merriweather. No other questions, I believe. Uh, appreciate you again being ready and coming in early. It's uh, it's uh, it's very nice to be able to manage this virtual forum in a little bit more of a civilized way. So appreciate you're welcome. That. If I could just take a minute to follow up on Lisa's question, I just did have one final thought. Sure. I did have a number of landowners contact me and ask me what this bill was about, and their biggest concern was that they didn't even understand the bill or weren't made aware of the bill is where a lot of the landowners that I spoke to were coming from. They simply just didn't know about the bill. There was no communication from the government, and the only thing they were hearing was um, what they saw on the news, which, as we know, is never <laughs> lacks accuracy at some points. Thank you. Appreciate You're that. Welcome. Thank you very much again for your presentation. You're welcome. Thank you. So I do not know if Mr. Fulton was skipped in the um, in the waiting room. It was not there when we were ready to go. The next one would have been Laura Crump, or I'm sorry, Floyd. I'm sorry, it would have been Laura Crompton, then Peter or Floyd P- Porter. We heard, we heard from Mr. Fulton. Pardon me? We heard from Mr. Fulton. Yes, so it's either Laura Crompton or Floyd Porter. Do we have either of them waiting? No, we don't. Um, our next break was scheduled for three o'clock. Uh, I assume we have nobody waiting in the uh, in the uh, waiting room. There is. No, there's there's no one waiting. Okay, so seeing that, then I would suggest that we. Um, have a little bit more of an extended break here, seeing that there are no presenters, um, which would mean that we will reconvene at 315 uh, at the favor of the committee. Uh, everybody's in okay with that. Thank you. We'll uh, recess until 315.
Lich TV. I believe uh, we're back. Uh, law amendments uh, to order. And I believe uh, we have our uh, first presenter is Donna Kidston. Is Donna Kidston. Ms. Kitston, are you uh, with us by phone? For uh, for Ledge TV, I'm I'm not getting any audio. Do I continue? Kitson. Oh, there yeah. we go. We've got you now, uh, Ms. Kitston. Uh, thank you. Uh, welcome to Law Amendments Committee for Bill Number Four, the Biodiversity Act. Uh, so you'll have uh, ten minutes uh, time to uh, present and uh, have questions with uh, members. Uh, the members will ask questions. Uh, generally, five minutes for presentation, five minutes for Q and A. Uh, I will give a one-minute warning that will be at the nine-minute mark if you are still presenting, just in case uh, you want to um, have some questions posed by members of the committee. And with that, no I'll pass it on to you to begin your presentation. Thank you. As a concerned citizen and landowner, I feel the bill should seek to obtain through cooperation, educational workshops, non-partisan non incentives, etc., the partnership of willing private landowners for achieving a reasonable healthy environment rather than having the Minister of Lands and Forestry slash Governor and Council dictate exclusively the standards and methods of doing this. Number two, if the government wishes to see changes in how environment is protected, it must be obligated to seek willing, educated, informed private landowner partners to achieve these goals government referring to representing all taxpayers fairly without bias or favoritism. Three, the act is too heavy handed in my opinion, a way uh, to achieve more ecological and sustainable approach for reaching biodiversity objectives or goals. It seems there are other agendas at play. Prove to me it's not a land grab or tax grab, please. Four, I suggest the approach of achieving success by a gradual move in a new direction through transparency and total honesty and no hidden agendas with private landowners and lead by example on Crown land. Five, as a landowner and a citizen, I am very disappointed that this government tried to put this bill through without putting the information on our local television stations and in the newspapers full disclosure there should be more time, much more time given for concerns on any bill that affects my rightful decision making. Six, I did not see a single word that said science in the bill. The minister slash governor in council must have proof that stands up in the courts to implement, implement zones and enforce zones to make demands. Without the science, zones are just words. Until we know this, we are being told to get on a ship without knowing what direction it is going to take us and the effect it's going to have or why, especially why. In closing, Nova Scotians pride themselves in making good common sense decisions, like making sacrifices to keep COVID numbers down. Why does this government feel they have to control us with a sledgehammer? Use my tax dollars to promote earth education programs like those that were started by George Taylor and Alan Warner through the school science curriculum, not to create more permits. They are not profitable, these programs, in the short term, but will create concerned stewards of environment that will save millions of dollars in our future without having to be controlled. Uh, you have eroded my trust in you by going too fast and too hard and leaving this bill too open-ended. Should you be fined or sent to jail for your mistake? 
I personally can be forgiving and allow you to be included with all Nova Scotians in making good democratic decisions together on our nature's home's behalf. Thank you for this time, and may we all move forward together without mistakes. Thank you uh, for your presentation, Ms. Uh, Kidston. And now open to the floor, uh, Ms. Roberts. Thank you, and thank you so much for joining us today. I wonder if you might introduce yourself just a little bit more. Can you explain, you know, what part of the province you're in and what your relationship is to land, whether you're a woodlot owner and, and et cetera? I, I guess my firm firm uh, belief is the fact that I can just announce myself as a citizen and a landowner, and I don't think it matters who I am, except that my voice is important as a citizen of Nova Scotia. Okay, thank you. Um, and if I may, Mr. Chair, just to follow up, um, I, I know that, uh, you know, biodiversity has been talked about as, as an area that needs to be addressed through legislation, going back to the natural resources strategy. In fact, I was just reviewing that. And, and the natural resources strategy was... Um, consulted on with with thousands of citizens over over quite a number of years um, but then kind of the the work on outstanding items under it kind of went quiet for quite a quite a long time um, under um, after the NDP government and, and I'm wondering if you participated at all uh, in that consultation and if you have any thoughts on on what is needed to build trust um, with with citizens across the province? I think I just stated that in my presentation by taking it slow and going through the the people of Nova Scotia, making them aware of everything that's involved, any move that's been made or that's going to be made or why it's being made. Okay, um, not seeing any other. Oh, Ms. Smith McCrossan. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you uh, to our presenter. I just want to say thank you for presenting today, and um, your comments are shared by many Nova Scotians that we have all heard from as MLAs. And I do want to just thank you for um, being a voice. And if you have any suggestions to government for next steps and moving forward, can you share with us how you believe government should engage with citizens, with residents like yourself to ensure a more uh, dem democratic process? Yes, I'd like to know, you know, the reasons behind wanting to expand boundaries within the Crown land or what, what their, you know, what their, um, this biodiversity, uh, diversity zone, uh, as I said, it's it's too open-ended and it seems to me like there's hidden agendas there. It, it doesn't doesn't sit right right at all. Um, things are just too unclear, too unclear. Even with the new uh, amendment paper that just came out with all the red, red out, uh, still when it comes to this expanding biodiversity zones and, uh, you know, uh, I, I can give you an example of, of, of a friend's mother that, that was all in a tizzy and upset uh, when she knew that these fines were coming up and called her, her son and and was very upset about it all. I mean, we don't want to be stressed as Nova Scotians. Life is hard enough as it is right now. We want to live, you know, or to, to do things in harmony with, not not have, not be antagonized by things that we we don't trust. We need trust. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Roberts. Thank you. Um, the, uh, the, the fines and the possible enforcement mechanism under the Biodiversity Act, um, which, which pe some people have expressed concerns about, are, are actually similar to the enforcement mechanisms and fines under a number of other acts that are already in effect, like the Endangered Species Act and the Species at Risk Act. And I, I saw in the news that recently... Uh, first time I've ever noticed a, a species at risk fine was um, was levied against uh, someone, uh, I think a company, and it and it 
was six thousand um, dollars the fine that was um, that was levied do you you know do you do you have a, any experience yourself of having the endangered uh, species act or any other act like that um, affect your enjoyment of your property as a landowner and your ability to to make decisions uh, well that's a that's a criminal activity of somebody that it's it's a very it's a, it's a quite unusual uh, thing to happen it's not a common thing uh, at all that example um, but my problem is is things are so wide open ended uh, with insects and whatever, uh, that it almost seems like any excuse can be made. And, uh, you know, the more people that are in running around on people's lands and stuff, uh, I think it's causing, oh, it would it would cause a lot of uh, discontent from people, of landowners. It's not something we want. And if someone is breaking the law, fine. I mean, that's, that's take care of it. But uh, I think that there's just getting too much control uh, in in what seems to be and and if 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 you feel that control is needed then explain to people why and then maybe they won't be so upset all right um I'm not seeing any other uh, questions and only about uh, 10 seconds left. So uh, Ms. Kitston, thank you for your presentation and engagement uh, today and law amendments to share your perspective on Bill 4, the Biodiversity Act. Have a great afternoon. Thank you very much. And, and, and if you put in school programs for children and education, I think that's one of the answers right there. Thank you very right, thank much you. for giving me this time. Thank you. Next up is Mr. Uh, I believe Leif uh, Helmer. Mr. Helmer, are you with us? Good afternoon. <clears throat> Welcome to Law Amendments Committee uh, for Bill Number Four, the Biodiversity Act. Uh, you have uh, a ten-minute uh, opportunity. Uh, generally, five-minute presentation, five minute for questions and answers. Uh, but you can use the time as you wish. I will provide a one-minute warning if you're still presenting at the nine-minute mark. And with that, you can begin. Thank you very much. My name is Leif Helmer, and I'm here as a volunteer today and as the volunteer uh, chair of the Board of Directors for the Mersey Tobiotic Research Institute. We're very much a biodiversity-focused organization, a nonprofit cooperative with about a 15-year track record working in North Queens and South Annapolis and the general area of Guestwick on uh, biodiversity education, research, monitoring, and management. As chair, I represent the interest, interest of the board, uh, our activities, and we work uh, equally with, uh, as a science organization, equally with private landowners, with corporations, with government. Uh, we work on crown lands and we work with private landowners uh, and we have a, a good relationship of doing this. I'll also note that I've taught natural resources uh, with the Nova Scotia Community College in the past. And as a father of three children, I feel I have a direct interest in seeing strong and effective protection for biodiversity. I presented to this committee or a version of this committee in 2019 and brought forward recommendations at that point to the first version of this bill. And though there were some improvements that were made in the second introduction uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, many of those improvements have been since removed. Uh, over the weekend and uh, following the remarks of the minister and uh, and the premier uh, in response to the divisive uh, campaign over the last couple of weeks. As a citizen with an interest in biology and um, training or background, it's been a very dis disappointing and difficult span of time. Uh, I once worked in civil service. And I respect all of you who are working for the public, public service, uh, and I understood and understand the processes are there to enshrine the responsibilities that we have as citizens um, to have a voice. And I feel like, uh, to be honest, that that responsibility has been taken from this committee with the changes that have been made this weekend and uh, that this committee's work has been shortened, dismissed, or diminished 
as a result of the <clears throat> sweeping changes. I read the act this morning, the new, the new bill, I should say, and it's a sea of red and very little green in terms of new additions. And uh, the act itself has gone from 50 or 60 sections down to 18. And it really is uh, much diminished, though some who may have presented today have called it strengthened. I would refute that and call it much diminished. <clears throat> uh, the status quo is what's got us here in terms of management of land. Uh, I own land. I, I don't pretend to believe that I know threats that could come in the future to biodiversity. Uh, I'm not pro a proponent of the status quo based on years and years and years of knowledge, or if my, my people own this land, I think that private land ownership um, is not the, the priority here, that science has to be reinserted into the conversation. And the whole idea of private land rights trumping um, other interests is a very deeply colonial and problematic uh, stance. So I think that there is a distinct need for science, and uh, and in that respect, I believe that the uh, the act could and should have <clears throat> greater resourcing for education, the importance of biodiversity conservation. Unfortunately, these last two weeks have handed uh, the citizens uh, and our constituents, your constituents, with a very divided uh, misunderstanding now of what biodiversity conservation um, involves, and I feel like we've taken a couple of steps back. Uh, in the last couple of weeks around <clears throat> how people understand the value and the importance of biodiversity, including biological threats to our forest sector, like forest pests that could be controlled or be at least studied and understood and monitored better with a piece of a, a legislation like this bill could provide. Uh, these pests, like uh, you might consider a uh, hemlock woolly adelgid, which is in our southwest, or perhaps a uh, pale wing gray or other forest pests uh, of the past do not discriminate whether it's crown land or private land. They will uh, emerge in, in lands of, of all, all jurisdictions. And for us to believe that this act should only apply to crown lands is uh, the equivalent of only testing for COVID in one third of our counties and ignoring the other two thirds. It would be ludicrous. So I feel like there's a, a recalibration that needs to be put back into this, into this bill. And there are priorities around ecological restoration and research that could also be inserted and bolstered. There's a whole uh, movement of citizen science, which has uh, captured people's imaginations during COVID, where people have become naturalists and uh, are reporting using sophisticated uh, apps and technology to include and benefit our information of, uh, of uh, biodiversity and its occurrence on private lands and in neighborhoods and in, in, in forests and all over the place. Uh, there's no mention of citizen science in the bill, and this is an oversight. Uh, I also say, suggest, and I suggested two years ago, that the reporting cycle on this bill could be much more um, timely. It could be uh, a state of biodiversity within one year of proclamation, which I understand would be October 1st of this year. So that's a full 18 months from now uh, for uh, that state of biodiversity to be released. Subsequently, there's this five-year cycle of reporting that doesn't need to be five years. That seems a fairly arbitrary. And if we were dealing with a biodiversity crisis, seriously, we would not wait every five years to provide progress. And on that progress, the uh, review and reporting should include uh, dedicated measurable um, metrics, uh, KPIs, key performance indicators of how this act is actually working. I have a few suggestions that I'll include in a written proposal, a written submission. And lastly, this bill could be aligned much better with the Leahy Report. There are several aspects of the Leahy Report that call for biodiversity, call for it to be included in how we manage our lands, but also how we report and how we research and how we assess. And this bill doesn't note that and doesn't align very well with the Leahy recommendations. So those would be some key high level uh, suggestions, the need for science, uh, this reliance on private land as a a protector of status quo is not uh, sufficient. This is a crisis that needs to be dealt with uh, in a more substantive way. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, uh, Mr. Helmer. Uh, now uh, open up to members for questions. Uh, Ms. Roberts and then Ms. Chen. Thank you very much for your comments. And um, I, I wonder if you could 
uh, speak, uh, you know, given the experience of the Mersey Topiatic Research Institute of, like you say, working with many private landowners as well as with government, um, to what do you um, attribute the, you know, the the apparent distrust of the government uh, and and its potential intentions with this act? So the relationships that we've been able to build with private landowners are predicated on, on trust and mutual benefit and uh, an understanding of um, what we each brought to the table. Um, I would suggest that, and, and I did two years ago suggest that the regulations for this bill could be and would be better presented with the bill. Uh, I think that would have been very helpful uh, so that Nova Scotians understood what the regulations would entail uh, when it came back for a, a second uh, second attempt here this year. Uh, so as we offer, uh, we operate as an honest broker with the Research Institute. People know what we bring to the table as strengths and they know what we're interested in, in working with them on a collaborative basis. Um, without the regulations to this uh, bill, uh, unfortunately, uh, it was vulnerable to the kind of scare um, campaign that happened. Ms. Chender, about a minute and a half remaining. Yeah, well, that, thank you. And, and thanks, Mr. Helmer. That was the perfect segue to my question, which is you mentioned the new bill. We don't have a new bill yet. What we have are a set of proposed amendments. And it will be up to this committee um, to vote on whether those amendments should be accepted. Given that you, as with every other uh, scientist who has presented to this committee in written or, or spoken form, um, is speaking out at least moderately in favor of the original bill and against the bill as amended, <laughs> I wonder if you think that that scare campaign or misinformation um, you know, has gone a long way towards the kind of whatever, you know, support we're seeing of this gutted version of the bill. So do you, you know, when you saw the kind of public information, you know, with the history of policy and science that you have, um, is the reaction that you're seeing from private woodland owners and others who are presenting here, um, does it fit the new bill? Do you think that the fears that we're hearing expressed here um, are commensurate with what you see in policy or is it, is it a scare campaign? My, my sense is that the um, the new bill revised this weekend and released this morning is uh, is insufficient, and that if this committee can uh, revert to the uh, second reading version that was uh, circulated, uh, you know, prior to last Tuesday when uh, the remarks uh, were made of, of the intent to change, I would I would strongly encourage this committee to uh, respect that process and. Uh, and let let the legislature know that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Helmer, uh, for joining us today. Uh, time has uh, elapsed for questions. Um, the next uh, presenter, uh, I believe, is uh, Mr. Uh, Franz uh, Freitzel. whom I believe is joining us by phone. Uh, are you- This is Franz uh, Freitzel. Great, uh, so welcome to the Law Amendments Committee uh, where we're discussing bill number four, the Biodiversity Act. Uh, we'll have uh, 10 minutes, uh, five minutes presentation, leaving five minutes for Q and A. Uh, if your presentation runs long, I will give a one minute warning at the nine minute mark uh, so that uh, you will have some time for a question. And with that, you can begin. Thank you. Committee, my name is Franz Freitzel and I'm presenting my opinion and evidence with honorable and peaceful intentions. It is not my intention to harass, intimidate, offend, conspire, blackmail, coerce, cause anxiety, alarm, or distress. As the executive beneficiary and private landowner, I'm rejecting Bill 4 and 9. Both must die. A brief background about myself, I received formal education through a technical agriculture college in applied conventional agriculture and forestry practices in Germany. 
further studied biodynamic agriculture by Rudolf Steiner, along with knowledge in miniculture, herb farming, and wild crafting, with additional certifications in municipal solid waste management and recycling, fecal sludge management, and household water treatment and safe storage, a business approach to sustainable landscape restoration, environmental management and ethics, as well as unethical decision-making in organizations. Bill number four, the whereas and mere, uh, mere pleading recitals to justify a framework of control that already exists to impose further regulations based on made-up science and fiction, as in the Wizard of Oz, in order to advance the Global Agenda 2030. Bill 9, the amendment of object and purpose of the Crown Lands Act 114 to create the framework and alignment to modify the use of the restrictions of use or the restrictions of use based on the assumptions in Bill 4. The purpose of Bill 4 and 9 are as both state are fundamentally to use and govern biodiversity and organisms in the province held under human control or in nature, but also represents the model to be rolled out across Canada to facilitate a biosecurity state as part of Agenda 2030. Plainly put, what this means that if the minister decides because it has a bad hair day, pets are bad, granny loses her companion, or goes to jail, or gets fined, or loses her home. In nature, the creation of a pathogen narrative or bio threat and allow through this Bill 4 and 9 the destruction and repurposing of private and crown lands, also called community development and tourism, turning forests and food production into hotels and golf courses. Nature, as in biodiversity, is self regulating and is not, if not messed with, and does not need governance by men or corporate bodies. The so-called invasive species introduced or naturally through wildlife migration and weather into a healthy ecosystem will naturally let regulate and balance based on the environmental conditions given. There has been many incidents where governments introduced on purpose beetle species to threaten and control many valuable herbs. The approach this legislator has taken in the rollout of Bill 409 has shown that this government cannot be trusted. Public records clearly show that this government has been permitting the controlling of biodiversity through mass aerial herbicide and pesticide spraying programs, including in provincial parks and watersheds. These spray operations take place without the public's full knowledge and understanding. It is a fact that aerial spraying can be extremely hazardous to wildlife, the population, and the foods we grow near the spray zones. I am rejecting Bill 4 and Bill 9. Both must die. With the recent public backtracking of the liberals and the handlers in the mainstream propaganda media, the public must understand that there is a greater agenda at work that requires for the Bill 4 and 9 to be passed. Once passed, no matter of an added clause to review after five years, the only way to repeal a bill is how it is created. Let's remember the two weeks flat in the curve scenario that has now turned into over a year, showing us a perfect example of what Bill 4 and 9 can look like. By removal of, par uh, of parts of Article 7 of Bill 4, Section K, as in can be easily misused, you have added the same back in now reading as Article 8, Section A. This act in its entirety cannot exist in a free society. I am rejecting Bill 4 and Bill 9. Both must die. The revision shows a removal of 60% of the original table bill, but still insists on keeping a bill in place that shows an alternative, undisclosed agenda. For greater clarity to myself and the public, I request truthful and honest answers to the following questions in writing within 21 days. Days. A, who, as in person or organization, mandated Bill 4 and 9, if not this legislature? B, do you agree, since this legislature was mandated by an undisclosed, unknown, unelected body, the province of Nova Scotia has lost its independent governance? C, do you agree? 
that Bill 4 and Bill 9 gives unlimited power to regulate and control organisms, including humans alike, without the requirements of actual scientific proof and without remedy for the population. D, where does the minister draw his authority from to seize private real property that has exclusive rights awarded to the detailed and property owner? E, do you agree that Nova Scotians have not been told and not given the free choice to decide whether or not to be a part of the ongoing restructuring of the local political framework and laws and to align them with the geopolitical rollout of a one-world government, also called New World Order, under the guise of Build Back Better? It is time that the public realizes that the true threat to biodiversity comes from corporations, NGOs, and governments, which are all equally for profit traded corporations. It is time that the public needs to understand that politicians and CEOs, or CEOs of corporations are hiding behind dead entities or fictions, also called corporate fictions. A corporate corporation without the actions performed by politicians or CEOs is just that, a dead end entity or fiction. Yet the actions of the politicians and CEOs are what cause the harm and injury through coercion and governance. It is time that you are held accountable personally for your actions and behavior, accountable personally and liable to your families, your kids, and potential grandkids, accountable personally and liable to your community, neighbors, and friends. To finish, once you leave this legislature and finish your agenda that you are being used for, you will become equally bound by the framework you are trying to impose and put in place. I am rejecting Bill 4 and number 9. Both must die. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Freitzel. Um, open to questions. Two minutes remaining. If any of my colleagues have questions. There appear to be no questions from committee members. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. The next presenter is Ms. Kathy Lawrence. We don't appear to have anybody in the waiting room, but I see. Would we have a uh, Tony Lawrence that would be our next presenter after Kathy? I'm hearing that we do not have either uh, Kathy nor Tony Lawrence, who would be scheduled at 345 and 355. Do we have uh, Mayor Murray Scott from the municipality of Cumberland? No. All right. Uh, maybe if... Uh, at this point, maybe if Ledge TV uh, wants to just put us on a, a brief recess, if, if my colleagues would just stay close by in case uh, any of those three presenters, Kathy, Tony, or Mayor Murray Scott, uh, join uh, the Zoom session. Um, perhaps Ledge Council could let me know if they arrive, and I'll uh, call our colleagues back to order. Um, but if we do not hear by uh, 4.05, um, then uh, you know we'll we'll come back just to uh, secure our, our four fifteen break.
Mayor and uh, invite uh, Mr. Uh, Mayor Murray Scott to join our presentation. Mr. Scott, welcome to uh, Law Amendments Committee. Uh, we're discussing Bill Number Four, Biodiversity Act. Uh, you'll have ten minutes uh, to present a total uh, five-minute presentation, five minutes for Q and A. Um, I'll give a one-minute warning at the nine-minute mark if you're still presenting, just so that you know uh, the, if you want to wrap up to provide uh, at least some time for question. And with that, I'll uh, turn the floor over to you, uh, Mayor Scott. Uh, thank you, Minister. Can you hear me? Hear you fine. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, staff, and uh, members of the Nova Scotia Legislature Law Amendments Committee uh, for the opportunity to speak today in regards to Bill 4, the Biodiversity Act. As you know, I'm the mayor of the municipality of Cumberland, and I'm also a former member of this house. Um, the, uh, the Cumberland Forest Advisory Committee and our council share concerns over the intent of Bill 4. Uh, the speed at which it's being pa passed through the process, the inability for Nova Scotia to share their concerns, and especially during these very diff different and difficult times. Cumberland County is, is unique, is a unique area in Nova Scotia. It's the second largest county by mass in the province with a population of approximately 30,000 people. And with those res residents spread across this broad landscape, there are approximately 13,000 households and 5,000 temporary residents in our county. The areas developed around the coastline and within, within communities of this large district. Our county is rich in beauty and blessed with resources and very, very much potential. That potential is unharnessed because of a decreasing population and need for new monetary and human investment in our communities. There are approximately 13,000 workers in total in the county of Cumberland. Resource-based industries are still prominent and include mining, fishing, forestry, and agriculture operations. Approximately 1,200 people of the 13,000 workers in the county work in some resource-based industry. Almost 9% of the working population is directly involved in these fields. That is very significant to the economy of our area. With the declining population and many people working in the resource-based economy, our county feels that the results of legislative decisions and regulations are as much, if not more, than any impact in our area. On average, 20% of all wood harvested in Nova Scotia comes out of Cumberland County. Forestry is important in Cumberland County and has a long, long, rich history. Many areas are dependent on these jobs and many families have been involved in the civil culture business for generations. Looking after woodlots, some are larger holdings, some are smaller, but looking after those to many of these families are second nature. Just to speak to the credibility of these individuals and families, one only has to look at how quickly these folks came to the assistance of families, communities, and the County of Cumberland during many, many times of need. Hospital construction, for example, was one of those times when they more than played their part to make these facilities uh, uh, realities in the rural area. Familiar names like Harrison and Hoyk, among many others, are well known in the industry in Cumberland and throughout the province of Nova Scotia. We believe these individuals and all stakeholders need to be front and center in all talks when it comes to the future of forestry and the management of all lands, both public and private in Nova Scotia. The forestry industry, as we know, has and is facing many challenges. Concerns they have regarding levels of fines and what determines an emergency under this act, we believe are legitimate and need to be addressed. Agriculture in Cumberland County has vast potential and with large unoccupied areas it is ripe for growth. Creating food security and new opportunities of growth are key to our future. Government legislation can either create or discourage opportunities. Mr. Chair, we are proud people with a great heritage and many and may have some of the greatest opportunities in our province right here in Cumberland County. But we're at a disadvantage without partnership and communication from the government. Creating new laws and regulations along with restrictions without consultation will create a great deal of uncertainty in our communities. Cumber County has long been interested in creating a greener economy. I was part of a government that brought forth the Environmental Goals and Sustainability Act. I can remember what it took to pass such a groundbreaking piece of legislation. It took time, energy, and an understanding by all partners of how this legislation would affect the future of Nova Scotia. 
members of the legislature, stakeholders, and Nova Scotians were involved in the process. Because that trust was built, this legislation was passed unanimously with support and to the credit of all three parties. Involving all stakeholders can and will lead to laws in Nova Scotia that are good for everyone. It can be done, but it has to be given a chance. We should never underestimate the ability of Nova Scotians to do what is right for their province and our children. Trust needs to be created between the people and the government for a better understanding of how new legislation and regulations affect landowners and stakeholders of our province. I believe we need to create more openness and transparency and to invite all stakeholders to the table so that we can all have a fuller understanding of Bill 4. I've heard many concerns regarding how this bill may affect landowners, large and small. There's a great deal of confusion. The intent of this legislation, while still not clear to me, may be necessary. However, without consultation and a full understanding by all the people whom it will affect, this creates mistrust. People deserve more time and better understanding. While amendments have been announced, and we applaud that, and we thank you for that, more work still needs to be done. Many questions like what effect will Bill 4 have on present leases with the Crown, where fruit production, maple syrup production, Crown lot lease for recreational camps that are currently placed, what impact will that have? What about outdoor trails and Crown land for recreational use, such as those in place for Adfans and Sands? Are these in jeopardy? The economy in Carmel is very much dependent upon these services and pastimes and would be greatly negatively impacted by any loss. Perhaps there are no issues of concern here, but without consultation, again, there's a lot of confusion. My experience in working with people in my careers is it's all about communication. We cannot put in place actions or a threat of large fines without an understanding of the issues and or the facts. However, in this situation, it's concerning when so many people have come to us and have no idea of what exactly the intent or purpose of this legislation is and what impact it may have on their livelihood. I think it's incumbent upon government to work collaboratively with all stakeholders. Cumberland County residents want collaboration and partnership to create a better future. This does not come when they have not been consulted with or feel their points of view have not been heard. And this will and should include all Nova Scotians with all different points of view. I would suggest a period of six months would give this government the ability to properly consult with stakeholders. As well, we would suggest government form a stakeholder committee such as the advisory committee that was formed for the Endangered Species Act. So the minister would have the benefit of the most current and updated information to make those choices and decisions in the future. In closing, I'd like to read a short letter I received from a young Cumber County resident who is fearful for the future of her family's operation. And again, without the proper information, creates a lot of uncertainty. And she writes, and it was with her permission that I read this. She writes, my name is Tracy Bowden. I'm writing on behalf of my father, Neil Ripley, and our family. We are a fourth generation family of maple syrup producers in Cumberland County. We are very concerned regarding the Biodiversity Act, Bill 4, and how this bill will affect our small family business and our private land. We feel much more information and time is needed. Information in writing and time to fully understand its contents. We feel this bill should not come to a final vote till these things are provided to everyone concerned. And she signs it very concerned, Nova Scotians, Tracy Bowden, Neil R. Ripley. Finally, I know Bill 4 may not have any impact on any of this or many other concerns we have heard. However, without the proper consultation, understanding and input, it's causing Nova Scotians like Tracy to question legislative impacts on her as a Nova Scotian and her business that's been in her family for many, many years. Again, I'd like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Uh, it's this very important issue and it's very important to uh, the residents of Cumberland County and our council from the municipality of Cumberland. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Scott. Uh, with just under two minutes uh, remaining, any questions for my colleagues? Uh, Ms. Roberts is up first. Thank you so much. Uh, Mayor Scott, you, you mentioned the Cumberland Forest Advisory Committee that I, I know you serve on, as do two members of, of this committee, Emily uh, smith McCrossan and, and Emily Rushton. Um, that, that committee is, is listed as one of the supporters of the Coalition of Concerned Private Landowners. And I'm just wondering, uh, you know, what, what led you in your deliberations in that committee to, to decide to participate in and, and support the ads and the information campaign related to, to Bill 4? You know, it, it really speaks to a, a level of distrust. Uh, 
Mistrust to whom? Well, I guess in the, I guess uh, in in the government, you know, or, or somehow. I mean, the the Biodiversity Act was talked about in 2019, and it was talked about in the Natural Resources Strategy, as well. So this isn't completely a surprise that there would be legislation. Um, but but yeah, I, I would like more insight into. Uh, I, I guess into the formation of that coalition and into the decision of, of the committee that you serve on to support it. For the advisory committee itself, um, that was formed as a result of, as you know, decisions in regards to uh, Northern Pulp and, and it brought together a lot of uh, stakeholders in this area to try to find ways to, to alleviate some of those issues, concerns they were facing. Um, the, uh, as I mentioned earlier in my comments, uh, there's a large portion of our population that's involved in, in the resource-based industries, whether it's mining, fishing, farming, uh, forestry. Um, we, uh, you're right, um, we, we are part of that organization. Um, we, as I said as well, we've seen so many benefits from uh, those in, in the industry in, in our county that, that speaks so much to the credibility of them. Um, I've had discussion in the last few days as a result of our decision to come here today from, from folks who feel very strongly towards, towards the bill itself. And uh, after we've had a discussion about it, there's a common theme in all this, and that is the fact there's two things. One is that the seems, this bill seems to be being pushed through within a, within a couple of weeks of being announced, uh, I think 11th or 12th. And the other thing is that the inability, particularly in COVID times, for citizens of Nova Scotia that have input, no matter how you feel about the issue. So I, I think that, as I said about the Sustainability Act, um, I think at the end of the day, if you involve citizens, if you involve the communities, if you involve uh, stakeholders throughout, throughout the province, involve the three parties, make some decisions around this bill. I feel at the end of the day, a good bill can be derived from this that will be supported by all, and that will be to the benefit of all Nova Scotians, not just uh, um, the uh, one side of it. Thank you, Mayor Scott. Uh, time has elapsed and we've reached our moment of interruption. Uh, we'll be recessing for 15 minutes uh, back at 4.30 for our next presenter, uh, Mr. Hugh McIsaac. Thank you very much to the committee.
we do have quorum. Uh, so our next. Presenter, uh, that would be Mr. Hugh McIsaac. Uh, do we have uh, Hugh online? It's Hugh online. Uh, I see the name, but uh, he's muted. Mr. McIsaac, uh, are you there? You can unmute and just confirm. Mark might need a room. Mr. McIsaac, I see you're off mute. Are you able to uh, connect? Um, yes, hello. Hello. Perfect. We've got your audio coming through now, Mr. McIsaac. Uh, welcome to the Law Amendments Committee. Uh, we're discussing uh, Bill Number 4, the Biodiversity Act. You'll have uh, 10 minutes, five for presentation and five for Q&A. Uh, if your presentation goes long, I will give a, a warning at uh, the one minute mark. Uh, that is nine minutes uh, into your presentation, should you wish to concede time for uh, questions. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to you, uh, beginning now. Uh, yes, uh, look, I was hoping I'd be able to get on by, vi by video as well, uh, and I've been trying to do so. Uh, seems to have worked um, other days. <laughs> Doesn't seem to be working today. Um, I can't. I, I'm not able. I'm not seeing anything here that helps me just try to uh, get the video going here. Uh, so I'm. We I'm, are hearing you fine, though. Hearing fine. <clears throat> okay. Perhaps we can work that way. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I listened to some of the previous uh, presentations here, and um, some of them are. Uh, show a lot of um, difference in how people are looking at this entire situation. I've also read all the articles that were written uh, since some last Thursday or Wednesday or whenever they, they start coming out. <clears throat> and I can see the various uh, perspectives on the, the uh, issue that is being dealt with. Um, I, want, I just want to say that, um, first of all, I'm from the Port Hotsbury area and uh, I owned land along with, uh, with another family member as uh, jointly, and uh, our land was uh, granted to, in 1861. And uh, my, my people, my family have lived on it uh, from uh, probably from 1880 uh, to the present, my grandfather and my father. My father was born in 1905. <clears throat> and uh, he, uh, dealt, he lived on the land and uh, we, our entire family made our living on the land. And um, in our family, there were uh, nine, nine family members. I had um, <clears throat> um, one of them died young, and uh, the others said uh, there were eight boys and one girl altogether. And so my father had a lot of uh, young people to help out <clears throat> when, they time, when they got of some age. And we even had a sawmill on the property. And uh, the forest, the forestry was the sole means of, uh, of our living. Um, the, I, I see some indications of people, you know, who have come into the province only recently. And also I've seen a presentation by a very younger person too, 
I, I believe everyone tends to take a pretty different perspective on things. Uh, my, my own parents uh, had to work very hard on the land. Uh, it was, it was uh, difficult years in the 1920s and the 1930s. And uh, most of the family are, were born in the 19, 1930s and 40s. And um, these were hard years, and there was a lot of hardship in the, in the work. Uh, all of this, however, has uh, given us, given every one of us, a very strong attachment to the land. And um, we, we depended on it for a living. I think that is an important fact, too, with respect to some of the people you've been hearing from. Uh, I don't think many of them <laughs> that it is a, so, it is a sole uh, source of their income. Uh, that can mean a lot. Uh, even through all the years that, they, that uh, their family had to live on the land, and uh, it was their source, it was their sole source of, uh, of income. Uh, it was, um, these were very difficult years, and as I say, uh, it, it gives a person an entirely different uh, perspective on, on the land. Uh, so we still, my parents are deceased, and uh, we, my, I have uh, five brothers who are deceased. And uh, we are, I, I am the brother who owns the land. Uh, we are the sole owners of the land at this time. Um, we feel that we have taken good care of the land all through, these, all through those years. Uh, this land is uh, presently uh, populated with um, large groves of uh, hardwood and also very large groves of softwood. And uh, there has been very little cutting, I might say, over the past 30 years. So there is, we are actually at the point where uh, there is, there are very mature stands, and uh, these can be cut uh, now and uh, should be cut within the next several years. Uh, we feel that um, the family as a whole, we have taken very good care of the land. Uh, we do not feel that we need uh, the government to walk in and tell us how to deal with our own woodlot. Um, this. Uh, it does not seem that it would be, you know, why would we be inviting the government in to tell us how to uh, do the cutting on the land when we have, when it has been done for uh, 60 years and uh, the land is in very good shape and um, there is no, there's nothing, uh, I, I don't see that uh, having government to regulations is going to make uh, that situation any better. Um, I also listen to um, what so many others are saying, and uh, know that I, I've looked at some data uh, you know, on the land ownership, uh, not only in Nova Scotia but uh, elsewhere. Uh, it is true, and I perceive, I, I believe that <clears throat> uh, thirty percent of the land is publicly owned in Nova Scotia, and uh, seventy percent is privately owned, and uh, that. Um, a large part of the the, the entire entirety of uh, Nova Scotia is uh, populated with uh, forest. I think it is something like uh, at least seventy five percent. Of course, this is a good thing, uh, having a good forest and having uh, having a, um, a large forest area uh, is 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 good and good for the environment as a whole. Uh, I've looked at other uh, other statistics as well. Uh, the uh, Natural Resources Canada uh, says that uh, 94 percent of forest forestry land in Canada is publicly owned, and uh, and uh, only only the only six percent of it is um, privately owned. Now this is a that's a very large area of uh, public land. And uh, I'm, I'm reading from uh, a, a figures put out by the government of Canada, uh, where it actually recites this. So the majority of Canada's forest lands, about 94%, is pu publicly owned and managed by provincial, territorial, and federal governments. Only 6% of Canada's forest land is privately owned. This, And it goes on to make a statement, the following statement, which I think is a quite interesting. This means that all those jurisdictions, provincial, territorial, and federal, together have the ability to create and enforce the laws, regulations, and policies required to meet Canada's commitment to sustainable forest management across the country. So, in other words, with, by the use of the public lands. Um, the uh, <clears throat> amount of land in Nova Scotia 
uh, that is forested, I'm, I'm being told it's about 4.20 million hectares. And the amount of forested land in, in, in Canada is uh, 347 uh, million hectares of forested land. This compared to Nova Scotia, the whole of Canada, that, that it is only about one, it is a little better than 1% of uh, the land area, the forested land area is to be found in Nova Scotia. A little better than 1%. I've made, I've done the figures 420 uh, million hectares as compared to 347 million hectares. Um, so it is somewhat astonishing to me that with, with this much uh, public forested land available for the for governments uh, to uh, implement uh, for forest new forest management uh, uh, policies and rules uh, that you have to come back and uh, um, direct your attention to the small quantity of uh, privately owned land that is in Nova Scotia. It's, it's amazing that uh, there is not enough uh, the, uh, territory there to implement policies that will help Canada, just as, the, as that particular statement says, uh, meet its uh, commitment to sustainable forest management. <clears throat> also, this, this act is, I'm sorry, are we still there? Yes, still uh, on, uh, with about a minute 14 left. Okay, uh, I'm a little surprised again too that uh, the, the province of Nova Scotia has had uh, a number of years now since the Leahy, Leahy report uh, to have implemented uh, plenty of uh, policies on the public lands. And uh, it seems that that has not been done and that, that is what uh, some of the groups are complaining about. Um, I don't see that by adding the, the, the private lands into that mix, if you haven't been able to uh, put forth policies uh, on the public lands uh, and, and you haven't developed those and you haven't applied those, then adding, adding more land to the mix at this stage, I don't see it's going to do any, make things any better. I think it is better for the province to deal with the public lands and uh, implement the, the, the various new processes that you have outlined in your act and deal with the public lands. And when you have developed uh, uh, successful procedures there, uh, then come back and talk to, to the private landowners and also take us, take us and show it, show it. There's lots of video that can be done these days. It can be made available in all local communities and you can show the people uh, what has been done and how it has worked on your, on your public lands. And uh, this will be a, a situation where people can actually see it and see success see that there has been success on the public lands and will be far more ready to deal with uh, uh, their own lands and perhaps uh, um, look at these policies that, uh, that have been successful. All right, thank you, uh, Mr. McIsaac. Um, that uh, that exceeds the uh, the 10 minutes uh, total uh, allotted. Uh, you provided a lot of information to the committee. Uh, I appreciate that, but unfortunately, there's no time remaining for uh, questions. Um, thank you for taking the time to share your uh, input. Uh, our next uh, presenter is Mr. Jason Stewart. Mr. Stewart, I believe you're connected into the main meeting now. If you unmute and uh, you can turn on your video as well. How's that? Thank you, Ms. That's great. Here you're fine. Uh, thank you for joining us, Mr. Stewart. It's uh, Law Amendments Committee and discussing Bill Number no. Four, Biodiversity Act. Uh, you'll have ten minutes in total. Generally, five minutes for presentation, five minutes for Q and A. Uh, I will uh, give you a one-minute warning uh, if you continue your presentation, just uh, so you're aware. If there's only one minute left, uh, should you wish to uh, cede the remaining time for questions. With that, I'll turn it over to you. Good. Good afternoon, members of the Law Amendment Committee. I'm pleased to be able to share my thoughts and concerns on the topic of the proposed Biodiversity Act, Bill 4. I came to know the Biodiversity Act through my profession as a forester and bluebird farm manager working for Bragg Lumber Company. Bragg Lumber is a forestry and farming company in the Cumberland County area, Nova Scotia. 
uh, from the company perspective, they're represented on the agricultural side by the Federation of Agriculture and the uh, Wild Blueberry Producers Association on the forestry side by Forest Nova Scotia and the, uh, as well as a large private landowner group. So my presentation today is more uh, on a, from a personal perspective as a, as a registered professional forester, a landowner and uh, rural Nova Scotia. I enjoy rural life and downtime in the outdoors uh, by hunting uh, or camping, dirt biking, and spending time with my wife, Andrew, and three sons. So uh, on the topic of the biodiversity, from the onset, from the first version of the Biodiversity Act, Bill 116, consultation has failed to reach all stakeholders. While many that use the forest in some way for the profession seem to be aware of the act, most Nova Scotians are oblivious to the potential impacts of this act. I have an example of this on both sides of my family. My parents and my wife's parents both hold land and use it for recreational walks, gardening, firewood, income from blueberries and forest products, and to live on. Neither set of parents realized there was a Biodiversity Act until it was in the first reading and it made the news. They were very upset at the thought of potentially having limitations placed on their lands or being fined for unknowingly hurting an organism or an organism defined in the act. Obviously, they were not involved in any type of consultation. Thinking of hiking, camping, and ATV use, have all the stakeholders been consulted properly? I believe the public perceives this to be mainly a forestry issue, when in fact, it affects anyone that uses land for any purpose, and especially those of us that live and play in rural areas. There is. Adding a biodiversity management zone could potentially cut off or fragment hiking trails to waterfalls, ATV trails, or limit activities in provincial parks and beaches. Adequate consultation has not been provided to all stakeholders in my mind. Looking at where we are now, I would say the trend is continuing. In a recent release from the Premier's office on March 23rd, the scope of the act has been limited to Crown land and to private land uh, on a voluntary only basis. Um, and uh, fines reduced or eliminated. Well, this is a step in the right direction. At the time this presentation was written, there were no details on how the voluntary agreement would work. In fact, the revised act had not been published at all at the time I wrote this. At present, we are at law amendments proceeding along the path to pass the bill and the latest version of the act has not been made public. What is the rush? Why not take time to let all Nova Scotians read and fully understand the proposed act and its implications? If the authors of the proposed act are more transparent, providing details, regulations, and education, there may be more, and there would be more particip participation, buy-in, and certainly less fear of the worst case scenarios. As a potential alternative to creating a new act to protect biodiversity, we should consider amending and adding reg regulations to existing acts that govern what takes place on the land and water in Nova Scotia. We currently have over 18 acts to regulate what we do in Nova Scotia on land, including Conversation, Conservation Act, Crown Lands Act, Endangered Species Act, Environment Act, Forest Enhancement Act, Forest Act. Anyways, the list goes on. Uh, in the interest of time, we'll read them all. In addition to that, there's acts that control what we do around brooks, lakes, and oceans, such as the Water Act, Coastal Protection Act, Fisheries Act, and Oceans Act. In section two of the proposed Biodiversity Act, the purpose states that the act is to provide for stewardship, conservation, sustainable use and governance of the biodiversity in the province. I think this is a noble goal, one that we should strive to achieve as a province, but I wonder could it be done by adding to regulations or modifying acts that we currently have in place. This may also address the issue of stakeholder engagement as it would involve a wide range of stakeholders that may be affected by the aforementioned acts. It's my understanding that there are changes tabled for the Crown Lands Act at this time. I would suggest that the Department of Lands and Forestry consider reviewing all legislation to make the appropriate changes to reflect the goal of biodiversity, similar to the changes being made to the Crown Lands Act. In summary, it's my wish that the Department of Lands and Forestry consider shelving uh, the Biodiversity Act and amending existing leg legislation to reflect the protection of biodiversity in the province. This is not possible for some reason. I think as a minimum, the Biodiversity Act should be amended with the most recent changes, including regulations provided to all stakeholders in their entirety for review and feedback before going forward to the third reading of the bill. Thank you for, 
for your time. Thank you, uh, Mr. Stewart. Uh, with about four and a half minutes remaining uh, for questions, uh, I'll turn the floor to my colleagues if there are any questions. Mr. Burrell. Uh, yes, thanks, Mr. Stewart, for this explanation. I'm just uh, wanting to follow up on your point about consultation. Am I understanding you right that, in your view, the consultation has been so lacking that the bill should actually be withdrawn and the uh, consultation process should begin again? I, I think uh, from the people that I've talked to, I guess, and, uh, and specifically my family, who who've been on land and held land in Nova Scotia. Yeah, uh, I don't see why we should, and it's not just the consultation process, that's certainly the biggest part of it, but uh, uh, why would we not look at all of the legislation that we have now, which is, is good, um, that pertains to the protection of forest land and water and, uh, and strengthen it to protect biodiversity? Why, why start from scratch? Thank you. And um, Ms. Smith McCresson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you to Mr. Stewart for presenting to us today. I think that you've brought forth a very practical, common sense approach to the biodiversity, and um, I've heard from many others that, that share your view. And uh, so I just want to say thank you for, for presenting to us today. Welcome. Okay. All right, I'm not seeing any other. Oh, Ms. Chender. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mr. Stewart, for presenting today. Um, and I hear your concerns. And as my colleagues have said, we've, we've heard those concerns. You mentioned the many acts that are already on the books that, that regulate the natural environment. And I'm wondering if you have had cause to have your land really negatively impacted by any of those acts. So, um, you know, the things that we are hearing might come to pass in terms of, you know, breaking up land, not being able to use it recreationally, all the, um, the kind of fears that are being stated. Have you experienced any of that happening from the acts that are currently in force? Um, no, I don't think so. Uh, you know, we've had things affect the lands um, being broke up uh, through uh, division, uh, being divided up into different pigs, whether it's a road or brook or things like that. But uh, no, um, I wouldn't say anything's, uh, there's been things that have affected the land, like the, the wildlife regulations and, and things like that, but nothing has been, uh, that has affected it terribly. Um, and uh, nothing is, nothing that we've seen is, is a, as alarming as some of the things that could take place in the Biodiversity Act. Or so, so we, that's what we interpret it. I guess that's the big thing. It's so vague in places that you fear the worst, whether it's going to be true or not. Yeah, and I understand that confusion, Mr. Chair. Just a quick follow-up, um, I guess. Uh, just did Ms. smith McCawson, did you have your hand up? Sorry, Ms. Gender. Uh, Ms. smith McCawson. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair, and and thank you for for um, for responding to that, Mr. Stewart. I think, you know, one of the things that I've heard you say is that there is already existing acts in place that regulations could be um, modified to include more biodiversity. But this Biodiversity Act, as presented, is extremely vague, and as we know, biodiversity affects all human activity and and affects all things to your point. So nothing has ever threatened um, threatened our land and water to the extent of this Biodiversity Act. I'm just curious if you would agree with that. Yes, I would, I would have to agree with that. I mean, the acts that we've worked with now have been in place for some of them for some time, and uh, they seem to be, um, you know, haven't had any adverse effects. So yes, I would agree with that. All right, uh, only about 10 seconds left, uh, Ms. Chender, if you still wanted to try to squeeze one. All right, Mr. Stewart, uh, thank you for joining us and sharing your uh, perspective on bill number four. Thank you. Our next presenter is Ms. Stacy Carroll.
Ms. Carroll, I believe you're connected if you want to unmute your mic and uh, if you want to turn on your video. Hi, thank we, you very much. It just took perfect. me a second to unmute and That's I will great. video if I figure out start video. Perfect. Hello. Welcome Hello, to everyone. Lo Welcome to the Law Amendments Committee, uh, Ms. Uh, Carroll. Uh, you'll have uh, 10 minutes uh, to present, uh, usually five for presentation, five for Q&A. Uh, but uh, if you do go long, I will do a one minute warning at the nine minute mark, just uh, in case uh, you wanna make sure there's time for a question, but you can proceed fully through if you wish. And with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. And hello, everyone. And as you know, my name is Stacy Carroll, and I'm really grateful for this opportunity to speak to you today. Uh, I know you've had a lot of feedback to digest already, so I don't wish to be critical or redundant. Uh, just to give a, you a snapshot of my background and experience, uh, my education is in soil and water chemistry, forestry, and holistic health sciences. I'm a sole proprietor of a forest and rural community consultation company that specializes in woodlot management, silviculture, food forest production, and small business enhancement. I'm proudly Algonquin of Pickwaknagon and have been thriving in rural Nova Scotia since 1999 after growing up on an island in, in Lake Ontario. When I was first involved in the biodiversity consultation process, it was named Build 116. I was representing private forest owners on the provincial and federal level at that time. And today I'm mostly wanting to present as a person who has a diverse experience in education in many avenues of life, as well as being a person who came today equipped with feedback from my general community. What I first wanted to speak to is that I do believe that all Nova Scotians want to support, protect, and enhance biodiversity once they understand what that is even referring to. So biodiversity by definition, as you know, is a variety of plant and animal life in the world or, or in a particular habitat of which a high level is usually considered to be important or desirable. So what is the biodiversity then? And who gets to define what this is for Nova Scotia? Do we have the baseline metrics? Who defines what is important or desirable? And should these decisions be based on science as opposed to politics? Knowing that, should something so broadly defined be considered a law? A law, as I'm sure you are aware, is meant for specific regulatory level decisions. Laws are set standards, principles, and procedures that must be followed in society. Law is mainly made for implementing justice within the society, while a law is framed for bringing justice to that society, a policy is framed for achieving certain goals. So why would we not start at the policy level when we're speaking about something so broad? Policy also means that uh, means what a government does not intend to do. It also evolves the principles that we that are needed for achieving the goal. Policies are only documents and not law, but these policies can lead to new laws. Once we as Nova Scotians study and understand these baseline metrics behind what can be or not be considered biodiverse, then I believe at that point we may, at that point we should consider the laws surrounding these uh, and surrounding the implementation of, of these to enhance support and increase our biodiversity in pertinent applications. I feel at the policy level, we have the opportunity to do just that as Nova Scotians, and especially in areas of development, land use transfer, construction, et cetera. So right now, I guess I would like to just acknowledge the big elephant in the room, as I would like to refer to is by saying that the most drastic and fast paced and permanent loss of biodiversity is within urban ecosystems. If one was to take a drive behind Bears Lake or other industrial parks in one of our many towns and cities within Nova Scotia alone, you will cease to see wildlife areas, much of a shade structure or habitat of any kind. What we see is permanently covered soil and large resource drains and a lack of biodiversity that even requires rainwater collection and management to utilize further resources just to divert and not even utilize this rainwater. This worries me most as a human, as a citizen of Nova Scotia, and as a habitat enhancer by trade. Urban, space, urban spaces provide the opportunity for Nova Scotians to focus on an ecosystem that will increase and enhance biodiversity as well in, as increase carbon sequestration through afforestation, which is the transfer of areas of non-forest into forest. 
development for human urban habitat needs to be drastically changed to ensure we continue to address immediate biodiversity loss even before we consider enhancing other areas. Increasing the biodiversity with industrial parks, backyard landscapes, and fringe lands around urban settings will have the most impact in combating climate crisis temperatures by providing shade structures and canopy cover. Increasing habitat where we now have pavement, gravel, and monoculture landscapes will allow natural species of trees, shrubs, plants, fauna, and fungus to flourish, while at the same time potentially providing foods and medicines to human, animal, invertebrate, and insect inhabitants. Through the educational structures that are already present, we have an opportunity to further study and increase and increase learning at almost every grade level. That can be peer reviewed and provide metrics to, pr to move us forward as a province in the biodiversity conversation. And there is an opportunity for such projects through the upcoming 2 billion tree program that is encouraging nature-based solutions to climate crisis. This opens many doors for our future. So there I wanted to just cut myself off because I know that there may be lots of questions that the committee might have. I, I know that you've taken in a lot of information today, so I just wanted to stop there and maybe um, encourage a conversation with the committee. Perfect. Thank you very much. With about uh, four and a half minutes uh, remaining, I'll turn the floor to my colleagues if there are any questions. Ms. De Costenzo. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and, and thank you, Ms. Uh, uh, Stacy. Uh, actually, as you were speaking, I, I have visited the waterfront in Oakville, Ontario, and they have done something amazing, in my opinion, in encouraging these um, plants and uh, to, to attract uh, bees, to attract birds. It, it is done in a beautiful way with a lot of uh, <clears throat> concrete, but also amazing things for uh, the environment. So I, I was really impressed. And as you were speaking, I'm assuming that's what you're referring to. I don't know if you know about it and if you can let us know more about this uh, waterfront in Oakville, Ontario. I'm actually not familiar with that uh, development in itself, but I am very worried about uh, as our, our continued urban sprawl, I think that biodiversity is one thing that gets overlooked. So I'm, I'm very encouraged to hear about this project and I would be happy to discuss these things with, with anyone else who wants to talk about development and biodiversity going hand in hand. Thank you. I'm not seeing any other members. Oh, Mr. Burrow. Well, well, thanks, Ms. Kerr, for this uh, explanation. I, and uh, so just following from it then, uh, what are some of the suggestions that come out of uh, your reasoning uh, for how Nova Scotia could best enhance uh, the biodiversity of the province? To best, well, my focus today has been really just speaking about the most drastic loss of biodiverse ecosystems within development development areas. And as Nova Scotia continues to encourage the development here, I really want that to be part of the basis of our conversation around biodiversity loss. I also think that it's important to do within, well, not important to do within urban systems, but the benefits to doing it within urban systems uh, is that we have educational systems, uh, colleges, universities that are already present in these areas so that we can start collecting baseline data to ensure that we are increasing our biodiversity and getting baseline data on what, what it actually is. Like, ha have we collected this information to see how biodiverse Nova Scotia actually is? I'm not sure about the answer to that. But these uh, areas, as we as we sprawl out, are, are most alarming to me as a loss of biodiversity. I think that some things that could be considered, uh, I work with a company who currently now is very active in ob open air learning spaces. So they are trying to increase uh, the amount of educational spaces in the outdoors, which I think is very pertinent in the time that we're in as far as uh, the pandemic goes. Um, it, it provides an opportunity for uh, hands-on learning I also think that intergenerational learning can happen within this, this landscape as well. So if we're looking at doing some very advanced studies, I think you could see learning opportunities 
between primary and grade 12, all the way up to university level education and doing this cross-generational learning where we could have some high level education facility members, students, uh, putting together programming for young students as well. I think that within an educational system, we have the most opportunity. I know some of the statistics, uh, if you excite a child between the ages of nine to 13, that they will go on and increase, uh, they will go on to, um, whether, they're, what, whether they study something else or not, they, they return to what they learn between the ages of nine to 13. So for me, that really uh, provides a great opportunity. You know, we, we can look at different things. Uh, I myself have been involved in food forest farming. So I do that in currently um, more of a rural setting, but I think that, that that sort of thing can be transferred within an urban setting. And um, I, I even think about, I've been very involved in forest management for, for almost 24 years now. And some of the new things that were coming out, the triad model of um, ecosystem forest management, I even think about doing that in a backyard application. So maybe we could encourage people who live in urban settings to take a third of their yard and start turning it back into natural spaces. I think that's a, a very easy way to start for, for citizens as a whole. Uh, I also see the opportunity through the 2 billion tree program coming out. I know that they are going to be encouraging nurseries to expand their, their business operations. So we can be looking at not just native species. There's lots of studies that show that with uh, climate change coming forward, that our species that are able to survive here are changing. Uh, there is science behind that. We can also think about increasing food spaces within urban systems as well. So providing free food uh, for people who perhaps, well, just, I mean, anyone can eat the free food. It doesn't necessarily mean that they have to be, um, sorry, I'm, I'm sort of getting off. I hope, Mr. Well, Burl, that I'm answering, answering your question for you. <laughs> and time, time has uh, just elapsed there as well a little bit. Uh, Ms. Carroll, I really appreciate uh, the insights uh, that you shared uh, with the committee members, um, but uh, we do have uh, a number more to uh, work our way through. Thank you for uh, your feedback on Bill 4, the Biodiversity Act. Thank you very much. The next uh, presenter is uh, Mr. Uh, Jeff Stewart, the Deputy Mayor. Mr. Stewart, uh, there you are. Mr. Stewart, are you with us? Yes, I am. All right, uh, so uh, 10 minutes uh, for uh, presentation, usually five minutes presentation, five minutes for Q&A, uh, but I will uh, give a one minute warning at the nine minute mark if you're still presenting, uh, just so you have the option uh, to get a couple of questions in if you wish. And with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, committee members. My name is Jeff Stewart. I'm the Deputy Mayor of the Municipality of the County of Colchester. And thank you for the opportunity to present here today. While our initial request to appear was from the significant outcry among landowners in Colchester relative to a variety of concerns, Colchester Council believes that we would be remiss if we did not extend our appreciation to the changes made to date and to acknowledge the opportunity we have before us to work in collaboration to ensure the Biodiversity Act achieves its objectives. <clears throat> the lack of consultation both before the bill was introduced and prior to the announcement from Premier Rankin last week is of concern. My understanding was that NSFM, who represents all municip municipal entities in the province, was contacted to participate the day before consultation, which is hardly enough time to inform their members or for the membership to become educated or engaged on any matter. Many landowners are not against biodiversity. They simply want a clear understanding of government plans and outcomes. The municipality of Colchester is not against biodiversity and it is not outright opposed to the Biodiversity Act. We have issues with the approach taken and the lack of consultation with municipal partners. The municipality of Colchester shares a long-standing commitment to the protection of the environment. For example, we are national leaders in recycling and composting facilities and programs. We have, we, are national, uh, we have hired a sustainability planner. We have established a solar Colchester PACE financing program. 
We have extensive trail systems throughout the municipality. And most recently, we have created a joint partnership with Cumberland County with the Cliffs of Fundy Geopark Initiative. The Fundy Discovery Site is another example here as well, an example of successful and thorough consultation with the public and as many stakeholders as could be reached for input on all phases of the planning and implementation of this project. This is a critical time for environmental stewardship. To be effective, extensive consultation and education is paramount to any success to move this forward. There are a few specific sec sections of the Act that are concerning to us. Section 6, subsection 2, in conducting the review of this act, the minister shall consult with the public, including landowners and stakeholders. There is no mention of municipalities. Section 8B, cooperation between federal, provincial, or municipal governments, or agencies thereof, for the enforcement of laws respecting the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. This would be a great move if it is, in fact, the practice that is taken. And section 18, subsection uh, number two, the minister shall consult with the public, including landowners and stakeholders, in any such manner as the minister considers appropriate before proposing new regulations or substantive amendment to a regulation under subsection one for governor, for governor council consideration. There is concern with the wording. Again, no mention of municipal participation as well what one considers appropriate may not be interpreted by many in the same manner. The act as introduced does not include, does include some very positive attributes as well, including the province's commitment to biodiversity research, data collection, educational campaigns, and other related activities. However, we feel that the lack of adequate public consultation and direct consultation, consultation with municipal partners has resulted in an act that is less impactful and less trusted by the public than it have had, have had, had been created in collaboration. Additionally, it is concerning that most of the newly amended act only pertains to Crown land, which makes up a mere 29% of Nova Scotia's land mass. At this time of ecological and climate crisis, it is critical for biodiversity protections to extend to the rest of the province's land, since our forests and ecosystems are crucial for food security, economic prosperity, health, leisure, and climate adaptation and mitigation. The legislation, particularly where private lands are concerned, must be developed through public education and consultation with stakeholders, including municipalities in a way that meets Nova Scotia's present and future needs. Having served as president of Nova Scotia Federation of Municipalities while your previous leader led the government, two words were often referenced, cooperation and collaboration, both verbally and in many correspondence. Is the current leadership's desire to create an atmosphere of cooperation and collaboration? If so, I hope that it becomes a common practice, not simply a task to be completed on your process map. Municipal governments are referred to as a level of government closest to the people. We have our hand on the pulse of public opinion. Given the opportunity to work in a collaborative manner and being considered true partners by sitting at the table to discuss issues such as biodiversity, a solution is much more attainable to achieve the outcome desired and may eliminate much controversy. In terms of moving forward, tabling this bill and undertaking meaningful consultation with municipalities would be a positive first step. Furthermore, committing to engage with and consult with your municipal partners prior to the implementation of regulations would further enhance and better inform your implementation strategy. Invariably, it is our humble opinion that your aspirational objectives set out in the Biodiversity Act will be better understood and better accepted if you were to work with your municipal partners as your trusted advisors on this important initiative. I thank you for your time and consideration of our perspective of this municipal unit as it affects to this 
particular issue. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor uh, Stewart. I'll open uh, to my colleagues on the committee for any questions. Ms. Chender. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, and this is something we hear a lot from the municipalities uh, around just in general, a desire for greater um, collaboration and information sharing um, and consultation. And I'm wondering, um, given the kind of what we see a little bit is the the difference, the delta between what's in the act and the what we're hearing about the act or what people's concerns are, would it be helpful if there, would it have been helpful if there had been consultation with the regulations there so that you and your colleagues at the NSFM could have seen those and shared those and had conversations with your own constituents um, to be able to kind of give a more fulsome version of what's actually in the act? Uh Personally, I believe that uh, if we should be part of the whole process, that uh, it's, as, as, I state, as I stated, we are the closest to the people as far as elected officials. And the more information we have, the more we can pass on to those that we represent. Ms. Smith uh, McCrossan uh, had a question. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Stewart, for your presentation. I just wanted to clarify a um, couple of things. So you're presenting on behalf of NSFM? No, I am. How are you? No, I am not. I'm presenting on behalf of the municipality of Colchester. Okay, okay. And the, the second thing I wanted to clarify is, um, did I understand that, that who you represent uh, want this Biodiversity Act to apply to private land? We want, what we would like to see is the education and the collaboration take place so that people are informed and then they can make a decision on where they want to be with this. Great, thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, Deputy uh, Mayor uh, Stewart, thank you for taking the time to uh, bring uh, the municipality's uh, perspective to Bill Number 4, the Biodiversity Act, uh, to the committee. And thank you for the opportunity. Our next uh, presenter is uh, Ms. Beth Lenko. All right, I see that uh, Ms. Lenko has joined, just waiting to connect to the audio stream. Ms. Lenko, are you with us? You're just... This, this will make a difference. There we go. There. Do you see me? Perfect. Yes. Uh, and your audio is fine. So welcome to the Law Amendments Committee. Uh, we're discussing Bill okay. Number 4, the Biodiversity Act. Uh, you'll have yeah. 10 minutes total, uh, usually five minutes for presentation, five minutes for questions. But uh, if uh, I'll give a, a one minute warning at the nine minute mark, if you're still presenting, just so that you will uh, have the option to choose uh, to wrap up and, and allow at least some questions to come through. Uh, with that, okay. I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I know it's been uh, a long day for everyone, so I appreciate you uh, still being here and, and listening. So um, my name is Beth Lenko. I'm an artist and a teacher, and I'm speaking on behalf of myself and the trees and the spirit of the land here in Nova Scotia. I support bill number four, the Biodiversity Act, intact as it was before the amendments were made because life on earth is threatened. I'm 51 years old. I grew up in Liverpool and I've spent most of my life in this province. My family were big campers and canoeists and I spent a lot of my childhood listening to the call of the wood thrush, the deafening hum of crickets and the cry of the loon. 
I experienced the dazzling glitter of, field of, of, the, of a field of fireflies and the mysterious colors and textures of the Blanding turtle and the majesty of the mainland moose. I know how nature felt back then. It felt alive. I assumed everyone cared for the earth as much as I did. I became an artist so I could make sitting in nature my work. Because of this love and passion, I have always felt my actions have been to preserve and take care of what's around me. The animals, the plants, the trees, the rocks, the birds. There is a natural harmony and balance to life when we just let it be. In my 20s, I spent four years in the city receiving my fine art degree at NASCAD. When I left Halifax and came back out to live rurally on the eastern shore, I noticed a big difference in the sounds of the land. Things had changed. The loon cried less, the insects weren't around as much, the birds were quieter. Something big had shifted. Life had lessened, the bats disappeared. This was more than 20 years ago. Since that time, I noticed this dramatic decrease in the life force of the land. The situation has gotten much worse. We are now in a state of ecological emergency. I knew it then, but not many understood what I heard and saw. Now it's hard to find people who don't understand. And there is a name for this attitude, it's called climate denial. Climate denial can be observed in two subgroups, those with an agenda to keep business as usual and those paralyzed by fear. Either way, this is not the majority of Canadians or Nova Scotians. There are thousands and thousands of people landowners, woodlot owners, country dwellers, and urbanites, young and old, who all see the writing on the wall, we are in danger. We are living in a time of mass extinction, and it does not bode well for humans, for we are intricately connected with nature. We are part of biodiversity, not separate. Our lives depend on the life force that surrounds us, and the life force around us will thrive only through our own extinction, or our stewardship. These are our two choices, mass death or stewardship. The Biodiversity Act was the first act of its kind to address this global crisis in a local way. I read it. I read the amendments this morning. These changes turn it into a piece of meaningless paper. With 10 pages of what could have been a turning point for Nova Scotia gone, it is not worth the paper it is printed on. Science is telling us that there is still time. We can turn things around if we take drastic measures to protect and preserve what is remaining of our lands, waters, and forests. For it is the trees that will save us. It is the trees that will care for us and bring this land back to health. And it is possible. We saw how last year during the global lockdowns, when people stayed home, the earth came back to life. I even noticed on our local beach, our piping plover population went from three to 20 last year because people stayed off the beaches during crucial nesting time. That's how quickly the earth can regenerate. I believe I will be able to witness a comeback in my lifetime. That is my vision. And I hold that vision for the earth and all beings that we may all experience again what I knew as a child. Last year, when COVID hit Canada, our government came out with strong laws enforcing people to change their behavior on a dime so that we could lessen the effects of the pandemic. It worked. People grumbled, but it worked. We have been a relatively COVID-free province. Here's the thing. COVID is nothing compared to climate crisis. We are in so much more danger than a pandemic and more pandemics will come without a healthy planet to keep us resilient. We need at least that kind of muscle to protect our lands, waters and forests now. We have waited until the last minute of the 11th hour to make a turnaround. We still can, but we must act now. We cannot wait for the next government to do something. We must do something now. We must act fast. The Biodiversity Act, before its amendments, was on the right track. 
our government must stand up with strong leadership and create not just an environmental framework, but a moral framework for Nova Scotians to now live by. The emergency orders must be put back into the act. The threat of fines needs to be put back. The law that requires companies to be responsible for the actions of their employees needs to be put back. The influence of this act on all landowners, large and small, needs to be put back. These are the moral guidelines we need to make the changes that are needed to curb the difficulties ahead. And there will be difficulties. I want to finish with three questions that I ask myself every morning. Who are you? What are you doing here? How can you be of service to life today? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lenko. Uh, I'll open the floor with about three minutes remaining. If there are any questions from my colleagues. Ms. smith McCrossan. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to Ms. Lanko for your presentation. Um, I just have to start by saying I used to work with your father in the operating room. Oh, in my gosh. Sorry, I just had to share that with you. He was an oh, incredible, wow. incredible human being, your, your father. Thank so you. I want to ask you for some advice. Uh, I think oh, most of us agree that biodiversity is of the utmost importance. Uh, you shared that you're a teacher. And I'm wondering if you have any advice for us of how we could approach this topic with an educational approach as opposed to maybe an authoritarian approach. Ah, uh, gotcha. Um, well, I, I think that, uh, I, th I think both are needed. I, I realize that um, an educational approach is softer and, uh, Th that needs to happen regardless, um, because I think a lot of people want to do the right thing, but they really don't know. They really, they want their water view. They want some money to pay their property taxes. They'll sell off a plot of land. They'll, they'll just do things that don't seem that bad because they don't see the big picture. And, and so I think mass, mass education is, is so important, but I, I don't think it's going to hold on its own. I think there does need to be both. Um, as, as far as how to educate, um, gosh, uh, I think, um, is that what you asked? Did you ask how to educate or just yeah, um, <laughs> how to educate is 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 mass campaigning. Honestly, a, you know, door to door, um, internet, putting on on big big events. Like there's there's so many ways to reach people now. It's it's uh, it's about being people talking to people and 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 not having these walls of 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 us and them, but just we're all here together, doing this together. So that's part of it. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. Any Thank other you. questions? About 30 seconds left. I could just maybe finish off if that's okay, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. About 20 seconds. Um, I just, uh, the reason I asked that question is, again, the spirit of taking care of the earth is shared by many. Most of the resistance that I've seen is, is due to the lack of trust of government and the government's history, poor history of taking care of its, of the crown land. So there's, there's a real lack of trust of government having even more control. And I do see education as a key component. Yes, yes, absolutely. And, and doing the right thing the next time around, gaining that trust back. That's mm -hmm. so important to gain the trust back. All right. Thank you uh, very much, Ms. Lenko. Uh, we're just over the, the 10 minute mark. I appreciate uh, the Thank insight so uh, to share with uh, the committee on Bill 4, okay. the Biodiversity Act. Thank you for your time. Thanks so much. The next presenter is Ms. Amanda Van Veen.
Mr. Chair, it's 5.30. Would we take our break now or? Uh, that would be the question to ledge council. And just uh, if we take the break now, we push everyone off a little longer. If Ms. Van Veen is ready, are you guys okay to, but if, I'm not seeing her in the meeting. I'm She's not, not in the waiting room either. No. All right, so I think uh, with that, uh, we get ourselves back on track uh, with the 15 minute recess. Uh, we'll be back at uh, 545 and we will be uh, starting with uh, two presentations on Bill 23, the Adoption Records Act at 545.
I believe we have quorum back. Uh, we'll call uh, to order, and uh, we will start with uh, a new bill, uh, Bill 23, the Adoption Records Act. There are two presenters, uh, after which uh, we will revert back to Bill Number 4, the Biodiversity Act. Uh, so the first presentation is uh, presenter is Heather McNeil, and uh, these presentations will be for 15 minutes, a uh, 10 minute presentation, five for Q&A for these two uh, in the uh, adoption records. Ms. McNeil, are you with us? There. Hello, can you hear me? Perfect. Welcome to Law Amendments uh, Committee. Uh, we are here to discuss Bill Number 23, the Adoption Records Act. Uh, you will have a total of 15 minutes uh, to present, usually a 10 minutes presentation, leaving five minutes for Q&A. So I will give you a, uh, a time check at uh, the 10 minute mark uh, that there are five minutes remaining. And with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Chair DeLore, and thank you, Law Amendments Committee, for uh, giving me the opportunity to present today on the Adoption Records uh, Act. Um, I think first, before I get started, my name is well, Heather McNeil. I, I'm the legal advisor for a, uh, a department of our KMKNO. It's called Malgayugi Guinea Jana, means keeping our children together. So it's a, a child welfare, it's a child welfare um, um, project initiative, I guess, initiative is a better word, initiative to bring our children back to our own communities. And really it's about uh, governance and, and jurisdiction over child welfare. But I work for a department called, um, we're gonna say KMKNO for short, because uh, it has a very long Mi'kmaq name. And uh, um, the Assembly of Nova Scotia chiefs are, 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 the, are the owners of that. Uh, KMKNO office, and they're the secretary for the, for the assembly. I'll tell you a little bit about the assembly. I think it'll make it clearer when I do that. So the assembly is an unincorporated uh, association consisting of 11 of the 13 Mi'kmaq chiefs here in Nova Scotia. It meets monthly to deliberate on issues common to, to all of their Mi'kmaq communities and is the aggregate governance institution for the Mi'kmaq in this province. So, and it works uh, its works include providing direction to the Mi'kmaq negotiation team in the Made Nova Scotia negotiation process and concerning Mi'kmaq Aboriginal and treaty rights governed by the framework agreement entered into by Canada and Nova Scotia and the Mi'kmaq that has all taken place in on February 23rd, 2007. The Assembly also has uh, delegated authority from their respective chiefs in the province and councils to conduct formal consultation with the Crowns under what's called the Terms of Reference for a Mi'kmaq Nova Scotia Canada consultation process entered into by Canada and the province here in Nova Scotia and the Mi'kmaq. The Assembly has a developed uh, a portfolio system and the lead chief for governance of that is Chief Deborah Robinson of Acadia First Nation. And I am here presenting on her behalf tonight. In 2017, the assembly developed a strategic way forward, including engagement with the federal government on a long-term strategic approach to the Mi'kmaq of Nova Scotia, assuming complete jurisdiction and governance over matters affecting the welfare of children for all Mi'kmaq within the Nova Scotia. The assembly created the Magleogi Ginijana Initiative, that's the one I work for, meaning keeping our children together, to develop our own Mi'kmaq law, where we, the Mi'kmaq, resume jurisdiction and decision-making authority over our own children. Magleogi Ginijana Initiative is at our KMK and all office, that's called, I should probably say it, Gwilmugwa Magusquat and the Negotiation Office, so we shorten it to KMK and all, so you'll hear me reference that uh, occasionally. The KMKNO is the secretary to the Assembly of Nova Scotia Mi'kmaq Chiefs. 
KMKNO had completed an overview of the legislation and the proposed provincial amendments to this act on behalf of the assembly. And we provided written submissions. I believe they went in this morning, um, along with these oral uh, submissions that I'm doing tonight. And as I mentioned, made on behalf of Chief Deborah Robinson, who's the lead chief of governance uh, for the uh, assembly. Um, many of the assemblies, uh, or sorry, many of the amendments are, are supported by the Mi'kmaq. However, there needs to include some amendments uh, reflecting the distinct issues and needs of the Mi'kmaq in relation to opening adoption records in Nova Scotia. So our comments uh, to the proposed amendments by Department of Community Services are focused primarily on those that affect the needs and the issues of, of the Mi'kmaq in particular, Mi'kmaq content, Mi'kmaq culture, and Mi'kmaq customs. So my comments are going to be uh, specific, I guess, to those things. And really, they're, they're about suggesting changes that are uh, provided in the spirit of strengthening the current amendments that the DCS has put forward. So maybe what I'll do is get into um, a couple of comments I did want to make that are outside of talking about the assembly and things like that and the work that we're doing there. But I would just want to say that Chief Robinson is happy to see that the province is moving forward with these much needed changes to the legislation regarding disclosure of adoption information. And it's important to recognize that Mi'kmaq children have been historically overrepresented in the Nova Scotia child welfare system and have been placed for adoption. Many of our Mi'kmaq children were adopted out of their families and out of their culture. And to this day, many of those children continue to search for their parents and their families and their identity. And current restrictive adoption information law and processes have prevented them from, from achieving those goals. The Mi'kmaq were consulted by DCS on the proposed changes to the law. And for the most part, DCA has listened and heard us. They've included many of our concerns into the new Adoption Records Act, concerns that are seriously lacking in the current legislation. Bill 23 is proposed by DCS, offers a new possibility to connect our lost Mi'kmaq children to their rightful identity, culture, and their nation. Parents and family members too can benefit by being able to seek identifying information that holds the possibility of reconnecting with their children that have been adopted out and lost in the system. I'd like to take this time to go through some of the specific changes uh, to the proposed act and focus on those sections, again, that specifically affect the Mi'kmaq. And I'm just going to start by looking at the definitions. I don't know if this is recorded or you need to take them down, but I will tell you the specific things I'm going to talk about are in the um, uh, written submissions to you. So just so that's a little easier. So in terms of the definition, Section 3A talks of, uh, defines an Aboriginal child, and there needs to be a correction to the spelling, because when they use, they use they talk about including a Mi'kmaq child. They just need to change the Mi'kmaq. It's two different spellings for Mi'kmaq, and they're used in different contexts. In that particular section, they need to, uh, it needs to be spelled M-I-K-M-A-W. So that's that one. Section 3B defines adopted person. Um, and we asked, used, uh, they used the word custom in there. And our, our um, when we talk about customary care and things like that and customary adoption, um, this one is needs to be customary adoption, not custom adoption. Um, the Mi'kmaq also have customary adoptions that proceed through the customs of our bands and not necessarily through the children and family services, although many of them can go through that process as well. Customary adoptions so should also be included in that section that, that take place through customs of the band as well. And I'm going to suggest some um, wording for that definition. Uh, adopted person means a person who, unless otherwise specifically provided, has attained the has attained the age of majority and was adopted pursuant to or whose adoption was recognized as a customary adoption under the Children and Family Services Act or any predecessor to that act or this is the part I want uh, I'm hoping you will add or according to a band's recognized customary adoption practices and that's important for our community section 3f Basically, that's the same comments as I made above, the, the, the directly above about using customary and including that uh, according to a band's recognized customary adoption practices. Section 3C is, is the definition of an adoption order. The, the adoption order really doesn't include a customary adoption order. So that should be included in that section. 
Section three, sub four, um, we support the addition of cultural in that in that particular section with reference to providing history of the adopted person in this section. That wasn't in the in the previous uh, um, legislation. So we just want to say I want to include very positives as well, and that was one of them. Sections three H, we support the definition of adding band in that section. Sections 3U is a definition of a Mi'kmaq governing body. Now that's very, very important and needs to be in the act. However, we ask that the following definition, and I'm gonna say that for the record, um, replace the DCS proposed definition as ours we believe is more inclusive of our band councils, which are a very important part of our Mi'kmaq governing body and our government, our Mi'kmaq government. So Mi'kmaq government and body, the definition means a council, government, or other entity that is authorized to act on behalf of the Mi'kmaq of Nova Scotia as a First Nations group, community, or people that holds rights recognized and affirmed by Section 35 of the Constitution Act 1982. It's not a whole lot different, but it does include our councils and our government. Section 3W, we support the definition of non-identifying non information in that section. And... The next one is, uh, oh, there is no definition for customary adoption in, in the act, I, uh, and we need to include that in there. We suggest inclusion of one similar to that found in the Children and Families Services Act at section 78.1. That section says upon application, the court may recognize that an adoption of a person in accordance with the custom of a band or an Aboriginal community has the effect of an adoption under this act. So similar language, if we could uh, have that added to the act. Section 8 and 9.3, so, uh, in both of those, we support the inclusion of cultural heritage in these sections. That wasn't in sections prior. Section 11, 1B, Section 11, 2, 15, and Section 22, 2 need to include the word customary adoption orders in these sections. Section 17, that was a new, that was a, a, a new section added, and we support the inclusion of the four, I think it was four parts to that one. Section 21B and 212C need to include the word cultural in terms of describing information in these sections. I believe in earlier sections in the act, they did include cultural. I think it was just left out there. It's kind of the same language, it's just, just it was absent for some reason, but we'd ask that that word cultural be included in those two sections. Ms. Section McNeil, just, I, I, sorry to interrupt. I just want to let you know we're at about uh, four and a half minutes uh, remaining. All right, I, and I'm, I'm close to finishing. We suggest adding to the information collected by the register to include the name of the child's band of origin and the name of an elder present at a customary adoption. And these inclusions should be added to all relevant sections of the Act regarding disclosure of information. The Act needs to allow for disclosure of, of information related to an adopted person to a Mi'kmaq governing body, particularly in instances where an individual who was adopted is claiming membership into the community. And last, with respect to the appeals process, we note there is no mechanism to allow for an alternative appeals process based on Mi'kmaq customary processes when the appeal involves a person recognized as a Mi'kmaq of Nova Scotia. We'd ask that the appeals process involve Mi'kmaq in it when dealing with an adoption request involving Mi'kmaq. And thank you very much for your time. I was hoping to get it in less than 10 minutes, but that was the best okay. I could do. Well, uh, you did uh, get uh, all of the uh, suggestions in, and there's about three and a half minutes for questions. And Ms. LeBlanc has the first question, uh, followed by Ms. Combe. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Ms. McNeil, for your presentation. I just wanted to um, confirm, clarify and confirm that all of the suggestions that you have just laid out are in the written submission. There's nothing... They're all in the written submission, every one of them. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Combe. I'm all good. She took the words out of my mouth. <laughs> Just begin, Laura, Ms. and Smith put it on the record, I think. <laughs> Ms. Smith McCrossan. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to our presenter. Um, I am just curious, the, the recommendations you have for amendments, had you shared that information uh, during consultation um, in preparation for the act? Yes, and several of them, and, the, and uh, DCS has put a lot of them in there. I think some of them need to be tightened up and strengthened in language, though, that that's specific to the Mi'kmaq. Okay, thank you. Doesn't look like there are any further questions. 
So, Ms. McNeil, I uh, appreciate you taking the time to make a uh, full presentation of uh, recommendations, as well as uh, noting that uh, all of the members of the, believe, of the committee uh, have received uh, the written submission as well for further uh, perusal. Thank you very much, and thank you for the time today. I appreciate it very much. So, our next uh, presenter is... Mr. Scott Pike and Monica Kennedy. Mr. Pike, uh, if you unmute, uh, I see you uh, with the video. Uh, welcome to Law Amendments uh, Committee. Uh, we are discussing Bill Number 23, the Adoption Records Act. Uh, you'll have a total of 15 minutes, uh, usually uh, broken down at 10-minute presentation, five minutes for Q&A uh, from the members. And uh, I will give a um, – I'll apologize if I have to interrupt, but at the 10-minute mark, just so you know that there's five minutes remaining uh, if, uh, if that's necessary. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Monica Kennedy will be adding uh, as well a second part to our discussion here today. Thank you, everyone, for having me, of course. I really appreciate this and honor this opportunity. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak to about this bill. First off, I want to start to explain to you the difference this bill is going to be making in the lives of thousands of Nova Scotians. When we first started the NSAAG, our goal was to see adoption records opened here in Nova Scotia in a way that protected privacy, yet allowed people affected by adoption to reunite if they wish. As of today's date, we have grown our group, Adopted Nova Scotia and the NSAAG, to over 6,000 members. During the consultation phase, our members both participated in the online survey and public hearings. These avenues provided an opportunity for our community to be heard and consulted as to what, was, what our needs were. This bill puts the decision-making back in the hands of those involved instead of government, making these very personal decisions. With over 30,000 adoptees in Nova Scotia, this bill will have a meaningful impact to many. Adoption always starts with trauma. Reuniting can always be traumatic. And we wanted to ensure the supports will be there to assist the people going through this process in this a very emotional and personal point in their lives. Monica Kennedy, do you have... Your section to add, please. Looks like she's I, been added. Yeah, I don't believe she's out uh, enough ledge TV. Do you see Monica Kennedy in the waiting room to bring her in? in the, she would be in the audio waiting room. She dialed in via phone. That's okay. The, the numbers with just, section. The, I think. Uh, sorry, Mr. Pike, uh, the number I see just popping up here in, uh, so Ms. Kennedy, are you available on the phone? Yes, I'm here. Mr. Pike has started the presentation and just turned it over to you. I apologize that you were not in for that start of the presentation. That's okay. Thank you very much for letting me speak today in support of the Act to Open Adoption Records in Nova Scotia. Just for a minute, I want you to imagine not knowing your mom or dad your brothers or your sisters, or where your child is. It's a heartache that never goes away. And I can tell you this because I lived it. I'm adopted. I also got to reunite with my birth family back in 1992, and I know firsthand the benefits of a healthy reunion. It's truly life-changing in so many ways. Although my parents had already passed, I did get to meet my eight older brothers and my two older sisters, and it answered so many questions for me. Who am I, where am I from, and why was I given up for adoption? Which are truly tough, unanswered questions to live with, as many Nova Scotians do. I also got to learn about my heritage and my medical history of my family, all things that most people never have to question. When Scott and I created NSAAG, we started out presenting to all parties why this change needed to happen. And we were very encouraged by the change in tone and the support shown for our cause. For over 20 years, people have fought to bring this change forward, and I couldn't be more proud to be part of that legacy. We reached out to all groups to ask for their public support, and we attended almost every public consultation meeting. 
between our Facebook group, NSAAG, and the adopted in Nova Scotia group, of which we are administrators, we hear daily the emotional pleas of Nova Scotians looking for their loved ones, and it is truly heartbreaking. This bill is the first step to allowing thousands of families to reunite with the best chance of a positive reunion. We strongly ask each and every member of this government to support the adoption community in Nova Scotia by supporting this bill. Thank you. Any more remarks or are you ready for uh, questions? Uh, I'm ready for questions. Great, so I'll uh, turn it over to my colleagues. Any questions from the committee members? It's looking, oh, Ms. Smith McCrossan. I just wanna say thank you to both of our presenters today. Uh, this is, is a very emotional topic for, for many, and many, many Nova Scotians have been impacted very personally on this topic. My husband was adopted and uh, is just an incredible man and has, uh, anyway, it is it is a very personal topic. And I just want to say thank you both for sharing. Thank you mostly for all of the work that you have done on behalf of, of other Nova Scotians. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from my colleagues? Well, Mr. Pike, Ms. Kennedy, uh, looks like you did a very good job of succinctly um, highlighting for us, the members of the Law Amendments Committee, uh, the importance of this particular uh, piece of legislation. Uh, so on behalf of the committee, uh, I'd like to uh, thank you again uh, for taking the time uh, to uh, bring um, the perspective forward and uh, uh, look forward to seeing uh, the bill continue to progress through the legislative process. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Thank members. you very much. And I uh, thank our previous chair. So uh, Gordon Wilson, MLA for Claire Digby. I will be taking this session for us. Um, so now I believe we're moving on to the Bill for Biodiversity with Patrick Wiggins. Do we know if uh, we're a little bit ahead of schedule, but uh, do we know if we have uh, that person ready? Uh, very good, Mr. Wiggins, you're just on mute. You are right now. There, good. video and audio, excellent. So uh, this is a presentation on Bill for the Biodiversity. We'll have uh, 10 minutes in total. So we try to have five and five, leave five minutes for questions. But if it does go over a bit on your presentation, I certainly will give you a warning at the nine minute mark. So the floor is yours and welcome. Thanks for having me. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, before I get into the, the nitty gritty, maybe I'll just give you a brief outline of, of, of who I am and, and who I work for and who we represent and what we do. So, so I'm, I, my name is Patrick Wigan. Uh, I'm the executive director of the Federation of Nova Scotia Woodland Owners. Uh, we are a province-wide nonprofit organization that provides forest management support and advocacy to the small private woodlot owners in the province. We speak for community members, we speak for families, uh, we are individuals, we are woodland owners, and we all advocate for good stewardship of the woodlands that lie within our borders. We are grateful to have a good standing relationship with the province uh, that fund programs that we maintain and have maintained for over 20 years on over 35,000 acres of small private land. One of which being a internationally private land voluntary, voluntarily regulating certified standards put forward by the Forest Stewardship Council. When we engage with landowners, we make it very clear to them that this is voluntary, but our program does hold its operators and the landowners that engage with us accountable for whatever happens on their property, and people are respectful of those rules. Clarity is extremely important. Regulations accompanied with this bill would have been immensely important and could have spared an unnecessary polarity that is spread across our province. I understand, and we understand, that vague language can be used for the benefit of all parties, 
but language that vague um, ar arrives, if it arrives unaccompanied by regulations, then questions will be left unanswered and snowballs will begin to build. With respect to the bill itself, I am critical of it. Where I see Bill, bill 4's success is in the strength of its message. We do not need to focus on the roles and responsibilities of a conservation officer. We should be focusing on what you, the provincial government, are actually trying to promote. If there's compensation and reward for the follow for following the rules established under a biodiver under biodiversity management zones, language used should send the message of empowerment and opportunity, not confusion and panic. Once again, regulations accompanied with this bill could have addressed these concerns. If there is compensation, which I'd strongly encourage, I believe that within the private sector, there does already exist organizations that with the help of the province could serve as an engine that drives biodiversity and ecological forestry forward. Less and less money is invested in private land management while the demand for forest products um, from them either remains consistent or has been rising. Using, we should be using legislation to empower those who wish to promote biodiversity on their property, empower landowners who don't want or don't feel they are forced to harvest on generationally owned land to settle estates from dated capital gain tax laws. Change the narrative of how people see land management and invest in that. Legislation, although it may exist in seemingly perpetual in a seemingly perpetual nature, is something that we often forget about, and it's it's tough because there already is legislation that 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 does place quote unquote restrictions on landowners and what they can do, and that is something that we all forgot about, and that did help fuel a lot of confusion that could have been spared. Um, Legacy of practice, uh, knowledge around good practice, and incentives for good practices are the real winners for the families and communities of forest owners and forest stewards. I, w I really worry that actually policing with conservation officers kind of misses the point. Uh, if, we, if we had a system in place similar to what the Association of Sustainable Forestry does, where incentives of where incentives in the form of funding to promote sustainable silviculture treatments are administered to engage the landowners in the province. Why can't we create something similar with biodiversity management zones on private land? With a program like that, we could appeal to those who are concerned about cutting wood but want to protect the natural beauty and species richness that lies within their property lines. Engagement and education could drastically improve in the province. Increased engagement and education about ecological forestry and biodiversity means we're building a strong foundation of knowledge that could build, build legacy of good work and partnerships that this province could really be proud of. There is a wide array of opinions around this bill that, man <clears throat> that management needs to, to be addressed. And there are engines that already exist that could drive and consolidate these messages in a direction that is beneficial for everybody. Woodlot owners and operators, the Federation, Mercy Tobiotic Research Institute, and other landowner groups and co-ops are just a few to name. But these are groups that represent a long history of strong partnerships that already exist between the provincial government and private organizations. I'm not speaking for those groups, but we, the Federation, see them as important parts and an important engine to move all of this forward. These relationships have established trust. They promote publicly funded programs that already hold accountable the actions of landowners on private land and promote good forestry. With the help of pre-existing legislation, as well as regulations accompanied with a bill like this, we could have had a home run and a real step towards good change. My job currently is to represent the collective concerns of the thousand plus members that we have uh, in our member base with the Federation, and there is significant division. But one message that I consistently hear through phone calls and emails calls into question why a bill with no regulations and a whole lot of teeth was put forward, and that question still remains. Thank you for your time, folks. All right, thank you very much for your time. So we have uh, about three and a half minutes left if uh, there are questions from any of our members. 
well stated. So usually when things are well stated, that means that the questions are fewer. So I certainly do thank you for your time. And with that, uh, I believe we'll move on to our next presenter. Appreciate your words. So our next uh, speaker is Adam Rogers with Northeast Nova Scotia Landowners. Do we know if that person is in the waiting room? Perfect. Mr. Rogers, uh, I do believe we have you on audio. Uh, here we come with video. Sure. Welcome. Thank so you. thank you very much. Uh, we'll be taking your comments on Bill for the Biodiversity Act. So we have 10 minutes for presentations. And if you want to do five and five, so there'll be time for questions. Uh, if not, at least I'll give you a nine minute warning with a minute to go. So the floor is yours. Welcome. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good evening as well to members of the committee. I am here this evening speaking on behalf of private landowners from the northeast mainland of Nova Scotia, primarily Anaganish and Guysborough counties. Uh, this is a diverse group and includes forestry contractors, land developers, farmers, construction contractors, and Christmas tree growers. There are over 100 direct supporters and almost 3,500 individual Nova Scotians have signed an online petition being circulated by members of this group. It would not be entirely correct to call this group an organization. It is rather a movement that is the result of a widespread, independent and spontaneous reaction, which has coalesced for the purpose of putting a stop to this unfair overreach into the rights of private landowners. It is not necessary to have a critical view of the underlying goals and ambitions of the proposed Biodiversity Act to be critical of Bill 4. It is noteworthy, however, uh, that there is nothing in the Act's lengthy preamble that even mentions the importance of private property rights or the need to consider such rights while reaching a balanced approach to land usage in Nova Scotia. My review of the original draft of Bill 4 had identified five broad issues for landowners. Uh, the proposed act had an unfair compensation scheme, it had overreaching emergency powers, and it left the defining of the most meaningful elements of what is to be done or protected to be filled in later in the regulations. The original Bill 4 contained intrusive inspection and enforcement rights and had potentially very harsh penalties for contravening the act. The government has signaled that it will be amending Bill 4 to remove the penalty provisions, emergency powers, and the entitlement for government officials to intrude onto private land. And I've reviewed the amended version, which does do this. Before I make comment on the revised remainder, it is important to understand why some of what was removed was so problematic. First, much of the significant detail surrounding what the study, preservation, and enhancement of biodiversity might mean in practice is not included in the act, but will rather come later in the regulations. In other words, there is nothing in this act that tells us what species or habitats are to be protected and how that might be objectively determined, what activities might be restricted, what goals might the department develop in terms of overall provincial land mass to be made part of the zone, and what level of monitoring might take place thereafter. For a piece of legislation that has been over two years in the making, it is curious that these detailed regulations have not been drafted, or if drafted, not released. Then, there are the compensation and emergency powers, which are best reviewed together because they would likely have been used together, threatening landowners with emergency orders to get them to agree to undervalue their rightful compensation. This would be a particular concern to private landowners who are adjacent to either crown land or an existing biodiversity zone. The dampening effect of the emergency order powers, coupled with the requirement that the use be being restricted be a current use, makes the compensation scheme proposed in the original bill for unfair to landowners. Planned uses, even if documented, would not be compensated, even though this is how market value of land is otherwise commonly determined. Significantly, the compensation scheme in the proposed act differed from the that of the Expropriation Act, the Mineral Resources Act, and the Endangered Species Act 
and no compelling reasons for this are obvious or have been communicated publicly by the government. The provincial government has signaled that it will be amending Bill 4, as I mentioned. While addressing some concerns, this proposal does not entirely resolve the issue for landowners, and Bill 4 still merits strong opposition. If the government wishes to carry out the activities that will remain in Bill 4, which effectively means to analyze and plan for biodiversity on Crown land, they can simply budget for and fund studies or other efforts to that effect. Legislation is not needed. It is right and just for landowners to be fighting this proposed legislation. Even those supporting the goals outlined in the preamble to the proposed legislation should agree that all affected parties should be treated fairly and that it is wrong and unnecessarily divisive to try to achieve those goals through this unfair overreach into the rights of private landowners. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Those are uh, those are my prepared remarks, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Hey, thank you. We have five minutes. Uh, do we have any? It's been it's it's been a, a long day. I think there's been a lot of questions asked, so I'm I'm sure they're not looking for the same answers. So, with that, Ms. McCrossin. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Mr. Rogers, for your presentation today on behalf of private landowners. We've heard, um, we've, we've read a lot of the written submissions and a lot of the verbal presentations today shared very similar concerns. So my question to you is what would you recommend to government today to uh, improve the consultation process with private landowners? It would, I think having the regulations uh, prepared and published would go a long way to uh, alleviating any concerns. Well, potentially, depending on what the content of those uh, regulations might be. So right now, it's it's difficult for a landowner to be confident in what might take place, uh, especially in this area where there's been some difficulty with protected areas and, and how those have affected uh, usage. Uh, so... Detailing those regulations, I think, uh, and having those published before the legislation is being debated, uh, that would uh, have been a big help. Thank you. Ms. Coombs? Wasn't quite sure if that yes. was a hand yeah, up. Yeah, that, that, was, that was just me thinking, but... Um... Okay. With regards, with regards to uh, when you just talked about regulation, um, is your concern with the Act more or less that you don't know what the regulations are? Um, are going to be so therefore uh, and what the government is considering in the regulations is that where your concern lies well there's a lot of uh, power and authority in the act uh, in the original version of the act for the department and without knowing what exactly the government is intending to do uh, then one might expect on the other end that there would be pretty vigorous uh, oversight provisions, appeal provisions, that sort of thing, but those were missing from the legislation as well. So uh, basically it seemed as though the, the legislation was asking landowners to trust the government to do things in their best interest and um, we'll tell you the details later and that, I don't think that's what private landowners are looking for. Okay, well, um, Mr. Rogers, thank you very much. Oh, Ms. Smith McCrossin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Mr. Rod uh, Mr. Rogers, would you, um, we've heard some from some today that they believe that there's already several pieces of legislation in place that could be amended rather than introducing a new bill that is so diverse and vague. Um, do you have any comment on that? Yes, I do. The existing legislation, like the Endangered Species Act, uh, you know, for, for species in particular, other things do have some provisions for uh, protecting our environment, which is which is fine, and landowners are happy with that. The other legislation, the, the legislation that I mentioned, uh, those have different provisions for, uh, for compensating the landowners as well, and they tend to use the model that's used in the Expropriation Act, they use the UARB. This legislation didn't propose that, and it was uh, it was curious as to why it wouldn't, uh, given that that's the model so far. Um, again, thank you very much, Mr. Rogers. Um, we didn't think we had some questions, we did. So appreciate your time and your presentation here today. And we'll go now to our next presenter. Thanks again. 
Uh, Bridget Quigley, um, and I believe that was for 6.35, so we're 10 minutes ahead of time here. And I'm not sure if, yes, I do see that she's in the waiting room, so that's good. I believe we're just waiting for Ledge TV to move. Uh, I must say it's been probably quite a day for Ledge TV today and we should probably uh, thank them and our Ledge Council a few times before we're finished here today. He Done quite a to job. She needs to unmute. Let's do this done what they have to do. Say that again, Mr. Hebb. She, she needs to unmute and uh, turn on her video. Okay. Miss um, Quigley, if you heard that, you need to unmute and turn off, turn on your video. Here we go. There. All right. There. I think Perfect. Come we on have you. There. Not a problem. Okay. So welcome. So we're taking submissions on Bill 4, Biodiversity. We have uh, 10 minutes for presentations. Uh, you can do it in five, uh, and we'll have five minutes for questions if you like. If you go over uh, the five, I'll give you a warning at least at the nine-minute mark, and uh, the floor is yours. Welcome. Okay. Thank you so much. I, I had hoped for, but I think I might be over, so you just let me know. Uh, my name is Bridget Quigley, and I am a person who lives here in Nova Scotia. I'm not representing any uh, association or company in particular. As I do feel it's a wonderful bill, and that I'd like to see it go through with I don't know if Ms. Quigley can hear me, but I think she's having some bandwidth issues that we uh, might just have to go. We can with the most. Um, oh, are, I could hear you. Are you cannot hear me? Yeah, no, maybe, maybe uh, I th you were breaking up there a little bit. My only technical uh, advice would be is maybe you had some bandwidth things if you went just with audio for now and okay, uh, sure. stop the video. Okay, let me see if I can do that. Uh, oh. oh, I'm not sure where that is on. Here. There you go. Let's see. You're fine now. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. All right. So I want to say um, that this bill is a guidepost as far as I can see. It's it's a, a, a why and a how to. It's, it's not really a fence or a gate or an interdiction to people who own land or, or use land. It's not uh, a stage where we are in the details of how it's going to be executed or enforced. Uh, what we're trying to do really, sorry, uh, is just to be clear about what we want to accomplish and what measures, what route we're going to take to get there. That's how I see this bill. Uh, it's not the moment to panic. There's no um, autocracy at work here. Uh, Basically, do we understand that land and water are where flora and fauna live? Yes. Uh, do we know that diversity is critical? Yes, I hope. Uh, do we know that uh, we all need to work together to survive and stay alive and live well? Yes. Uh, that's it. That's all the statement is, uh, Bill 116, a commitment to work together on stewardship of the land in Nova Scotia and the uh, and that, well, all of us will have to be uh, doing that to some degree. I don't live on Crown land. I live in Nova Scotia land on First Nations treaty land for the most part, actually. And all of it is one unit. I applaud the elected body for seeing that and moving to establish framework for the work to begin on how we will contribute to elevating the prosperity and abundance of this intricate system that is nature. Uh, no matter what your house is built of or where it stands, no matter what you your diet is, uh, vegan, paleo, or junk food, uh, 
your house and your nutrients come from one place, and that's land and water. So this elected body ha that has moved to recognize the interconnectedness and universal nature of where we live, I applaud that. Uh, it takes strength to lay a new foundation for a better path. Uh, the voting public is woke and ready, and it does behoove the Liberals to, uh, and they will benefit from also uh, continuing to drive this bus with their eyes on the road ahead, um, further ahead, because that's what this is. Uh, this province is very much like a bus uh, with all of our children and our families on it. And the Liberals and those in government are driving that bus. I am, drive, I am in a car that's being driven right now, so sorry for the uh, strange audio. Um, but they are. They are at the helm of that. And um, we want to be, we elected them to do it to, to the closest intersection. In this bus with our children in it and us, you've got to be looking ahead. And when you say you're going to take us to school, uh, you'd better be driving those children to school, not driving us all to a, um, labor or lumber mills where we will, uh, we will not benefit as much. I'd like to quote some of the legislature that has been tabled as it was tabled originally. Um, one thing under whereas the well-being of the individual and the community achieving adequate uh, standards of community nutrition and econo economic well-being uh, without jeopardizing the integrity and diversity and the productivity of our environment. That's absolutely spot on. Under uh, purpose, there's a lovely line about integrating framework of legislation that supports the stewardship, conservation, sustainability, uh, use and governance of biodiversity for the province. Those two items alone seem to me worthwhile and reasonable objectives for the province. And they cannot be achieved through the use of crown land alone. There simply isn't enough crown land here left. And that's, I think, one of the points I wanted to be clear on. The ratio of private to crown land in Nova Scotia is the highest by far of any province. Almost 70% of land in the province is privately owned. Uh, only PEI, I think, has less crown land than we do. Ontario, for instance, has crown land that is 77% of their total mass. Closer to home, New Brunswick has 50% crown land. British Columbia apparently consists of 94% crown land. If uh, BC were to enact a legislation to foster biodiversity for the future of the province and it affected only their crown land, they have a high chance of successfully affecting their environment. At 29% of crown land in a very small province here in Nova Scotia, that's just not an impactful um, and not likely that the land uh, is it's probably quite interrupted uh, through ranges and waterways. So it would be hard to establish a cohesive, sustainable ether that would make any difference um, to, the, to the populations. It's just unlikely with that small amount of crown land. So our human trafficking in the province, I expect it to apply everywhere, not just crown land. And it's the same for this biodiversity initiative. Uh, this isn't only about encouraging best practices, which is very helpful. This is also about managing our shared resources cooperatively as a group, uh, living under one's ecosystems. There will be need of rules uh, to help support that ecosystem. Uh, and this is about voicing our objectives uh, as people living on a specific body of land and ocean together. Um, this is what the legislature is for. Uh, sorry, I'm just in the car here, it's a little difficult. Uh, think, uh, I was just going to say that it's, it's, it's just one system is going to be so much more easy to, to work through and um, get all the stakeholders' interests properly leveled out and addressed. So it's very important that we have that sort of uh, single goal um, and that it reaches into all these different departments that are already existing. These rules are already there for the most part. Um, and you want young people to stay in the province? Well, yeah, we want to give them some good internet to work from, cer certainly. But we also want to give them uh, the environmental basics that they already believe in, in a province that is looking ahead. Give them job choices from an increased influx of population and tourism, 
created by our unequaled reputation as a beautiful wilderness of clean water and clean air and an outdoor lifestyle backed by active legislation. On top of that, give them somewhere that they can raise healthy children and live a long life. I think that this could achieve a lot of that. Uh, we have an incredible amount of coastal waters and uh, marine resources. Um, and we have diverse landscape and um, being almost an island, we really do have a great chance as a great geographically independent area um, to use this bubble to work with other, uh, sorry, uh, to work. Yeah, we have a great deal of opportunity to affect our environment for our long-term benefits. We do need to stop using it for others and create for our own longevity in the region. Uh, I had a little note here about uh, alterations that were recently made to Bill 116. I do know- One, one minute, Ms. Quigley. One minute. Okay, very good, thank you. I'm gonna skip ahead from that. I was just gonna point out the things that have been deleted are mostly the policies and enforcement, and yet things about um, paying out monies to people to possibly do kind things uh, remains in there, which is really a possibility for some um, money being handed out without any real um, commitment to the, to the uh, biodiversity. I was going to say very quickly at the very last, I'm immensely proud and excited that my government has tabled this bill. It's a brilliant move as nations and communities begin to value sustainability and local resources as a sign of future prosperity and desirability. The bill is an achievement for all of us. It feels like we've reached the top edge of a mud pit after climbing up from the bottom. We have something solid to stand on and something to build on, so I thank you. And, and I thank you, and I hope that you weren't the one that was driving the vehicle. Is the only thing I'll of say? Of course not. Good. No, no, I, thank you. Okay. Um, we could entertain one quick question if there was, but uh, that is the 10-minute time. So with that, uh, Ms. Quigley, thank you very much for your presentation, and um, appreciate that. Uh, thank you all for the work you do. Thank you. So we now are at the point where the next presentation was scheduled for seven o'clock. We're eight minutes ahead of time. So I would assume that's a good opportunity for all of us to maybe have a, a more fulsome break until seven. And uh, we'll come back for the final, um, final steps and phases of this. So we'll uh, break until seven o'clock. Thank you.
you get 20 seconds ledge council you guys are Uh, I see we have quorum. I call the uh, law amendments committee back to order. And uh, we have a presenter for bill number four, the Biodiversity Act, Hannah Bizantson Sloanway. Uh, I believe that uh, just if you could check and see if she's in the waiting room. Yes, I see she is. Ah, welcome, Ms. Presents and Sloan White. Uh, so we're going to take presentations on Bill for the Biodiversity. Uh, we have 10 minutes in total. So if you could do five, five minutes for questions is fine. If you go over up to nine minutes, I'll let you go. And then I'll give you a one minute warning that your time is almost up. So welcome and the floor is yours. Okay, great. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I'm joining you today to express my strong support for the Biodiversity Act and my disappointment at see in seeing the changes shared by lands and forestry today. Not only do I believe these changes suggest a lack of commitment to providing the necessary protections to the environment and Nova Scotia's natural resources, but I believe the timing of this announcement undercuts the op this opportunity for meaningful consultation. I believe that we are at a tipping point with respect to biodiversity, and I think that strong, timely action is necessary to ensure the protection of our environment and the long-term sustainability of the natural resources we depend on. Biodiversity is on an undeniable decline worldwide, and Nova Scotia is no exception. Reversing the trajectory we are on will require holistic, unified, and proactive measures, which I believe were substantially better provided under the original version of the Biodiversity Act. Since the majority of Nova Scotia is privately owned, an act that only applies to Crown land will provide fragmented protections to ecosystems and substantially limit the effectiveness of the legislation. Removing emergency orders, fines and offenses from legislation will prevent the government from being able to take proactive action to prevent irreparable harm from occurring and holding those who cause severe environmental damage accountable. I am also a rural landowner we have a small farm and woodlot on our property and have an interest in being able to continue to use our land in productive and sustainable ways. I have no concerns that the Biodiversity Act, as it was originally tabled, would have any adverse effects on my land or my stewardship of it. I have listened closely to the concerns of my fellow rural Nova Scotians, and I am troubled to find that they appear to be rooted in misinformation. Forest Nova Scotia, masquerading as the Concerned Private Landowners Coalition, is spreading propaganda and lies in an effort to sow fear and hysteria and defy Nova Scotians. It is crucial that we do not allow this poisonous discourse to subvert our legislative process. After extensive research, I cannot find any evidence to support the claims being made about adverse consequences of the Biodiversity Act. I do not believe the act will limit sustainable and responsible use of the land, including hunting, farming, and recreation. The enforcement powers contained in the original version of the act do not constitute a significant expansion of power when considered in the context of other legislation already in force. I am disgusted to see these lies being spread with the objective of misleading people who I believe fundamentally care about the sustainability of our environment and ecosystems by those who have a vested interest in exploiting and destroying it. I believe that Nova Scotian landowners care deeply about the land. Many of those that take issue with this legislation do, to, do so only because they have been lied to and misled. After listening to those concerns, I've come to the conclusion that Nova Scotians value our ability to enjoy the land and ensure that we can continue to use and benefit from our natural resources. I believe that those interests would be best served by passing the Biodiversity Act as it was originally tabled in the legislature. I urge you to consider the needs, wants, and values of the citizens of Nova Scotia. With that in mind, I truly believe we all want the same thing, which is to be able to continue to enjoy the natural beauty of our province and have a strong economy supported by a sustainable natural resource industry that will ensure continued prosperity for generations to come. Passing the Biodiversity Act in the form originally presented to the legislature will be an important first step towards achieving that objective. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Bizantz and Stone White. So, do we have any questions? So, that, 
Ms. Smith McCrossan, thank you. You're always astute to have one for us. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you so much for your presentation. I'm just wondering, um, can you share? Are you uh, do you own land? Are you a private landowner yourself? Yes, we own um, about 10, 12 acres in the Enfield area, and two of which it has um, our house and a small farm on it. And then the other 10 acres is woodlot, which we harvest for our own use and also use for recreation. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I apologize for your mispronouncing your last name, Ms. Benson Sloan. No worries. Sorry about that. Um, Thank you very much for your presentation and um, appreciate it. So without any further questions, we will move on to our next presenter. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Our next presenter is Gregor Wilson. If we know that we might have Mr. Wilson, yes, I see we do. I see. Oh, there we go. Welcome, Mr. Wilson. Um, so you're presenting on Bill 4, the Biodiversity Act. We have uh, 10 minutes slated for presentations. If you want to break it up into five minutes and five for questions, if you go over your five minutes a little bit or longer than the nine, I'll give you a warning that you have a minute left. So the floor is yours and welcome. Okay, thank you very much. And I'm sure you'll all be pleased to hear. I don't expect to even take the, my full five minutes. Uh, I'm sure it's been a long day. Uh, and thanks to the Law Amendments Committee for hearing my comments and other concerned citizens around the province. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Gregor Wilson. Um, I live in rural Nova Scotia in Colchester County, directly beside uh, Cumberland County. Um, I'm a private woodlot owner with properties in both Colchester and Cumberland County. Uh, and I consider that land a public trust and as I will be a short-term caretaker in the long-term lifespan of the forest on my property. Uh, I also help manage about 1,500 acres of <clears throat> rural recreational forested property on my family's property in Cumberland County. Um, and that includes about, uh, about 50 kilometers of trails that are open to the general public. Um, I'm a member of the Nova Scotia Woodlot Owners and Operators Association. I'm a member of the Wild Blueberry Association of Nova Scotia. And um, aside from managing trails and woodlands, um, I'm also an avid outdoors person myself. And I recreate on private and crown land year round, 12 months of the year. I have absolutely no worries, zero worries. The Biodiversity Act would restrict my access to the trails and natural wonders of this beautiful province it has to offer. In fact, I expect the act would help protect some of the places I cherish and hold close to my heart. So again, I 100% support the Biodiversity Act as uh, originally presented. I do not want to see the changes uh, or the bill being dropped as uh, lobbied by Forest Nova Scotia. Um, uh, all the properties in my care are under agreement with uh, North Nova Forestry Cooperative. They've been excellent to work with and they have been very helpful to help me protect biodiversity and forest health while making plans to uh, get some uh, harvestable lumber and forest uh, uh, wood products off the, off the land without impacting uh, biodiversity. Um, and just in, since this has all become news uh, recently, and, you know, lots of conversations uh, in rural Nova Scotia, and I find it interesting, not a single family or woodlot owner that I know was concerned with the Biodiversity Act. I've heard nothing except, you know, in the media, certainly, uh, uh, you know, you, you hear it, but for people I've spoken to, no, and I know a lot of woodlot owners here in Cumberland County and Colchester County, no one's been concerned with this. It's a, uh, seems to be a forest Nova Scotia's issue. Um, and, uh, and in fact, most people that I've sp spoken to are actually, you know, think it's a good thing because they are concerned with the state of the health of our forests in this province. Um, everyone's been patiently awaiting the Leahy uh, 
the Leahy report to be implemented or the Leahy review to be uh, implemented. And people, you know, many people that I know are just sitting waiting for that to be done to help, you know, slow the, the, the clear cutting and the devastation our forests are seeing on a regular basis. You can't clear cut yourself out of economic uh, forestry problems, I'm afraid. Um, and uh, considering the extreme pressure of, on biodiversity and the, huge, and the huge amount of privately owned land in Nova Scotia, the Biodiversity Act seems to be a very reasonable balance to protect the forests of Nova Scotia from invasive species and to protect landowner rights. I did not see government overreach as some others have claimed. Um, time is, I think, I believe time is running out to protect life in Nova Scotia as we know it and around the world as it's becoming too clear to everyone in the news these past few years. Now, um, ironically, this is, my, this is my second presentation to the Law Amendments Committee, almost three years ago to the day nearly, um, I made another presentation regarding the Mineral Rights Act, uh, Bill 76, I believe it was. Uh, that Mineral Act uh, gives prospectors and mining companies right to buy the minerals on anyone's land in the province and to apply to the government to expropriate land where, uh, where, when they want. And I don't seem to recall at that time hearing from any of the uh, Forest Nova Scotia speaking out about the grave threat to woodlot owners on that law and I'd, um, I'd, I'd love to hear them speak out against that one if they're so concerned about uh, government overreach um, and still would like to see that bill re-amended but that's another time another place. Uh, so for I asked the law amendments committee to give my comments consideration and if uh, Premier Rankin and uh, Minister of Lands and Forests are listening. I ask them to pass the Biodiversity Act as originally presented um, before Nova Scotia, before the lobby of Fo Nova Scotia forest efforts began. Um, related but unrelated, uh, I'd also ask that they implement the Leahy Report as quickly as possible and to protect all remaining candid sites under consideration uh, for protection in the province of Nova Scotia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Wilson, for your presentation. Uh, Ms. Coombs. Uh, just, a, just a point, um, Mr. Wilson. Um, I believe um, Ms. Lisa Roberts is trying to get, is in the waiting room, waiting to get in. Oh, oh, the other Mr. Wilson. Yep, sorry if Ledge TV can uh, check on that. There we go. Uh, are there any questions? Ms. Smith-McCrossan. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you so much to our presenter. I'm a big fan of uh, some of the businesses, your family business there in our area. So I just want to thank you for sharing your, your, um, your opinion on this matter. I'm just curious, you did share your concerns with the other piece of legislation around the Mineral Act. Um, would you have any concerns based on that comment of government having sort of being given more control under the uh, original biodiversity as tabled um, two weeks ago. Sorry, I, I don't under, can you reframe your question or I don't quite understand it. Sorry about that. So one of the, the concerns that others have shared is sort of the lack of trust with government um, as being good stewards of the land based on previous um, how government has uh, maybe not always taking care of crown land. So I'm, I'm wondering your thoughts about um, giving the government even more control over private private land, given the past track record of crown land. Do you have, just wonder if you have any concerns about that. Well, the act, as I understood it, I don't really see how the government gets a whole lot of control over it at all. It seemed to be more the, uh, the lobbying efforts of Nova Scotia Forest and scaremongering, uh, quite frankly, I know there's, um, you know, there, there didn't seem to be much that government would, would do. I mean, there was, you know, yes, there was a, a fine of a million dollars, which I doubt, just like I, I don't expect uh, a mine to come and expropriate my land in my house and that that's on the books. I don't expect the government to fine me a million dollars if I accidentally kill a lady slipper while I'm dragging a log off my property. Um, 
However, you know, if they, I would like to know if there's an endangered lady slipper or something on my property, and I would work to avoid that. Um, but no, I, I didn't really see it as much overreach, whereas, you know, expropriating land is quite another thing. But the fear mongering around, you're not going to be able to hunt or fish or use trails, I think was just silly nonsense from Nova Scotia Forest and their, their coalition. Ms. Smith McCrossan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Wilson, do you think that, based on your comment with sort of like an endangered species, could the government um, achieve their results by amending the regulations of current legislation, such as the Endangered Species Act? I think I think that could help, and I think implementing the Biodiversity Act would also help. I don't see it an either or. I see it as a both benefiting all. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I thank you, Mr. Wilson. Um, see no more questions. We'll uh, thank you for your presentation. We'll be moving on. Um, that is the last presenter for Bill 4. I'm not sure if we have our 730 for the Crown Land Act uh, that might be in the waiting room ready or not. Um, if we do, that's a that's a bonus for us. I'll wait. Mr. Mr. Chair, we, we do have one more person on uh, Bill 4 who's in the waiting room. Oh, my apologies. Yes. Uh, I, I, back apart. That's why we have lawyers. Thank you. <laughs> um, so we have Becky Parker. My apologies. I'm, Welcome, I'm Ms. Parker. You're on mute. Thank there you. you go. Thank you. So uh, you're our last presentation on Bill 4, the Biodiversity Act. We have uh, 10 minutes for your presentation. If, if you'd like to break it up into five minutes and five minutes for questions, that's up to you. If the very least, I'll give you a warning at the nine minute mark that there's only a minute left. So the floor is yours, welcome. Great, well, thank you for your time. It's super, super late to be uh, in offices, unless you're all at home, I hope you are. Um, so I work for Nature Nova Scotia. Um, I'm a professional ecologist uh, and a woodlot owner. Um, and so my specialization, I guess you could call it, based on what I've been paid to do more often, is um, focused in plant population ecology um, and usually for the management of invasive plant species. Um, so it's somewhat ironic, I suppose, that uh, I also own about 50 acres of mostly mature ash and hemlock forest in Nova Scotia. Um, so I joined Nature Nova Scotia just last year um, after working for a number of other organizations here in Ontario for the last 10 years. Um, you might be familiar with my organization. We brought this government to court last year over a judicial review um, for the mismanagement of several species at risk. Uh, Nature Nova Scotia is a federation of natural history societies. So we are largely a group of retired scientists, um, amateur naturalists, and uh, luckily a growing number of young nature lovers. Um, so we run networking events, citizen science programs. Um, and recently we have found ourselves having to speak up for nature more often than we did through that judicial review. Um, and we do this because we know biodiversity is declining in Nova Scotia. There's probably nothing I can say as a scientist that has not already been said by the environmental groups that have been working on this legislation for the last three years. Um, so I won't waste your time talking about that or the policy recommendations they've already made. Um, I will say that as a landowner, I'm worried about what will happen to my own woodlands if biodiversity legislation is not passed in Nova Scotia. There's little by way of policy or programming here for landowners struggling with invasive species. And the prospect of a biodiversity management zone in particular is very exciting for me. Uh, it's hard to achieve landscape level scale management in Nova Scotia, as I'm sure many of you are aware, um, because of the amount of private land that we have um, and the nature of those parcels. They're small and skinny. They tend to run up a mountain from a random water course. Um, biodiversity management zones could both identify and help manage invasion fronts for my lot a lot sooner than I could do on my own. And 
I mean, I also just care about biodiversity on my woodlands uh, because I work in science. I know that the features that I exploit on my woodlot depend on the healthy functioning of several other organisms and processes. It would be foolish to think that a dwindling warbler population or changing soil chemistry isn't going to affect me because I only harvest firewood and maple syrup. Uh, and these features are not all protected by existing legislation. And so that's why I'm here. Um, I've seen and heard a lot of inaccurate information, uh, or maybe what could be called misinformation, about this act over the last week. Uh, I've seen ads run by industry front groups saying that this act will stop all agriculture, stop people from hiking, uh, stop them from snowmobiling, and some other nonsense. And because I've been working in this field for a long time, I wasn't necessarily surprised to see that kind of propaganda from big industry here. Um, but I was surprised to see educated elected officials repeating those lies. Biodiversity legislation is coming. Other nations have already adopted biodiversity legislation at the federal level, and it's only a matter of time before it reaches Nova Scotia. I think that the question is, will this government be the first in Canada to bring in biodiversity legislation, or will it be remembered as the province that could have? And I would be extremely disappointed as a scientist and a landowner if it was the latter. And that's all that I wanted to say. Thank you very much, Ms. Parker, for your presentation. Ms. Roberts. Thank you, and, and thank you so much for your um, for joining us. Uh, I think you, you may be the last witness. Um, I wanted to ask uh, about uh, the connections between that court case that you brought against the province related to endangered the Endangered Species Act, um, and and this proposed bill, and you know some some arguments um, against the Biodiversity Act have have gone along these lines, that the province has failed to live up to its obligations under the Endangered Species Act. Therefore, why should we give it the power, uh, the powers um, contemplated in the Biodiversity Act? And as someone who obviously, um, you know, has looked closely at both, uh, both the proposed bill as well as the Endangered Species Act, what, what do you say to that argument? I think that the province has failed species at risk. I'm hoping that that's going to change in the near future, but I don't see why, just because this bill isn't exactly what groups like mine would want it to be, why we wouldn't want it to go forward anyway. It, it's a start. I, I don't see why we, why we wouldn't. And uh, if Ms. I could ask Ms. a follow-up? Yes. Um, and and I don't know if you're aware of um, what the government has announced will be the amendments to Bill Four. So Bill Four was tabled in, in the legislature, uh, you know, in a certain form, and now uh, we we all got notice of the proposed uh, amendments um, that haven't yet been tabled in the House uh, this morning. What what is your opinion of Bill Four going forward in its uh, currently on the order paper form versus in that amended form with um, some of its enforcement, well, I think maybe all of its enforcement mechanisms and its effectiveness on, on private land uh, largely eliminated. Yeah, I think concerns about enforcement and about government power with regards to this bill, this this act are largely overblown and have been from the beginning. Um, there, there are no, there can be no concerns now um, amongst private landowners uh, around in enforcement because of those amendments. So, I mean, I I personally was not concerned at the beginning that private landowners would be in trouble for, for doing things on their property un under this act, that this act is much less restrictive than the Endangered Species Act is, for example. So so that was never a concern of mine. Um, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't have a problem with regulations that would punish behaviors that we don't want to see in our environment but those aren't in the bill anymore so i don't see how there could be a concern thank you miss parker okay well um thank you very much for your submission thank you for your presentation and your time tonight and uh you are the last presenter my apologies for almost skipping over you at the end 
but uh, appreciate it. And uh, that concludes our presentations on Bill 4. So we'll now move on to the Crown Lands Act Bill number nine. And again, I'll check with our ledge council or, and see if we do have, um, I believe, Raymond Plord with the Ecology Action Center, if he's in the uh, waiting room. And if it's the favor of the committee, we're uh, six minutes ahead of time here. We'll continue on with that presentation. So I believe I see Mr. Plourd in the waiting room. Just here he comes now. And if you just unmute, there we go. Welcome, Mr. Plourd. So we're having presentations now on the uh, Crown Lands Act amended bill number nine. Mm -hmm. So I believe for this one, we have 15 minutes in total. So be, if you can do 10 and five, if not, at the very least, I'll give you a warning at say about 14 minutes in. So the floor is yours and welcome. Thank you, Minister Wilson, and thank you to the uh, committee members. Quite a marathon session you're on today. I admire your stamina. Um, I would like to speak on behalf of Ecology Action Centre in support of the two amendments that are being uh, put forward on the Crown Lands Act. Of course, these are directly from the uh, Leahy Report's uh, recommendations, and we recognize that. Um, however, we do recommend that the uh, Crown Lands Act needs much, much more revision in order to make the new purpose clauses um, actually happen. Um, the uh, purpose clause as proposed, or rather directly from the Leahy report, um, is laudable. How it, it essentially puts all um, values for Crown Lands on an equal playing field. However, it does not then go down further into the act to make the actual changes that would be necessary uh, in order to actualize or operationalize the principles stated in the uh, purpose section of the act. I would liken that to, say, a family plan that is created where the, the objective is written as we're going to drive to Montreal but then they fail to buy a car, fail to put gas in it, fail to actually enter the car, fail to drive the car towards Montreal and eventually to get there. So no great surprise, they will not actually get to Montreal. In order to meet an objective, you need to then do things to meet that objective. The Crown Lands Act was written over 30 years ago in very different circumstances and very different times. The purpose of changing the purpose clause is to begin to implement the Leahy report in a legislative and regulatory framework, but it doesn't then go to uh, change this very old act in order to make that possible. So the um, Leahy report calls for the triad system to be applied on Crown lands without any regulations on private lands, importantly. So it's all just down to Crown. And we it's a giant land use planning process, but with no enabling legislation, no powers assigned. As an example, um, we uh, submitted previously a very long and detailed report uh, to government and to the Ministerial Advisory Committee on implementing Leahy, upon which I uh, am honored to sit with many people from forest industry and other perspectives. Um, we have robust discussions, I can assure you. Um, but uh, we have presented a, a, a detailed report on the um, depth of changes that need to be made both to the Crown Lands Act and the Forest Act in order to fully implement the Leahy report. So just putting an, a, a, an objective or a, a purpose clause without providing those mechanisms. There are two departments implicated in the triad. Um, so the Department of Lands and Forestry, but also the Department of Environment. But they're nowhere to be seen in this giant land use planning process that hasn't actually started um, in terms of spatial planning, and that needs to be done. 
So the enabling powers, regulatory powers and ministerial powers and so on need to be embedded in the Crown Lands Act that recognize that we're not actually in 1989 anymore, but rather we are at in uh, 2021 and the new Crown Land direction is to implement the Leahy Report. So that needs to be done um, within uh, the legislative framework of the Crown Lands Act and as well to some degree also in the uh, forest use uh, area. Um, previously today, some of you with the energy or the memory will recall that the first presenter this morning was from uh, a professional land use planner and a former civil servant that I have the utmost of respect for, Mr. Dale Smith. And Dale uh, provided to you um, some detailed recommendations on the exact things that should change and how they should change within the Crown Lands Act. I would like to um, state clearly and unequivocally that the Ecology Action Center fully endorses those changes and they are along the lines of the report which I previously mentioned we've given the government in the past but was like a lot of advice to government pretty much ignored. Um, so with that, I will conclude my remarks a little early. It's been a long day. If you can get out early, uh, even by a few minutes, I'm sure it would be appreciated. Um, questions if you have them. If not, thank you. Please um, make a robust change to the Crown Lands Act or at least direct that that be done if these surgical amendments are all that go forward. Thank you. Hey, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Plord. Uh, Ms. Roberts and then Ms. Ms. McCrossan. Thanks, thanks so much, and uh, thanks for being here. And I was here at uh, 9 o'clock this morning, though I did have a break in the middle, and I remember that presentation. Uh, so we will go back to it. Um, but in the meantime, I really welcomed, uh, you know, the, the, the bill amending the Crown Lands Act because it was specifically recommended in the Leahy report. Um, and... And frankly, the Leahy report is a really long document that has a lot of a lot of detail, a lot of appendices. Um, and I'm I'm wondering if I I missed uh, a contemplation of the need for greater revision to the Crown Lands Act, or if simply you know it wasn't in the scope of of uh, of that report to get into the details of the legislation. I know it did say that the the purpose clause needed to be amended. Yes, uh, that's a good question. Thank you. Um, the Leahy report does contemplate in different places, and I have read the document and its appendices over and over and backwards and forwards. Um, it does contemplate and recommend a legislative review, but it does not go into deep detail about that. Um, it references uh, Crown Lands Act and Forest Act as part of that review, um, but Professor Leahy obviously did not try and draft legislation to present it whole as bowl as ready. Um, rather, he provided a general direction and an example with the purpose clause where back in the 1989 version of the Crown Lands Act, everything was about forestry and increasing timber. It was very industrial and uh, all other uses were subservient or subordinate or less than. And so the purpose clause would simply make forestry on an equal level with the other values, tourism, recreation, ecosystem services, carbon sequestration, biodiversity, all those things. And that's great. But if it's just a principle and there's nothing to make it happen underneath. So this is really about implementing the Leahy report. And I think that probably Professor Leahy would agree that certainly you need to go further than just a purpose clause. Ms. Smith McCrossan. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Ford, for pre presenting today. I'm just curious, I'd like to know a little bit more about yourself, your role with Ecology Action Center, and who funds uh, your position and who funds Ecology Action Center? Um, my name is Raymond Plourd and I was born at the Grace Maternity Hospital and I'm a multi-generational Nova Scotian. Uh, my ancestors are buried in the Antigonish Highlands uh, up in Maryville area. Um, they're McDonald's despite my funny last French name which comes from my dad. Um, the college, I'm the Wilderness Coordinator, Senior Wilderness Coordinator. Um, our organization is a volunteer-based NGO. We're celebrating 50 years this year. 
Um, we are a provincial wide organization with staff throughout the province uh, with uh, the members and, and volunteers uh, all around the province. Many of them are rural. Um, the um, funding, I find that very funny question, but um, I'll answer. Um, it's largely donations from individuals and from uh, also we seek uh, foundation grants from environmental charity foundations uh, in Canada and uh, occasionally depending on the nature of the work because we have multiple teams working on everything from food security where we support more farmers doing more farming and more local security of food and so on to uh, working with woodlot owners. You might find that surprising, we do, um, and support small private woodlot owners. Um, but in some cases, there's funding programs for like food, for example, or energy efficiency programs where there might be a government program and they seek NGOs to actually do the fulfillment because frankly, we're cheaper labor than government employees. Um, so they put out programs and we might apply and occasionally get some funding for a specific program. I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. Is that okay, Mr. Chair? Yes, one more. Okay, thank you. Um, this question was asked of many of our presenters today, just trying to get a better understanding of um, who people are representing and how they're funded. Sure. Uh, yeah, so I, uh, we received a lot of emails. I think my colleagues did as well. Uh, from the Ecology Action Center that they were based. And I, I, I may not have another opportunity. And I just wanted to share with you that many of the people that I responded to didn't actually, uh, they apologized because they didn't actually realize they were sending an email to every MLA in the province. And um, also at least 50% of the people that responded did tell me that they hadn't actually read the legislation. And um, so I just wanted to provide you with that feedback. And I would ask you in the future not to do that again, because I had people um, contacting me due to very serious health issues and many other issues, and their emails were lost in the hundreds and hundreds of emails that uh, your organization were sending every two to three minutes. And I just want to let you know that it actually created some problems with constituents that had really serious um, issues. And I just I just wanted to provide that feedback back with you that it it was a challenge and that many people that were sending me those emails did not realize they were sending them to every MLA and many didn't actually even read the legislation before they sent an email saying they supported it. So I just wanted to provide you with that feedback. So let me respond by saying thank you. We'll take that under advisement. Um, I think you can appreciate that during COVID, it was difficult for people to communicate with their elected officials more than it used to be. Um, we did make it clear that the uh, forum uh, on the website from EAC was going to uh, all the members and that they could also check uh, to read the legislation themselves. And we put out uh, information about it as well. Uh, for them to read uh, prior to sending. But just to be absolutely clear, EAC did not send you those thousands of letters, individual people, Nova Scotian citizens did. And even though democracy can sometimes be messy, um, that that is the way that we have to try and do things in the age of COVID. So uh, I will see if there's a technological fix for what you're saying, um, but um, citizens, you know, uh, want to reach out to their elected officials and also be heard. Uh, Ms. Smith McCrossan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So some of the people that responded did tell us that they actually just clicked on something saying they supported the work of the Ecology Action Center. So it is important that people that are, uh, that they know what they're sending and what they're responding to uh, when they're sending emails. And I again, I just wanted to let you know from a safety standpoint, we receive a lot of messages from our constituents every day. I'm sure my office isn't the only one from constituents that are really suffering and going through very serious issues. And um, some of it that very difficult for our staff to manage um, through that. And uh, I wanted to make sure that you were aware of that. 
Thank you. We will take that under advisement. And uh, I will also point out that same time you were receiving hundreds of emails generated from another organization and their uh, stuff. So I'm sure that added to your inbox um, load. But I appreciate what you're saying. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Plord, thank you. Uh, just one quick note, no longer Minister Wilson, okay? So, and maybe someday it'll just be Gordon for us. All right. I look forward to that day. Um, thank you. Former minister. Okay, um, so that is uh, our 7.30. We have a 7.45, Karen Beasley on the Crown Lands Act. Uh, is that uh, person, the SIC, is in the waiting room? Good day, I'm here. Can yes, Ms. Beasley, welcome back again. You're a trooper. So, well, um, thank you. So uh, this is on the Crown Lands Act. Uh, you have 15 minutes in total. So if you want 10 and five for questions, either way, I'll give you a warning if you have a minute left. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity to comment on Bill 9. I fully acknowledge the need to update the purpose section and to expand the scope of the act. It is long overdue and necessary to implementing provincial responsibilities, such as the recommendations of the Leahy report. Consistent with Leahy's recommendations, amendments to the Crown Lands Act are needed to clarify that management of Crown Lands is inclusive of all the values and objectives for which the management of public lands should be concerned in today's society. And further, to provide a framework that gives priority to the protection and enhancement of ecosystems and biodiversity, while also supporting sustainable extractive uses. Accordingly, I support the broadening of the Crown Lands Act and its purpose statement and principle. As written, however, the amended purpose statement contains some seeming internal and other consistencies. And while an updated purpose statement is necessary in and of itself, it seems insufficient, other sections of the act must be updated to reflect and provide the implementation of the updated and broadened purpose. So I'll briefly address both of these aspects. First, about the purpose statement. Although the intent of the updated purpose statement is appreciated, the statement itself requires some revision. First, for internal consistency between parts A and B, and also for consistency with the recommendation of the Leahy report. So first, the inclusion of part B in its present form seems inconsistent with part A, such that part A opens up the scope of the act. Part B, on the other hand, speaks exclusively to forestry, counter to the state at broadened scope. It is silent on wilderness conservation, recreation, tourism, and the other sectors, community development, and cultural, social, and aesthetic aspects. So to be more consistent with part A, uh, part B should be revised or removed, um, perhaps incorporated into the Forest Act. But there are many other purposes that could be added to Part B of the purpose to similarly highlight the provisions relevant to the numerous other management practices and policies that would need to be associated with the other aims and sectors in Part A. So rewording to reflect key planning and management aspects that per pertain to a more diverse scope may provide more clarity uh, for the act. Um, second, and you know, the inclusion of Part B as written seems to retain the entrenched focus on and privileging of forestry that the Leahy recommendations aim to change. Leahy's recommendations are unambiguous. The Crown Lands Act should be amended to make it clear that the objectives of the management of those lands is broader than forestry and inclusive of all the values and objectives for which the management of public lands should be concerned in today's society. So if Part B is to be retained, it should be amended to highlight consistent with Leahy's aims that it seeks to balance environmental, social, and economic interests within a framework that gives priority to protection and enhancement of ecosystems and biodiversity while also uh, providing for sustainable 
uses of the resources. Leahy is clear that such a framework isn't purely an environmental objective or rationale, but rather that is also economic and social as a healthy forest underlies all those things. So as such, amendments to Part B of the purpose statement should be consistent in representing and embodying a shift in paradigm in the direction of this broader understanding of the public interest. The Crown Lands Act should explicitly provide for the dual societal mandate of protecting ecological systems and biodiversity and sustaining a productive and profitable industry. Accordingly, Leahy explicitly calls for amending the Crown Lands Act to ensure that its stated purposes encompass and give equal weight to the full range of the values and uses relevant to the management of Crown land, thereby eliminating the preference the Act's current statement of purpose gives to timber production objectives. So that's recommendation 34 on page 33 of Leahy. In its current form, Retaining Part B of the purpose statement does not serve to give equal weight to the full range of values, nor to eliminate the perception of preference given to timber production. So beyond the purpose statement, um, I state that my presumption is that the revised purpose statement is merely a first step crucial to establishing the mandate to make further necessary revisions. Further amendments are required throughout the act to support and align with the amended scope and purpose. These changes should include, for example, ensuring as an immediate priority that the Endangered Species Act is fully implemented on Crown land. Certainly other changes are needed to allow for implementation of the triad approach to ecological forestry, but no doubt there are other provisions required to encompass the many other uses and objectives of Crown land beyond forestry purposes. With the broadened purpose, provisions will be needed for land use and conservation planning, such as to establish zoning for various aims and objectives spanning from biodiversity conservation to the three legs of the ecological forestry triad approach to recreational and tourism zones and to other sustainable uses. I will not go into detail on them here as they are not proposed at this time. So as a summary statement, I support amendments to the purpose statement with changes to the wording of part B, something to the effect of to enable fulfillment of the range of purposes set forth in subsection A by establishing land use planning process for Crown lands to guide the implementation of public land management through coordination of the respective responsibilities of the departments of lands and forestry, environment and climate change and others and in full and meaningful relationship with the Mi'kmaq for biodiversity protection, biocultural conservation, ecological forestry, and other sustainable resource uses. I close with Leahy's recommendation 76, which hits the nail squarely on the head with respect to the need for amendments to the Crown Act. The rationale for the proposed amendment to the Crown Lands Act derives from the fact that this statute is a source of authority for the officials who manage Crown land. Currently, it defines its purposes in a way that conveys a powerful message that Crown land should be managed for forestry. Changing the governing legislation to make it clear that Crown land should be managed for multiple objectives, including but not limited to forestry, will not by itself ensure that it is managed accordingly, but it will help to ensure that Crown land is managed for a wider array of values. And it will make it clear that managing Crown land solely or primarily for forestry or without sufficient regard for other values, interests and objectives is wrong. Thank you. And, and thank you, Ms. Beasley. Um, questions? Ms. Roberts. Thank you um, very much for your presentation. The, that last section that you read from the Leahy report, I recall very clearly, uh, which is why, um, you know, we we in the NDP caucus had actually prepared um, 
our own legislation to uh, amend the purpose of the Crown Lands Act and would have introduced it last fall, um, but we didn't sit and would have introduced it this session, but, but government legislation has come forward, which is, which is great. But just so I understand exactly what you're saying, the current bill that's on the order papers, will it, or is it, you know, is it your view that it uh, responds fulsomely to that recommendation, or is or is the bill as presented right now in the in the legislature that we're commenting on tonight? Does it does it require further amendment to uh, to respond to that recommendation? My my opinion is that it requires further revision to respond to that recommendation to. Um, in, in two respects. One, that there will be other parts of the act beyond the purpose statement that will need to be changed to, to fulfill that recommendation. And further that um, it's still, because of the wording in that second part of the purpose still seems to really privilege and focus on forestry. So, so if for perception alone, <laughs> it would be a little bit problematic in terms of public support. Thank you. Um, I see no further questions. Uh, Ms. Beasley, thank you again very much for two presentations, which isn't usually the case that we have in, in these sittings. So uh, that concludes our presentations that we have. Mr. Glavine. The mute button's always hardest thing to find. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, in regards to uh, Bill 4, uh, the uh, Diversity Act, uh, these are the amendments uh, uh, brought forth. Uh, uh, removal of biodiversity emergency orders, removal of uh, offenses and fines, uh, biodiversity management zones limited to crown lands unless permission is given on private lands. A new clause committing to reviewing the legislation in five years through public consultations. Uh, what was in the act is table and remains in revised bill allows the province to work with private landowners in a voluntary fashion to develop biodiversity management zones on their property. And it commits to reporting on the problems, the state of my biodiversity when, within three years of the act coming into uh, force. So I move that uh, these uh, amendments uh, be accepted as read. So there's a motion on the floor to move the bill forward as amended. I have a speaker's list that I'll start here. Mr. Rushton. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And uh, two years ago, Almost to the date, we, uh, we, we started this uh, endeavor as a province down the Biodiversity Act process. And I, I was quite pleased as a father of three, a husband, a landowner in the province, to stand up and speak and, and, and show favoritism for the bill at that time and, and, and speak that it was going to be an act of its first in, in Canada. It, uh, I look forward to having what the minister at the time called collaboration, consultation, and, and Mr. Chair, they missed the boat on this because here we are two years later and we still heard the theme of the day today that we missed the boat on doing education. We missed the boat on doing collaboration with all parties at, at, at stake, which, which included opposition parties. Um, just like the XPAC was an all party in. Um, when, when we would go to the department for information on how to move biodiversity forward, how our caucus could could uh, feel a part of it and, and, and put a put an emphasis on protecting biodiversity. What did we get? A, a collection of about a thousand pages right now of blanked out documents. Uh, we hear people in fear that there was consultation done in, in in the blind sight of confidentiality. We hear people from yes the 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 the, the group that formed the uh, private land group. But I'll tell you, Mr. Sh Mr. Chair. The majority of the phone calls that my office has got in the last two weeks were not from that forestry industry. They were from people such as, as uh, Jason Stewart that spoke here today, from his family, 
phone calls from his family that were not even aware that there was going to be an impact somewhat, whether it was perceived or possible, impact on their private land. Whether it's perceived or not, there was a fear because there was no education to the public. And we've heard it. We've heard the other opposition parties speak about it at second reading that they, they acknowledge the fact, too, that there was a lack of consultation through this whole piece. That's one of the reasons why I got involved in politics. We need to have an open dialogue to, to create good public policy. And, and good public policy, whether the government of the day, and it doesn't matter what political stripe it is, whether the government of the day likes to be transparent or not, good public policy is created when there is transparency, when there's collaboration, when there's not fear of the unknown. Whether it was, it was a campaign ad done by industry or not, it still leaves out a big margin of people that weren't involved in that campaign ad. And just a point of clarification for, for the member of uh, Halifax Needham, I'm a supporting role at that Carmelin Group. I'm not a voting role at that Carmelin Group. I don't know where the member was going with, with making the comment that uh, three elected officials in Carmelin County were a member of that. But we're there as a supporting role, as elected officials for the people that are on that group. Not once have I ever made a vote and not once have I ever, ever imposed a, a political will in a meeting where there shouldn't be political will, where it should be the people that are, that are affected. Uh, uh, by this. And time is of the essence. We've lost two years of this whole process because there wasn't collaboration. There was fear, whether the fear is perceived or not, whether the, whether the act had, had intent to take over people's land or not, there was a fear of the wording. And when you get groups, it doesn't matter what group that I hear back from, we went to get information that wasn't shared. We went through freedom of information and we get completely redacted information. So Mr. Chair, I don't know whether, whether it's the position to do it now, but it, it's our caucus's wishes to, to take the amendments that are just tabled by the, by the good member and uh, send them back to the department for an educational approach to reach out to stakeholders all through the whole province, all through different stakeholders, and report back in six months. That's a motion we would like to make in the PC caucus and, and take the fears away that uh, somebody is coming after their land. The big bad government's coming after their land. Um, and, and be collaborative, be transparent, and work. Mr. Chair, that's a motion that we'd like to make. In the uh, we we uh, have a motion on the floor that we have. Yeah, I, I understand that. I'm just making you aware, Chief, Mr. Chair, that Thank you. we also have a, have a motion that we would like to make. Appreciate that. Uh, Ms. Roberts. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'm not going to respond directly to um, my colleague's comment right now, uh, though I just say that, you know, um, there, there has been a campaign that some people, a number of people have referred to uh, today that comes from an organ, a, a coalition that hadn't previously existed. And so, uh, you know, trying to understand exactly who that coalition represents, I think is I think is important because we we do want to remain or become a province where where people uh, with different perspectives can come together and work towards the common good. I mean, ultimately, that's what we we are um, mandated to do in Province House, and I know that it's what many people, uh, you know. In rural Nova Scotia, whether they are woodlot owners, whether they are forestry contractors, uh, you know, whether whether they are conservationists who have, um, you know, are working to to just take firewood off their land while they um, try to restore some ecology. That's what many people are doing, and and I I think it's it's really unfortunate that the that the rhetoric around um, this bill. Um, I think was inflated on both sides. It was it, it was inflated in in terms of the fears it created because you know there are, there are multiple acts on um, that that exist now, including the Endangered Species Act, including the Mineral Mineral Resources Act, and including I'm sure that there's other ones that I don't even know the names of that in a hypothetical uh, worst case scenario counterfactual reality kind of a way give governments power over people over over people's lands um, and 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 can constrain the way that those lands can be used and in fact can even you know take them away from them 
but I think like uh, Mr. Wilson said, uh, we don't actively go around fearing that because uh, because government is constrained to work um, uh, is constrained in, in in many ways, including including by public opinion um, and and by what would be supported by the people. Um, so so I, I I do worry about that um, that public dialogue that has happened over the past couple of weeks, which really um, inflated uh, the potential impact of this bill. Um, and and I fear, and I know actually, um, has has resulted in in some damaged relationships that really matter. Uh, because people have to be able to hear uh, different perspectives and and work together with a certain level of trust. And when and when the emphasis is on the worst that could be done um, to someone's interests uh, by the government, it, it makes it it makes it more challenging to then uh, you know go back into rooms. Uh, hopefully, one day we get to actually go back into rooms, um, but to go back into rooms to like figure out where people can uh, where people can agree. Um, so I'll uh, just call if I could just call order because we are at one hour. Uh, we can come back, uh, Ms. Roberts, to you. And just one quick procedural thing. My apology. Uh, we had a motion on the floor and we didn't have a seconder. So, uh, Mr. Mummerkett, if you could second that motion, please. Mr. Chair, you don't require a seconder. We don't? Okay, thank you. Uh, I believe that uh, I was texted the fact I did. So, we'll take a 15-minute break and then come back if everybody's okay with that. Thank you.
And we have a quorum. So we'll now resume the law amendments. And uh, Ms. Roberts, if you're ready, we'll go back to you. We have a motion on the floor for amendments mm -hmm. to be approved. Yes, thank you. And I, I will just keep my comments brief. We've all had a long day. Um, I, I, I will uh, um, be voting uh, against the motion um, because it, it seems to me uh, to be a subverting of the democratic process in Nova Scotia, the long agreed upon process. Um, to to engage in consultation uh, on a proposed piece of legislation and effectively before the consultation happens through the law amendments process to announce to the to the public through other channels um, that that in fact the bill that is being consulted on is going to be modified in a very significant way um, and so I, I have great difficulty with you know, the process that we've been engaged in today, uh, all day long presenters have been trying to speak uh, both to the bill as, as tabled in the legislature and as, um, and to, uh, you know, changes that they may have received just 15 minutes before uh, presenting. And, and so, you know, for that reason, while we are in favor of bill four, going forward, um, we are especially um, in favor of Bill 4 going forward as tabled, applying on Crown and on private land, um, and with some enforcement uh, potential uh, that can be used in, in, you know, those unlikely circumstances where somebody brings a you know, the next chain pick roll over um, and, and wants to introduce it into our environment. Uh, so, so for that reason, uh, I'll be voting against uh, the motion. Thank you, Ms. Roberts. I believe Ms. Smith McCross and I have you next on the list. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I also will um, want to echo the comments of my colleague uh, from Cumberland South. Um, and I have to ask the question, what is the real purpose of this bill? And I am disappointed that not only us as legislators, but all the people that were presenting in today's Law Amendments Committee was not provided the changes proposed um, by the government until after Law Amendments Committee actually was in progress. So we've been in committee since nine o'clock this morning and although, you know, we've had some 50 minute breaks, we also have our normal constituency work to try to answer and respond to urgent phone calls in between in those breaks that I have not had an opportunity to actually read the amendments that are being proposed in full. So to ask to put forth this motion, um, well, it, it kind of is in step with just this bill. You know, when we listen to some of the presenters today, I was really you know, taken aback by the comments by from the Atlantic Chamber of Commerce representative who who just verified, um, you know, that this government, he's never actually seen this type of governing before, that all of the other provincial governments that the Atlantic Chamber of Commerce works with consult and actually seek input to ensure that the best legislation for the people is presented. And so that's why I have to ask, like, what is the real purpose behind this bill? Because we all, you know, I haven't talked to one person that doesn't support biodiversity and that doesn't support protection of our earth and that wants to make sure we are addressing climate changes and concerns. The people that I've spoken to that are opposed to this piece of legislation are opposed to the way the government have prepared it and presented it. They were opposed to the lack of consultation, to the lack of input, and to just to the spirit of it all. And uh, you know, when you when you listen to former MLA and current County of Cumberland Mayor today, and he referred to EGSPA, 
And he referenced that he was part of the government that brought in that um, significant piece of environmental, environmental legislation where Nova Scotia led the country. And he referenced that they collaborated with the fellow parties and they ensured that they brought forth the best legislation so I won't belabor that, but I just want to, to ask government, why not have a spirit of cooperation? Why not work together so that we are bringing forth truly the best piece of legislation to protect the biodiversity of this province? And some of our presenters, you know, one presenter today was a teacher. And I asked her, I said, why not have an educational approach? Why do we have to have this authoritarian approach where government has control and can fine up to a half a million dollars or even a million dollars? Why, why have that approach? Why don't we take an educational and a collaborative approach instead of threatening people's rights and freedoms, which right now many private landowners are very afraid of the rights and freedoms. It's not rhetoric. The legislation that I read, Bill 4, clearly states that government had the ability to take over private land. It, it's not rhetoric. It's there, written right before you. So, um, and I do, I do, in, in the spirit or, of talking about rhetoric, I, I want to bring up, um, I was a little embarrassed that uh, one of uh, the members today, I felt like she was in trying to embarrass our County of Cumberland by referencing that we are associated with the Cumberland Forestry Advisory Committee. And I wanna just say, I am proud to be associated with the CFAC, Cumberland Forestry Advisory Committee. It is a group of um, people here in Cumberland that came together during a time of true crisis when the decision with Boat Harbor was brought down. And these are people that have millions of dollars in debt, uh, the businesses, some three, four generations of foresters and landowners that uh, were in a crisis. And, and we came together and we formed the Cumberland Forestry Advisory Committee and we worked together to ensure that we have a safe, sustainable future forestry here in Cumberland. It's a very important part of our economy. And I'm gonna read to you our shared vision. And I think when you hear our shared vision, you'll see why I can say I'm very, very proud. Proud of our members, proud of the CFAC. And I will stand with them arm in arm any day of the week. Our shared vision is to transform our forestry industry into a champion of climate that utilizes the incredible human and natural resources of our great province. Together as a unified forest family, forestry family, we will manage and nurture a forest ecosystem rich in biodiversity that will provide much needed shelter for our economy and future generations of Nova Scotia to come. That's the shared vision of the Cumberland Forestry Advisory Committee. And I'm very proud, very proud to be a part of them. So in conclusion to tonight, I, I just want to ask for um, collaboration. Biodiversity is too important to make it political and to create, to use a bill like this, just to create division between political parties. It's too important. And I think the people of Nova Scotia expect more. And I, I can't support the amendments. I can't support this motion because we haven't been given an opportunity to actually read them and study them. And um, that in and itself shows the spirit that this current government um, is moving forward with. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Hey, thank you for your comments. So we have a motion to accept amendments that were brought forward on Bill 4, the Biodiversity Act. All those in favor say aye, raise your hands. Contrary aye. nay. nay. Motion is carried. Ms. Coombs, did you have a question? No, sorry. Uh, Mr. Tory Rustin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'll just uh, finish off my comments. Uh, it's late and everybody's been here a long day, but uh, I, I did make the statement that we did want to make a motion. And, and I'll entertain that because there wasn't, uh, as my colleague just stated, there wasn't time for 
for the presenters or ourselves as the elected officials from this legislature to have uh, have full understanding of what these revisions are that just passed that are going to move forward to uh, the legislature. So I, I know the liberal majority are probably going to vote this down, but I'm going to entertain the motion anyway, that we send it back to uh, the Department of uh, Lands and Forestry and have an educational approach on, on the uh, Biodiversity Act Bill 4, I, I guess now with the amendments, and report back in six months. Thank you, Mr. Rushton. There's a motion on the floor um, to send the bill back to the department. Ms. Roberts. Um, I won't support uh, that motion, uh, though I regret that the, the bill is going to return to the House um, as amended. Um, but I think it is important to uh, to hear the messages that we have gotten from from many people today, and I know I know that there's many more emails. So both um, concerns that I believe were inflated have been addressed by the amendments, and um, the the you know cons people who have considered and have supported um, and have called for a biodiversity act going back more than 10 years and certainly more than two years um, do want to see some legislation uh, pass uh, before there is, uh, you know, a real potential of an election. And so, uh, you know, my, my concern ab about delaying uh, further, a further six months is that that might jeopardize um uh, you know, throw out, throw out all the good. Um, so, so for that reason, I, we won't be voting in favor of that amendment Thank or you, that Ms. motion. Robert. So I have a speaker's list here, Mr. Rustin and then Ms. Dieb. Yeah, I, uh, sorry, I thought I was on mute. I, uh, I appreciate the, the comments a hundred percent and, and I, I understand the thought process and want to move this forward. The, the other thought process that I have in my mind, and I share it with my colleague, I know this, and our caucus, is we've heard today that there's there's many people that really don't understand what's in this bill anymore. And if, if it's an all groups in, it's a better bill. If we split and divide Nova Scotia, then we, we have uh, exactly what the, the fear is, is uh, it is a apples versus oranges, so to speak. So I, I, I appreciate 100%, but as, as the fact still remains, we have a lot of people on both sides of the debate here today. We've heard from that don't 100% understand the bill, including the amendments we just tabled. So I, I just wanted to share that, that I, I do appreciate the thought, but at the end of the day, I think we're going to have a stronger bill if we get all, all Nova Scotians in, have an educational process, and have a proper public consultation. Thank you. Ms. D. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Just a point of clarification. I know it's been a long day and a longer night, but did we not just move to report bill number one with amendments to the House? No, we moved to okay. adopt the amendments we did. Okay. All so right. So I, I will make that motion then right now. We're, if it hasn't we're, been made. we're dealing with another motion right now, if you don't mind. And we're, okay. yeah. Um, uh, so the motion on the floor is to uh, move the bill back to the department for a further discussion. All those in favor of the bill of that motion, please say aye. Aye. Contrary minded, nay. Nay. Motion is defeated. Uh, Mr. Glavine. Uh, you're on mute, Mr. Glavine. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, there's no question that uh, there's been a lot of listening uh, uh, a long time before this uh, bill came forward uh, with uh, listening to concerns and consulting with uh, Nova Scotians. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, I move to report bill number four as amended back to the House. There's a motion on the floor to report the bill back to the House as amended. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. Contrary minded, nay. Nay. Motion's carried. The bill will be uh, sent back to the Committee of the Whole House on bills. Uh, we also have uh, bill number 23 now up for uh, conversation. Uh, Mr. Glavine.
Uh, you're on mute again, Mr. Glavine. To uh, I had to uh, check here uh, on the uh, uh, on the changes, and uh, it's really just a small amendment to the Adoption Act, uh, wording to birth parent rather than birth father, in order to be on line with gender neutral language. Uh, this was proposed by uh, the NDP. They should be uh, supportive uh, on this. Uh, so uh, with the change sheet in front of uh, everyone and the uh, clauses where the wording uh, will change, uh, I move that uh, uh, this uh, bill um, uh, move uh, forward, a report back to the House uh, with those changes. I ask, has everybody had a chance to see the amendments first? Sure. Good. Uh, so, so we have to make a motion to approve the bill to start, approve the amendments to start. Uh, Ms. Coombs, so the motion on the floor is to approve the amendments as brought forward. Yes, and uh, thank you. And as mentioned, um, we, we did bring this forward and um, we are happy that they were uh, that the government listened and is bringing forward this inclusive gender neutral uh, language. And my hope is that we will go further at some point, and that is we will look at the amendments that were presented to us earlier by uh, Ms. Heather McNeil. Um, I, and I think it's important. I think what she brought to the table earlier this evening is important to creating an even more inclusive legislation in this. So. So we are fully supportive of these amendments, and we think it is um, it is it is quite excellent to have such inclusive le um, legislation in our bills. Thank you. Thank you. So we have a motion on the floor to uh, approve amendments brought forward. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Contrary minded, nay. Motion is carried. Mr. Glavine. So at this point, I uh, move that uh, re to report bill number 23 as amended back to the House. So the motion on the floor is to approve the bill and send it back to the House. Ms. Roberts. Sorry, I was jumping the gun and showing my support. Okay, for the no, no problem. It's uh, good to be anxious. Um, all those in favor of the motion to move it back to the House, please say aye. aye. Minded, nay. Motion is carried. Bill 23, the Adoption Record Act, will be referred back to the Committee of the Whole House on bills as amended. Uh, we have... Uh, do we have any other motions from any opposition uh, members? So we do have uh, two other bills here that we uh, had on the agenda for today. So the Crown Lands Act, Bill Number Nine, Mr. Mummercat. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that uh, Bill 9, the Crown Lands Act, be referred back to uh, or, or sent forward to the House uh, without amendments. So the motion is to refer Bill Number 4, the Biodiver or the Bill Number 9, the Crown Lands Act, amended back to the Committee of the Whole House on bills. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Contrary minded, nay. Motion carried. And lastly, we have bill number one, the Police Identity Management Act. Ms. Lena Det Metledge Diab. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move to report bill number one, uh, the Police Identity Management Act to the House with no amendments. Seeing no conversation on that, all in favor of moving bill number one, the Police Identity Management back to, back to the Committee of the Whole House on Bills Without amendments, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Contrary minded, nay. Motion carried. 
Uh, I believe that concludes our business for today. Um, and really, uh, I think all of us, uh, I speak on our behalf to again, thank our legislative council and our legislative TV people and our participants that were here today. Uh, Law Amendments is a, a, a very good place to listen. And I think we heard a lot of good comments today. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll adjourn the uh, sitting of our Law Amendments today. Thank Have a good you. night, everyone.